energy is essential to human life. It also drives progress. At Total, energy is our business. We are a leading international oil and gas company and a major player in low carbon energies. We explore for, produce, transform, market and distribute energy in a variety of forms to serve the end customer. And we operate in more than 130 countries. How are we providing concrete responses to the challenges of the next 20 years? How can we meet the energy needs of a growing population? How can we tackle climate change? And how can we adapt to new consumer habits and customer expectations? By supplying an energy mix combining natural gas, oil and renewables. And by improving the energy efficiency of our facilities and products to limit their impact on global warming. And also by leveraging our closeness to customers, by anticipating their needs and helping them use energy more responsibly. In short, our 98,000 employees are committed to supplying affordable, reliable, clean energy to as many people as possible. Our ambition is to become the responsible energy major. Welcome back, and Peter Leko is in the studio at Luzhniki Stadium with uh, your truly Almira Skripchenko. This is our last and final fight. This is the last day of the King Salman World Chess uh, Blitz Championship. Uh, Peter, this was so exciting these past four days. Yeah, we have witnessed the incredible fights, a lot of dramas, everything, and I think the real dramas are coming today. Yes, yeah, so here are the pairing, ah, the standings first. Uh, Magnus Carlsen is leading with 10 points. And a new face, yes, Maxim Medlakov is on clear second place with nine and, a half, nine and a half. Yeah, we haven't even really seen him yet, but his last game against Vidit was a very important victory, and now he's facing Magnus Carlsen with the white pieces. And three players are chasing them with nine points. Uh, Jan Nepomnyshi, Daniel Dubov, the reigning no, not the reigning champion anymore, yes, he lost his title in the rapid uh, to Magnus Carlsen and Hikaru Nakamura. In the ladies event, Katerina Lagno is the sole leader with 8 points and 4 players with 7 points are sharing the second place, Alina Kashlinska, Alexandra Kostinyuk, Daria Charichkina and Hampi Konero. So everyone is waiting for Magnus Carlsen. He will be facing Maxim Matlakov with black. Yeah, the countdown clock has ended already. 
and the reigning world blitz champion is Magnus Carlsen. Exactly. The and games have started already. Magnus removing his jacket as mm -hmm. usual. And Matlakov has played 1d4. Adjusting the pieces. And knight f6 answer still adjusting. Yes, players can't be late for the game. There is no zero tolerance rule. So Magnus can be late uh, for 2 minutes 59 seconds if he wish. Ah, really? Yes. Yeah, that's the rule. Yes, that's the rule. We see the Cambridge Springs. <coughs> 92. This is a very solid way with white to treat this. But what a surprise for Maxim Matlakov. I think that Magnus has prepared a special variation for this Blitz game. Yeah, I mean, okay, Magnus is capable of playing anything, anytime, so you better be ready for, psychologically, for everything. Of course, you can't prepare for all. Certainly, I'm pretty sure that uh, Maxim has taken a look at uh, Magnus's uh, Tarash, which he mm -hmm. has been using during the tournament, and Magnus goes for this pawn grab. A very, very risky line, actually. And Maxim plays the mo one of the most critical and most challenging one. Yes, I remember the evaluation in my days that it was quite a dubious uh, continuation. So did anything change now? Well, we don't know. I have no clue, actually, and very interesting to see how it will progress. And by seeing that Magnus is taking his time, he's 2.20 on the clock, it's not the typical Magnus we have been seeing during this uh, Blitz Championship so far. So interesting to see how Magnus will follow it up, because if you don't know exactly what you are doing, this is looking very, very risky. Okay, Black has won a pawn, but he will lose a lot of tempest, and uh, White's plan is basically if you will be forced to take on C3 sooner or later, mm -hmm. then you give up the dark squared bishop. Uh, Maxim just says, okay, thank you very much. In this case, I'm taking back the pawn. I was thinking that uh, probably Black was forced to take on C3 before. If he, if he wants to keep the pawn in this variation, or this is too risky? Yeah, it's just too risky. I mean, you don't want to depart from the dark sweat bishop. Mm -hmm. This is the soul of your position. And uh, we can see if that bishop is gone, then the bishop on h4 becomes a monster. Yes, it doesn't have an opponent. Yeah, Magnus goes for queen f5. He wants safety and 1.30, one minute behind on the clock. Usually this is also very tricky. The first game of any Blitz tournament of the day is very, very tricky. And let's not forget that there's a slight change in schedule. The players start their games at 2 o'clock instead of the usual 3. And even me as a commentator, I feel the jet lag, to be <laughs> honest. Yes, I agree with you that uh, it affects uh, sometimes your... Uh, routine, yes. So you you wake up at a certain hour, but uh, now you have to change everything. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it feels like a very innocent change of time this one hour, but believe me, if you already for four days you felt like what is right for your body, and uh, you have to change it exactly in the decisive last day, it's it's never easy. I think Magnus is at least happy that uh, he managed to get a more or less stable position which he can handle quickly and we see also that Maxim is taking his time now. White should be slightly better, that's mm -hmm. for sure, but uh, this is now not the most important. Should he play b3 and uh, opt for e4 later? Or? Oh, knight e2, knight f4, mm -hmm. that's, that's the point. Ah, and he goes for d5, yeah, that was the third option. The first I considered when I saw this position, but was not 100% sure when well does it lead. Take on c3, d takes e6, bishop b2, rook b1. Probably bishop a3 now. Yeah, probably Let's bishop see. a3 has to be played. Yes. c5 is a very important threat, so it has to deal with this. Yeah, bishop a3 played. <coughs> but white has the two bishops and the position is opening up. However, black has a very sound uh, and stable queenside structure. This is Magnus' hope. 
that this should be enough. Otherwise, it looks quite scary. Yeah, G6, Bishop F6, you can castle. You can castle, yes. exactly. That would be a... That would be a great... So, Bishop H3... Oh, Bishop H3, but this is double-edged. Bishop H3, because if black manages to close down this, shut down this bishop, for example, with F5 and mm -hmm. white is not able to punish it, then, but on the other hand, it's a very ambitious move. Yeah, Magnus takes on E6 and goes back to E7. And we see some nervousness by Magnus. He's 50 seconds only. Knight A4, wow. If this works, this is very important because if he can get the knight to C5, this gives him stability. Will it work? Bishop E5, look F8. It's a very dangerous position for black. Yeah, black loses the exchange but gets stability. Mm -hmm. And believe me, in, in blitz, stability is extremely important. Magnus pushes his A pawn. Very, very nice position of sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Probably it was uh, born out of necessity, but it's for sure the best practical chance. And Maxim knows he has to open up the files on the king side as quickly as possible, and also to have f6 in order to block the the bishop coming uh, to, to the long diagonal with bishop g7. Wow, this is ultra sharp now. Knight e4. Knight is heading to d2 or to c3, I mean, fg6 played. Bishop b6. And yeah. c5 later, or bishop yeah. c5. But wow, now Magnus seems to be in control. Mm -hmm. What a what a defense by Magnus. Incredible. And everything has been played pretty pretty a tempo. I mean you remember we had he had like forty-nine seconds uh, some six, seven moves ago and all this sequence he played instantly. Now ninety two rookie two, yes. then there is C five at yes, the end. Exactly. But King E7, this is a deadly intermezzo and it seems like Matlakov is in big trouble and also on time. That's it. And he resigns. Yeah, incredible turn of events. Magnus once again showing his brilliant uh, feeling for harmony. I mean, just within a few seconds he managed to consolidate this position. Very, very impressive. Yes, this was a very nice, well, maybe out of necessity, but still a very nice position uh, exchange sacrifice. And very impressive, yeah. And we see here Nyapomniachi versus, du uh, versus Dubov. Yes, Daniel Dubov is playing uh, the nightmare the scenario, mm -hmm. queen and game, with few seconds on the clock. So basically, if you are following with computer, you will witness a lot of, lot of red moves, most probably. But it's just very difficult to play this. Yes, they will probably repeat the position. What will they repeat? Ah, because he claims three times repetition. But now he will not repeat. This is very tricky. That's the point. I mean, you don't know now. Did Nepo had the right to stop the clock and call the arbiter? I mean... Yes, he can stop the clock uh, before making his move. Uh, he calls the arbiter, he announces that by, for example, king g2, it is a threefold repetition, then the arbiter has to check and uh, to announce a threefold repetition or to add two minutes on Daniel Dubov's clock. Yeah, but still uh, it's very tricky because psychologically when you have, yeah, you see Yanis yes. saying you are very tricky, my yes. friend, you are very tricky. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of tension, but finally it anyway ended peacefully, so no okay. drama there. It is always a pleasure to watch Jan because he's very expressive, very emotional. So. Yeah, he will not hide his his feelings. And we see Duda versus Kuparadze on board four. Our surprise man, Giga mm -hmm. Kuparadze, the blitz specialist from Georgia. So his performance is 2767, so wow, and a very nice one in this tournament. He And what is it? He beat so many strong players. Yes, and he seems to be doing very well. But this A pawn is very strong. 7 seconds versus 10. Oof. He 
hesitates so much. That yeah, hesitates too much, and now he. Who queens first? Ah, but this is very nice. Black has look a two, so yes. then just go look a. Ah no, but look a two. The bishop is falling. Yeah, and look d one back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and young Christoph is in control. <clears throat> wow, but this also was very, very dramatic. Now the king moves to d2, and it should be just a matter of time till white wins this position. But now the g-pawn goes. Right. I mean, in a classical so game, easy, of course. exactly, yes. in a classical game it's trivial, but uh, in a blitz game, Rook C1 has that to be is. played. Yeah, and the knight is coming back to D2. This is always nice. And knight F3. Or even king F2. Yeah, king course. F2 just... Knight E4 check. Yeah. I mean, it's it's incredible how Dubov controls his clock. Yeah, I mean, in every game he's done to this five, six, seven seconds and driving his opponents crazy. So a very important win for young Shishtov Duda, who won uh, the silver medal last year. He was chasing Magnus and... And we are seeing now uh, Yevgeny Tomashevsky versus Ari Antari. Mm -hmm. We don't see the full position yet. Probably an item game, and we see Tan Zonji versus Daria Charichkin. Ah, she yes. is Daria. Yes, ah. you have to get familiar <laughs> with yeah. Daria because she has some impress. She has scored some impressive wins. Yes. I there. mean, I I know her results. I think that uh, the clock is stopped. Ah, the uh, yes. the players are waiting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but this is interesting. If the players are waiting, then you should not leave the board. I'm not sure about this. Yeah, also. well, it gives you a very uh, um, strange opportunity, if to I might think, say yeah. yes, to think. So they're yeah. waiting for the arbiter to come. Which well, is not always that good, yeah? Because suddenly you have the time to think, then the arbiter comes, pushes your clock, and you only have six seconds on the clock. Very difficult to get the rhythm again. So we will find out what is the situation. I mean, black only has six mm -hmm. seconds, right? And Evgeny has some analysis uh, for us from Hikaru Nakamura's game. Uh, well, not that much of analysis, just, you know, one of those tricky opening systems that Hikaru uses in Blitz. This time, well, it started as so-called Vienna game, bishop c4, bishop c5, and queen g4. Remember Hikaru playing queen h5 from time to time, even in move two, even in classical games. So this seems to be an improved version of it. So queen to g4, attacking g7, g6, queen f3. I still don't think that I can recommend it, because, well, it doesn't look good, but after knight f6, knight e2, it turned to be a winning winning attempt. It led to a victory very, very quickly thanks to black misplaying it. Bishop g4 was perhaps still okay. So the problem here is white wants bishop g5, right, before even before bishop g4. Bishop g5 is sort of a threat. So it's not that pleasant. Since the pawn went to g6, the knight is kind of hanging in the air. You cannot castle, for instance, because of bishop g5. Yeah, bishop g4 was still okay. After queen g3, however, black had to do something about this bishop g5. I was thinking about a move queen d7, potentially preparing long castle, getting ready to jump knight h5, so maybe that would have worked. Bishop e6 instead ran into bishop g5, and already problems for black, and after h6 it seems that he simply overlooked queen h4. So once again, increasing the pressure on this diagonal, and the bishop cannot be taken because the rook is gone. Well, the bishop was taken because there was no better move. So after a few more moves, Hikaru was an exchange up in a winning position. So sometimes those early opening experiments do work. Back to Almira and Peter. Thank you, Zhenya. And let's get back to our games. What happened in the ladies section? Yeah, and also the ladies event because what happened in this Tanzonji uh, Dalia Chalochkina game? Yeah, because we had this position and mm -hmm. We don't know 
why the game was stopped and how it progressed or what happened in this? Well, mm -hmm. we are not... For the moment, the arbiters are checking, uh, well, the electronic score sheets, so we will get back uh, to their decision or to the game a bit later. And what happened uh, on the first board, because we had a very important uh, uh, Russian derby, so Alexandra Kostinyuk lost against uh, Katerina Lagno. Yeah, very important win for Katerina and also Hampi Konel won her game, so she is... Uh, she bounced she's back. Exactly, and continues to chase uh, Katerina. And we have this dramatic uh, stop on board three, which is also very, very important for our standing. And mm -hmm. Anna Mozichuk has won her game. Yes, so she's getting closer to the leaders as well. It, it is... Wow, well, a lot of, lot of wins, yeah? Mm -hmm. Anastasia Bodnaruk won with black against Dronavali Harika. Mm -hmm. Also a very important win probably for Anastasia. Now she's also closing. Let's have a look at the first board. I'm very curious uh, to see how, how yeah. did this game... Yeah, we almost saw the same uh, opening Go. as as Yevgeny has just showed mm -hmm. in uh, Nakamura game and you immediately pointed out that why on earth would you play bishop c5 here? Because you can play knight f6. Exactly, yes. allowing mm -hmm. queen g4 if you can play knight f6. And believe it or not, Katarina has played knight f6, saying thank you very much, I don't want to allow any queen g4. But she knows the same tricks from our childhood, you know, even she's from... <laughs> she's much younger, but uh, Soviet school never changed, so... <laughs> Yeah, this in 95. Mm -hmm. This is the line actually uh, we were kind of raised up in Hungary. Mm -hmm. We always like to take this bishop. I mean, you don't necessarily have to take the bishop yet, but you are ready to take it any time. This is a question to put the bishop on e7 or to c5. This uh, is always a debate. Castle, castle, knight, gc. That's White's idea to get this positional grip. d6 and bishop b3 somewhat surprising because usually white players want to force the exchange of this bishop on c4 and to get a positional grip exactly therefore some a4 mm -hmm. or a3 is played when black takes and white gets this structure usually bishop b3 somewhat surprising it takes takes now black doesn't have this i mean white doesn't have the control of the d5 square as well as in the other in the other structure so white has to go f4 e f bishop f4 energetically c5 Nicely played, h3, a6, bishop d2, d5, basically mm -hmm. questioning the whole white strategy. Do you want to play e5, after which, okay, probably black plays knight d7 or even knight e8, most probably knight d7, putting the pressure on e5, not clear where is white's attack. And after e d5, knight d5, you also believe that it can't be that serious. So knight f5 is played, bishop f6, rook a4, aha, uh -huh. so that's the point. Mm -hmm. White brings the a1 rook. Uh, via a4 and goes after black's king, so king h8, queen f3. Maybe it was a bit better to take on d5 and to play bishop c3 first, what do you think, Peter? Maybe, but I mean, this is now already looking uh, much more tricky than two moves before. Yeah, mm -hmm. this rook a4 is a very nice resource, and maybe Alexandra had everything under control. She was in, in fact pressing, no? I mean, knight takes c5, queen c8, now the position looks very promising, but uh, of course it's very concrete. White unfortunately cannot take on e6 yes. because f is a pin, mm -hmm. and you can't really protect this knight with rook c4 because of b5. This is the problem what white faces with, so maybe after all this sequence of moves was not ideal. Knight e4, now black takes on c2, and Unless white mates now, black is just winning. And what about d4? Or then you take on f5? Or? d4 mm -hmm. here, yeah. Or b6 someplace. Okay, I can also take on d4 mm -hmm. in general. But that was my point. I thought that this bishop on b2 protects uh, uh, from all kind of mates, yes? So yeah, but it's easy to forget about this bishop. Mm -hmm. It looks like the bishop went far away, but yes, this bishop on g uh, on b2 really is a very good piece. So, after all, Alexandra probably misjudged it that she can go after this... Uh, she can go for these complications. And mm -hmm. all of a sudden, she lost a lot of pawns without any, any compensation. Yeah, and then it was game over. 
Peter, and meanwhile the arbiters have decided that the game has to continue between Tan Jong Gi and Darya Charochkina. Well, I'm not surprised at all because I just couldn't even imagine any other scenario than than to continue. And White got the king to c2, very nice, blocking the c3 pawn. The only question how to make progress, not easy to break Black's fortress. And it gets dramatic. 10 seconds versus, I don't see that, probably 12. Rook f3, what is rook? Ah, rook b6, bishop mm -hmm. d4. She wants to go after the f2 pawn. White should probably play f4 just to. It's an ugly move, but. So b5 played. And as usual, there is a huge crowd watching, so yeah, nice maybe repetition. there is a draw, yes. Nice repetition of moves. Well, great okay. save by Daria Sharoshkina. I am not sure if it's a great save because she looks uh, so disappointed. So, uh, can you have a look at the um, yeah, exactly. middle game? We, we don't even know what happened. Because this final uh, part was clearly she was playing for a draw after we have seen the break. Okay, here it looks promising. Here it certainly looks very promising for black. Yeah, here you can be disappointed. Clear pawn up, but white has the pair of bishop which gives some kind of a chance. And maybe she just saw that this pawn on c3 will be just too strong, but mm -hmm. after, allowing, after allowing this exchange, it's clear that uh, only white can try to play for a win, but uh, very difficult to make progress, so finally the game ended in a draw. If black would somehow manage to keep the knight and could get it to, to d4 or uh, to get it to, to d3, it could have been uh, overwhelming for black. Yeah, that's why the disappointment. So let's give a word to Evgeny once again. Uh, well, who certainly has to be disappointed is Ahmed Adli. Remember, yesterday we were watching his game against Gareyev, where he missed a couple of times, just a direct win. This time, Ahmed was pushing for a win in the position which was not winning for him for sure, maybe a worse position, and he lost eventually. So I just want to show this fragment where sometimes, you know, your will to win actually gets punished. So white has the pass pawn on a5. It's not running too far. In fact, black is not worse in this position, but, you know, I admire the spirit, but ready to criticize the, you know, losing the objective touch of it. So knight f8, and it's almost like black king is getting checkmated. King h5 is the only move. King h6 would have been rook h7. White goes h2, h3, threatening a checkmate in one move on h7. And black, even though, as I said, black is not risking much, he could have played h6, black goes for a perpetual check. Rook a2, and rook a1, and rook a2 again. And here was the moment where, where I thought, yeah, white had to allow the perpetual go to g1. He goes to f1, which runs into, well, uh, all of a sudden an unexpected attack. Knight to g3, king e1, bishop c3. I know, wait a second, bishop c3 was possible. h6 was played, in fact. h6 preventing a checkmate in one, a6. Knight to e4, knight e6. What is not threatening all that much? And, you know, king h4 is good and everything, but bishop c3, and here comes the final mistake, after which I find the, you know, the pattern for this checkmate very, very appealing. Knight to f2 check, strictly only move. Knight d3 check. Now, if you go back to d1, it's rook d2 checkmate. So, king to d1, king to b1 was played after knight d3. Rook b2, once again, strictly only move. Well, can you guys find a checkmate in two? Rook b3 check, a nice move, and knight c1. Okay, anything else, more or less, was winning for black, but I still find it nice that the way black piece is working together, knight protects the rook, rook covers the squares, bishop covers a1. So, an upsetting loss for Ahmed Adli, and kudos to his opponent for identifying this beautiful checkmate. Back to the studio.
That is such a beautiful final position indeed, Evgeny. Thank you so much. And we found uh, a very important win by uh, Liriza Firuja against Alexander Grishuk. Yeah, I mean, in general, there had been so many wins, with white and with black. Uh, it's, uh, it has been a really fantastic, fascinating uh, 13th round. Yeah, Ali Reza Firuza beat Alexander Grishuk with black. Alexander Grishuk, who won the world, ra uh, no, uh, the world Blitz title three times. The only one, the only person who has won it four times is Magnus Carlsen, who is seeking his fifth title. And we have the standings after this round. Magnus Carlsen is leading with 11 points, and Hikaru Nakamura is chasing him with 10 points. And how many players on nine and a half? A lot of yes. players. So Vladislav Artemiev, Shakhriar Mamedyarov, uh, Vidit Santos Gujarati, uh, Jan Kshishtov Duda, Daniel Dubov, Jan Nepomnyashi and Maxim Matlakov. But actually it's a little bit strange this tournament table because I see many players who according to our, our game list here mm -hmm. has won their games but it's not counted for them. Yeah? For example I have seen Andrei Kim winning, mm -hmm. uh, I have seen uh, Giri beating Vidit Santos, at least that's what we had and... Uh... Because the results are updated uh, at every moment, so I think that it's uh, not that easy to collect the results from uh, more than 200, no, like 200 players, so over 200, 100 boards, so we, yes. we need to wait and these are the standings at the ladies' event. So Katerina Lagno is leading with nine points, Hampi Kuneru is clear second with eight points, and Anastasia Benaruk, Anna Muzichuk and Daria Charichkin are sharing the third place with seven and a half points. Yeah, the woman standing seems absolutely correct, but uh, mm -hmm. I have my doubts about the men's section. Mm -hmm. Yes, we will have to check them later. But let's get back to our game. Yeah, okay, there had been really so much uh, action that it's hard to pick, but uh, since this is a really big... Yes, maybe you can pick up a, like a critical moment from this game. Yeah, I mean, let's see that the start of the game was a rouser Sicilian. This is already, I think, uh, very important because uh, Filuza has been playing the Nidorf in this tournament. So a very sharp Sicilian actually finally ended in a strategical battle and they reach some end game. So all this phase is more like uh, high, high level chess, not that, uh, I mean, it's very difficult to, to comment or to say anything. So it's obvious Black King is in the center, but it's perfectly safe. So White makes sure that his king will not be in danger. A3, B3. White prepares to break this with C2, C3. This is what actually happens in the game. White breaks with C3, Rook C3, Queen F2. A very, very unpleasant queen move because the queen on F2 is disturbing White's coordination. Mainly, White would like to take with the knight on C3 and activate this knight for me too, but White can't. So Queen takes C3 is played Rook D8. Very difficult to, to, to evaluate what is going on. I would say it's probably dynamic equality. Queen C7 check. Knowing both players probably by now they were both very long time. So it was more like intuitive that they evaluated this endgame. Looks like white is in control because if white gets knight C3 mm -hmm. and start to push the B pawn, it gets really bad for black, but, to play D5 probably. but it's black to move and black breaks out with D5 just in time, ED, Bishop D5, and after the exchange of the, the bishops, suddenly the black rook is very active, can enter the position with rook D2, so Grishchuk, I think, tries to give, uh, try to, tries to force a perpet perpetual or mm -hmm. a repetition of moves, but Filuza can escape with his king, king E7, king C2, Again, just one move, knight c3 and white has everything under control and is not risking, but black is in time to push e4. Now black gets access to the f5 pawn and uh, knight c3, rook e5. This is already now looking very, very bad. Suddenly, how to stop this e pawn? King d2 easily, king e1, knight f4. That's definitely not the way how you're going to stop this pawn. And all of a sudden, knight c1 check, but still it's not obvious how to, to continue and king f7, wow, mm -hmm. this, is, this is a very, very strong move. 
because now black wants to take the pawn on f5. Previously, black could have mm -hmm. not taken really on f5 because then white has rook e4 and things are normal for white. King f7, now already the pawn is hanging and how to protect rook c7, check king g8. It turns out there is no way to protect this pawn. And king d1 was obviously a nervous move. Mm -hmm. And d2 check basically finished the game. A great win by Firuzia. And it seems that we still have five minutes till the next round because uh, there have been some changes in the schedule. Uh, but look at Magnus is already sitting, so maybe he didn't know that uh, there is a change. Yeah? Uh, uh, yes, the, but all players are <laughs> sitting and waiting for the round to begin. So let's have a look. Uh, Magnus Carlsen is playing against Jan, Jan Nepomnishi. Then on the second board we have Hikaru Nakamura against Jan Krzysztof Duda. And Vladislav Artemiev on the third board against Maxim Atlakov. Daniel Dubov is playing next against Alexander Zubov and uh, Ali Reza Firuja against Dmitry and Andrekin. So a very important pairing on the board number seven, Maxim Vashelagraf plays against Livon Aronian and Vladimir Kramnik on the board number eight against Bartosz Sochko. Uh -huh. So he Bartosz bounced back from, t from the two losses. Yeah, and the... Vladimir as well. Mm -hmm. I read some report, report where they were saying, yeah, Kramnik came back, uh, probably it's difficult for him and he mm -hmm. only has 8 out of 12. Believe me, 8 out of 12 was already a very good result. So here are the pairings on your screen and uh, what are the interesting matches next? Uh, Giga Kuparadze against Alexander Grishuk, Anish Giri against Badur Jabava on the board number 6. So like all the games are incredibly interesting to watch. And also board number for Dubov versus Zubov. You yeah. remember not long yesterday, uh, Yevgeny was saying that, uh, yes, Zubov has just lost that game against Cherbakov, I believe. Mm -hmm. And believe me, he will be back there. And there he is, Alexander Zubov, the rapid and bridge specialist. And what are the pairings in the ladies group? I will just check it online, yes, just to see if there is an important game. Ekaterina Lagno is our sole leader. She is the defending World Blitz champion and the reigning World Blitz champion. So she is playing against Anastasia Budnaruk on the first board. But for the moment, we will try to concentrate on the game Magnus Carlsen versus Jan Nepomnishi. Yeah, this is. Uh... Mm -hmm. This so is very special. Here are the pairing, pairings in the ladies group and Daria Charchkin is playing against uh, Hampi Konero. This will be very interesting to watch. Uh, Anna Muzichuk versus Lei Tinji. Nana Jagnidze is playing against Alexandra Kostinyuk and Alina Kashlinska against Tan Zhongyi. I have checked uh, the results as well, Peter, uh, so everything seems correct for the moment, yes. Yeah. Yeah, it was clear that Andrekin mm -hmm. has won, so he has to be up there. Mm -hmm. And Magnus left, you see, Magnus left. Yes, as you told us yesterday, he doesn't like to wait. Yeah, and now he's impatiently waiting. He's kind of thinking, what is this? Why are they trying to stop me? I want action, I want blood. And this will be very interesting to see how... how he will play against Jan Nepomniacze, because Jan Nepomniacze he, yeah, he has, no, I mean, Magnus has such motivation, such will to win, uh, which is uh, so inspiring. But nevertheless, yesterday he had to undergo uh, the doping test, so the anti-doping committees uh, asked him to go through this procedure. I hope that he had some time to rest after a very long day. And the round is about to begin. I apologize for being delayed. It was because of a late game in women's section. We are ready to start. Yeah, Magnus 
as we see, he can hardly wait yeah, for the game to start. Yeah, and there we go. And Jan Nepomniachtchi is a very dangerous opponent. Yeah, let's see which line Magnus will play against the Grunfeld. Will he repeat what he has played yesterday against Artemiev? So far it looks like. Do you think that Jan is grumpy? I mean, I'm sure that he is he's ready for Yeah, and we see the same line with H4. I don't know the word grumpy. Ah, grumpy, it means that you're, <laughs> you're like, n you're never... Um, never satisfied with yourself you also in the way you say that, like you're you have this killing look but the, at the same time you're you know you're so grumpy you're never happy yeah I, I don't know I mean I never know what Jan really thinks I mean he seems to show his emotions but uh, is it exactly real or his and again Queen A5 mm -hmm. is played and castles again the same mistake it means that uh, Jan did not check this game by Magnus against Artyom mm -hmm. yesterday and I talked to Artyom at dinner and he also said, yeah, he forgot, he mixed it up. He of course had to take CD, CD, Queen A5, check King F1. That's what happened between Magnus Carlsen and Maxim Vasiela Graf. And Magnus looks surprised because Jan repeats the same variation, so he must think uh, that what the hell is going on. Yeah, the only point is that, okay, Jan spent something like 20 seconds and they know each other very, very well. They have been working together, I think, back in 2011-2012 period. And yeah, Jan is in trouble. Right away he's in trouble. I mean, you just can't mix it up in the Grimfeld. I mean, if you play some solid opening, then okay, one small inaccuracy, kind of, you are just maybe slightly worse, but you can continue to, to fight more or less in a stable ground, but here, Remember, we were discussing this middle game structures, if black should go for CD, CD, or play rook d8 and e6. So Jan went for the same, uh, for, like for the second position that we discussed, but you still think that this is highly inferior for black? Well, because he's facing concrete problems. He cannot play knight e5 because of d6 winning a pawn and winning the game, basically, and after e5, bishop d5 is such an unpleasant threat on the f7 pawn that you cannot really protect queen c7 maybe is a must but then there is bishop f4 so the pawn on c5 is hanging and he goes knight e5 but look at this bishop on d5 this is a monster uh, no, nothing can really challenge it and uh, yeah jan is very very unhappy with himself how could he get so quickly into trouble this is not what you want against magnus but as you have said yourself, you need to check the games which were played yesterday. So you, you basically you need to prepare for your Blitz tournament. Yeah, you kind of need, but at the same time you are so exhausted after 12 games that you think that there are so many games, let me rest, this is much more important than any specific preparation. And yeah. this can cost you the title. Yeah, and also one of the problems for Jan that his second uh, Vladimir Potkin is playing himself in the tournament. Otherwise, if uh, Vladimir would not be playing, he would be checking and he mm -hmm. would have most probably highlighted, you know, Magnus has used this and this against your openings. Watch out here. You have to do this, this and this and you get an information in two minutes and uh, you are perfectly set for the game. Does the cat play in the, tour play in the tournament? <laughs> That's the question, yeah. <laughs> We saw Vladimir Potkin's cat uh, who has a lot of fans, so... <laughs> But now it seems that more or less the worst has passed for, for Jan because he managed to get the c5, c4, kicking away the queen from b3, which was really putting a lot of pressure on f7 pawn. I'm not sure if rook d1 was exactly the best because it uh, allowed this, uh, this option. And now g4, Jan is going for counterplay. Watch out for queen h to checkmate. So bishop f4 mm -hmm. has to be played now. Bishop e5. And all of a sudden it's looking good for Jan. White has to probably bring the queen to c1 in order to control the f4 square. Yeah, queen c1 is played, bishop e6. And now we see Jan in his element. I mean, now he feels more or less confident that at least he is definitely in the game. Magnus is probably asking himself why I didn't play c4 myself. It's, uh, it's a very big question, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so what? 
Yeah, I mean, black spawns to actually is damage, mm -hmm. but black has a lot of activity. And I imagine it's black to move, then he goes rook d8 to d3. And, uh, but if I play h takes g6, okay, take a, g, a, g. bishop h5, queen a5, and queen f4. Yeah, probably you have to do something like this, but then I just take, put the king on f7, and the mm -hmm. knight can come back to e5 and d3. Black is doing perfectly fine, and he is now also ahead on the clock. Yeah, the king magician. King f7, I thought that you can play rook d4 and double on the d5. What yeah, but, but rook d4 is, is nice strategically, but mm -hmm. it's also very risky. I can take cd and knight c6, and I have a very strong mm -hmm. passer on c4 connected with b5. <clears throat> we have seen in these games of Magnus what he's capable of doing with those pawns. We see this but line. Yeah, but they still go with yes, for this variation. Yeah, there was nothing else, but... But f3 first. Yeah, f3 has to be played. It's, uh, it's safer. He needs to bring the king to f2 and to e3. Mm -hmm. mm, Jan doesn't give this. He jumps in with knight e3, putting pressure on the knight. And look at this after rook e1. Will he go knight d1? Most probably he will. And suddenly, look at this. Magnus is down to 28 seconds. Yeah, he goes rook b8. He had to do this. And he cannot go king f2 because of knight d1 it check. It's easy to miss uh, rook a, knight d1 when you calculate uh, this variation. I think he wanted to play rook e1 and... He anyways yes, goes yes. for it. Mm -hmm. He gives the pawn because he he wants to take the c4 pawn and then, and then he gets... And then rook a4 or rook c7. Rook c7 mm -hmm. check, yes. exactly. I mean, because after all, black's uh, kingside pawn structure is damaged. If the white rook gets active, uh, it can also get Maybe very tricky. Maybe he can take it. Knight c3, rook c1, knight d2, rook c4, rook d7. Yeah, he can. Mm -hmm. He needs to enter this variation. Definitely he can, but still at the end there is maybe some... Yeah, but rook c6 can be met by knight b4. So yeah, this variation is actually very important. But hang on after knight takes it to maybe rook e1 is coming. Of course it's... No, it cannot be because the pawn on c4 is very strong. The knight before back. No, Yang goes for g5 and offered the draw or what? Because it felt like he said something. It felt like he said something, yeah. He offered the draw. Yeah, I, I felt it that he offered the draw. Because there is so much respect. No, it... <laughs> I mean, okay, the tension and also that he already saw that he's better and then Magnus find this of giving up the C3 pawn and getting counterplay and uh, you don't really want to allow... But it is somewhat surprising, no? Don't you think? Okay, clear that if uh, Jan plays against someone else, he would have never offered the draw and he would most probably never have played G5. So we have Jan Krzysztof Duda. Against Hikaru. Mm -hmm. Well, this is... This is very interesting because it will be a terrible time scramble. Hikaru is Hikaru exchange was up. third last year, so it was Magnus Carlsen, Jan Krzysztof Duda and Hikaru Nakamura. When we see the same players on the top this year. Exactly. And look at this position. I mean, uh, with just 10 seconds on the clock, how to treat this position objectively? Black, I mean, white is most probably better, but now with the rook on e2, black gets very dangerous counterplay. And how to get, yeah, rook to g3 maybe, yeah? Queen g1 also. Wow, <laughs> oh queen g1 God. with few seconds on the clock, yeah. Now Hikaru is maybe in trouble because of time. But uh, black also has only a few seconds on the clock. Oh, there's so much tension <laughs> that I can barely breathe. Oof, so. queen b4, how to protect h4 pawn. And now pawn on g5 is falling. Now it's over, basically it's over. I mean, it's just looking very bad, yeah, bishop g2. But... What is this? Yes, what is this? That was ah, just Hikaru a wonder. Offer the, the law, what? No. Wow, they kind of offer the draw to each other or not? No, probably not, but what is happening? Yeah, and Duda resigns. Wow, what a dramatic turn of events because he was already completely winning and then he took on G2 mm -hmm. thinking that it's checkmate or he wanted to give Perpetua. I, I don't know, what did he blunder? And Maxim beating Levon Aronian. Another very big pairing. 
So what happened in... Uh, well, too many things have happened. Mm -hmm. Artyom have lost to Matlakov. Mm -hmm. And on your screen uh, you, you see... Katerina yes. versus Anastasia mm -hmm. Bodnaruk. Anastasia yeah? Bodnaruk, yes. And Katerina is in control. But probably there is a black pawn on f7, which we don't mm -hmm. see. Yes, yes. I oh, know uh, that's a, a totally different, different game. game, yes. Can we get back to Ekaterina and Anastasia? Yes, yes this here is we the are. game. Here mm -hmm. we go. So she pushed b7, but how are you going to break? After pushing the pawn to b7, you are not... This is a terrible yes. miss, because mm -hmm. with the pawn on b6, she could have run there and mm -hmm. she would have won the game and... Now, now the king cannot escape. Exactly, mm -hmm. now it's just eternal checks. Yeah, this is what few seconds on the clock mean, I mean, otherwise b6, b7 would have never ever and been the played. Draw was great. Evgeny is ready for us with some highlights of this round. Uh, yeah, that was a surprising, surprising decision by Katerina Lagnoso. Know your end games, people. B7 shouldn't be played in such positions. You should try to run with the king. I'm constantly getting asked on you know, various shows, internet, uh, how to improve at chess. First of all, improve your tactics, because there will be a couple of examples when a couple of examples when you lose your tactical alertness just for a second and that's enough to lose the game or not win the game. Uh, well, for instance, that's an example from Kashlinska and Tanjongi, the game that finished in a draw and black missed a direct win. So knight d5 was played in this position. Uh, well, this one is still acceptable for white, but white goes for swap on e8. That's already a bit of a mistake. And then knight d5, a blunder. Queen takes d5, bishop f1. Uh, black is dominant, black is in control, and black decided to win the pawn like that, uh, which happened to be not enough in the end, but had black spent a couple of seconds here, she could have come with a beautiful move, rook e2, pinning, the rook cannot be taken, black is winning completely, rook e2 was a really, really nice move to make, and it was winning. All right, and then the other one. Mamid Yarov losing to Alexei Sarana. So over here, Sarana is the pawn up, but Mamid Yarov has the rook on the second rank. The battery looks impressive, so it does seem that black has to have enough compensation. And probably he had queen to d7. I'm not sure why would you need this. H3, and you certainly didn't need queen d5, so queen d5 was played. Instead, computer says queen c7, maybe keep the 7th rank protected. Black does have decent compensation. Queen d5 happens to be a blunder, knight f6, and it's black king which is getting checkmated. After g f6, rook e7 with queen g7 to follow. So keep tactics under control. That's important. Back to the studio. Thank you, Evgeny. So we should definitely do some tactical exercises with Peter here. And we have the results of this round. It was the 14th round in the Open Tournament. I will remind you that there are 21 rounds played in the Open Tournament and only 17 rounds played in a ladies' event. So a lot of decisive games, Peter. Yeah, a lot of, lot of, okay. It's, uh, the players are on fire. They know very well that they have to start winning if they want to catch up with the leaders. The draws bring them nothing, so most probably all the players are taking a much, much more mm -hmm. risks. And these are the results from the ladies' event. Um, a very important win for Hampi Konero because uh, Katerina Lagno drew her game against Bodnaruk Anastasia, so uh, there is only a half point difference between those two. Anna Muzichuk won against Lei Tingji and Alexandra Kostyunyuk beat Nana Jagnidze. And also a very important win uh, for Jean Saya Abdumalik. Uh, she beat Valentina Bunina. So. Yeah, we had mm -hmm. so many incredible games uh, and very important ones. Vashi Lagnaf won this heavyweight battle against Levon Aronian. Filuza has won again his game against Dimitri Andrekin. Uh, Filuza is just amazingly more and more. 
I mean, not only winning, but winning against the world's best and also blitz specialist whatsoever. It just shows that how dangerous, how strong he is. And he's only 16 years old. He's only 16, yeah. The only good news that soon he will be 17, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> And, and I'm very happy that uh, Vladimir Kramnik uh, is catching the rhythm. Okay, yesterday also he started with three out of three at the beginning, so the real challenge for Vladimir is probably how he copes later with the, with the tension and uh, also if his uh, physical preparation is not enough for this very tough tournament. And apparently he just played the positional masterpiece. I think so, yeah. I, I would like to show this game. I'm very happy for Vladimir and uh, he will be moving up from board 8. Probably we will see him on board 4 already on stage. C4, E5. D3. Kramnik sticks to the same stuff that he has played against Donchenko. Knight FC. Knight C6, A3. G6, B4. Very, very clever from, from Vladimir because as we have seen yesterday against Donchenko, this type of positions very much suit his style and it also perfectly uh, suitable for, for blitz play. No force lines, you just rely on your experience, understanding. And now we see a very important moment. Yeah, black plays queen c8. The big question is how to deal with the idea of black playing bishop h3, where Kramnik finds it a very nice way of playing knight g5 first. It attacks the bishop, stops bishop h3, black has to retreat with the bishop, and uh, no hurry, just which piece still does not take part in the action, the rook on a1, so rook c1 is played, h6, knight e4, and after knight takes e4, d takes e4, I like this very, very much, it's uh, very, very classy, white gets a very nice d5 square, and then will be ready to eventually push with c4, c5, and break black structure, but what is much more important, that what should black do? And black is doomed to, to passive play. Okay, bishop h3 has to be played, knight d5, bishop takes g2, king g2, king h7, and b4, b5, played by Vladimir, and we will soon see what's his main point. Behind this move, knight d4 is met by b6, and black has no other choice than to play c6, after which white jumps into c7 with the knight. Rook b8, f4. This is the type of knight you might not be sure. Is this strong or is it uh, doing nothing? Uh, however, Vladimir has perfectly judged that this is extremely good for him. And look at this. Black plays c5 voluntarily. It means that probably c4, c5 was breaking his structure and was really posing Bartosz, a lot of headache. However, after c5, f5, it looks like what white has done is just uh, fantastic because white is winning. g, f, e, f, queen, d7, f6, bishop, h8, queen, d3, check, and now white goes for the black king. And as usually they say, first improve your pieces and the tactics, and the attack will come automatically. Knight, d5, look, f, e8. And, okay, after look f4, it's clear that it's just a question of time when black will be mated. All the pieces are getting closer to black's king. And now that black protected comes 97 check, cashing in the material. A very, very smooth, but very illustrative win by, and instructive win by Vladimir Kramnik. And he's getting closer to the, to the leaders. Yeah, I just had one question, Peter. When uh, Black played c5, that was uh, probably the last critical moment of the game, so should, uh, can Black play f5 here? Yeah, I mean, c5 That's looks... probably the last try, the last counter chance. Yeah, exactly. I mean, after c5, f5, game is over, so I don't know what has happened with... Maybe c5. Bartosz, but after f5, I can play e3. This is maybe a big problem, okay. and knight e6, Simply queen d6, and I collect, I cash in. Knight takes e7, b takes, and then also e5 is falling. I mean, it's, it's obvious that when you play a move like c6, c5, it shows that something terribly went wrong. Otherwise, if you have an alternative to it, you would never even consider this move. But a very, very nice play by Kramnik. It looks so easy and so nice, but that's why we love uh, the games of Kramnik, because it's just incredible. With button ease, he can win the games. And we do not have the pairings for the moment. Uh, I've been checking them online. Uh, Hikaru Nakamura is still clear second. And Magnus is leading with 
11 and a half points. Yeah, then maybe we can for a second come back to this position. I mean, look at this. Look at this. Black seems to be in complete control. Uh, two points for the exchange. Okay, previously I think Hikaru had an advantage, but once the clocks the, the clocks are going down, you have seen how nervous also Hikaru got. He put all his pieces he brought back mm -hmm. trying to defend this one weakness on G2 because it's so much more easy to attack this pawn. Uh, however, when finally he managed to protect everything, uh, he is strategically and slowly step by step lost. And the reason behind the blunder, I think, that he missed that after Bishop G2, Rook G2, Queen F1, you have this Queen G1. Is... Exactly. I and mean, Jan's. Please pronounce it. Young because, Shistof, yes. Yeah, I just can't do this. I don't know why. So I stick to do and you do the rest. Uh, I mean, yeah, it's uh, a tragic blunder finally by uh, Duda because he was thinking that that's it, game over. But after Queen G1, it's really mm -hmm. game over. But he has to design and all of a sudden he remains with Rook Dan. And mm -hmm. not only Rook Dan, but it was very important that uh, Hikaru yes. could even hit Rook H5, after which doesn't matter if you have two mm -hmm. or three seconds on the clock, game is over. So what a turnaround, what a dramatic turnaround. Turnaround because if, for example, we see this position, it looks like, yes, it's a mess, it's complicated, but Hikaru managed to kind of protect. Black was just going up and down, think, I mean, basically showing that I don't really have any real sled, but believe me, if in a time travel phase you have a safe king on H7 and you have one which is running around, it's uh, very difficult to handle this. But even in the final position, Peter, uh, uh, after rook h8 and king g7, you can still blunder with queen h6. Can you imagine? Exactly. Yes. I mean, queen h6 would be incredible because queen takes h6 is check, then you have to take, and there is an intermediate rook takes yes. g1 check, and after king g1, king h6, black wins the game. While we were watching live, I also thought, like, just please don't play Queen H6 because that would be already way too much. So let's give a word to Evgeny and see what he has in store for us. Well, honestly, I was preparing the other game, but uh, seeing you guys analyzing this and the moment where Duda has taken on G2 with the bishop, what's wrong with Rook takes G2? At least, well, you know, not using any engine, I, I just thought rook g2 might be an interesting move. Point being queen f4, rook f2, I don't know what white is supposed to do because black is going to take the queen, but before that he's going to take the rook. And if you take on g2, then black collects all the stuff, bishop g2 and bishop h3. Uh, so apparently rook g2 was worth considering. However, it was not the game I wanted you to look at. Uh, I have for you a loss by Artemiev against Matlakov. That was, that was an interesting moment out there. So you can imagine it was the, the English opening played with e5 and basically the reverse Sicilian. So white pretends being black played the Sicilian having an extra tempo. And I'm guessing what black is doing here g5 shouldn't be all that good. Those attacks are standard if white, oh, well, black in Sicilian, once again, back and forth, this white-black. If the king is already castled, then you push the g-pawn, you try to drive the knight from f3 away. But over here, it's a bit too much. h3, bishop g7, and then the standard reaction. g4, exchanging the f5-pawn, getting access to e4 square, and since the king is not castled, it's very likely white can castle long if, if the king's side is getting open. It seems that white is getting a very pleasant position. So f takes, h takes, bishop g4, rook to g1, h5, white was doing everything correctly. Queen c4, e4, kind of trying the last chance. How did white end up losing? Let's find out. Bishop g7 takes on f3, bishop to f8 takes on e2. And it turns out this bishop on g4 had to be eliminated. So white would have won, would he take on g4 first and then move the bishop? e2 pawn is gone. Well, anytime soon, king takes on e2, uh, white is dominant. What has happened, bishop c5 immediately, perhaps thinking that, well, well, I'll take on the other move, Knight e5, queen e4, and then bam, knight f4. Very, very strong move, because knight takes d3 is a checkmate, right? So you can't really prevent. 
Rook g4 is already too late because this knight takes on d3, the other knight guards the e2 pawn, you have to uh, surrender the queen. So e4, knight d3, once again, black wins the queen and in few more moves the game. So white played perfectly, but once again, once again, tactical alertness over here, the bishop on g4 should have been taken. Back to the studio, back to Almira and Peter. Thank you, Evgeny. And we've been analyzing, uh, we've been continuing to analyze the game between Hikaru and Jan Kshishtov. So we found a small defense after Rook G2. Yeah, I mean, small defense to prolong the game, but obviously, I mean, uh, it's, it's obvious during the game that somehow taking on G2 should be winning. But uh, yeah, Rook G2, White has to play Rook takes H5. There is no other move, but Black anyway runs away with his king. Mm -hmm. and. Yes, white can include the rook h7 check, king f6. Now there is, a, there is one line starting with rook f7, but it's probably not perpetual check. So most probably black should take back on g2, after which queen f1 check, queen g1, bishop g2 does not win anymore the rook. However, the end game is anyway a technical win for black because these three pawns should be, should be enough to, to win the game against the rook. Still, with few seconds on the clock, anything can happen, but it looks like very nice harmony for black. A dramatic finish anyway. I mean, yeah, this is a tragic loss for, for Duda, but we have also seen how many times he has won lost positions. So, yeah, sometimes it uh, equals out. Oh, and look at the pairings. Maxime Rachel Lagrave has made it to the first board. And he is playing against Magnus Carlsen. Yeah, Ma Maxim is now on fire. He has won his first two games and most probably yesterday he must have also won the last few games in order to... But he lost their encounter in the World Rapid Tournament with the same colors. Do you remember he went for the Sveshnikov with knight d But it was a draw at the end. Ah, yes, it was a draw, yes, because yeah. he was, yeah, he was losing, yes, exactly, he was because, losing, yes, yeah. Yeah. we announced that it was completely winning and it, Maxim saved, exactly, you were right. And the Scandinavian defense, what a surprise. Wow. Wow. With Queen d6, c6, and will he play with g6? And look at this, Maxim is not hesitating. Maxim is not hesitating. I actually had lunch today with Maxim and I told him about Maxim, uh, Magnus's game against Pratke that it was e4, g6, d4, knight, f6 and Maxim immediately told me the refutation of it, you know, okay. so he's kind of prepared for all kinds of uh, dubious lines. So Magnus went for the line with g6. Uh... Yeah, with c6 and g6. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The Tiviakov Scandinavian is very, very popular in this tournament. Played already for the second time by Magnus and it was also in the first rapid game. Black played. Black dared to play it against Magnus, which backfired badly. And now Maxim taking his time. In fact, compared to all those lines and all those games, White played H3 and Black played G6. This is now probably in Black's favor. Maxim goes bishop e2, bishop g7, castles. This is now a relatively slow way of treating the position. I would believe that like this... Uh, Normally you would automatically castle here. What is Magnus thinking about? Yeah, this is a good... Uh, if should he include mm -hmm. b5? Yeah, that's exactly the... The moment I was also thinking about because if castles, then maybe White could have played a4, stopping mm -hmm. b5 altogether. And so that was a very important intermediate move. Yeah, now he can put his bishop on b7 if he's sure that he will get c65. Yeah, bishop b7 played, and Magnus is having a perfect position. You know, I mean, he just equalized so easily and it's playable. It's not just full equality, but it's even playable position. Knight d4 had to be played. White has to take control, try to take control of the c5 square and now it's not so easy to push c5 because the bishop on b7 might be hanging in some lines. 
So the question, should Black then switch to some e7, e5 break? First, of course, bringing the rook to d8, which is a very good preparatory move for both c5 and for e5. Rook e1. And before kicking... Look at their posture. They have basically the same posture on the board. Yeah, like their hands are ready to move. <laughs> Magnus grabs the pawn just to disturb the symmetry yeah, of their <laughs> hand movements. Knight takes f6. Okay, bishop f6, maybe bishop h6. Okay. Yeah, but also bishop f6 gives knight e4 tempo. Mm -hmm. I don't know why is Magnus thinking, because after knight takes f6, there is knight a4, stopping c5. Is maybe e f6? What he considers. Can Maybe it, it is worth considering. Yeah, but, but no, he goes for bishop f6 finally. Oh, and knight e4, c5. Okay. c5, mm -hmm. yeah, not, not wasting any time. Just he feels that he needs to open up this diagonal and exchange. And, but not only this, this, there is a very awkward pin yeah, on the d-file. If knight takes f6, which then is so f6, natural, yes, of course. exactly, black takes with the knight, and all of a sudden the d-file is open, and how to deal with this? That's why Magnus was thinking, yeah, that this bishop f6, knight e4, c5 was not a simple reaction at all. Magnus takes the bishop anyway, he takes on mm -hmm. b7, and the question what will he do now it's a very very difficult question because you don't want to play c3 but if you have to then you might end up in this isolated pawn position against magnus this is just very very unpleasant because it's one-way traffic black is playing for free for an advantage bishop is the defending move knight blocks the pawn with knight d5 mm -hmm. Bishop a6, rook c8. This is now easy, easy play for black. The only question how to... I mean, yeah, rook c7, and then idea is some queen c6, queen c2. But back rank problem. Watch out for any kind of e6 structure, and then queen takes d5, rook e8, mm -hmm. checkmate, if the black queen uh, goes too far. f6, a very classy move, exactly. King has to go to f7. But classic, classic, there is this direct rook c1. Okay, so what, queen d7? Yeah, but then rook c7 you have to take with the knight yes. and everything is uh, And queen loose. b7, yeah. Exactly. Well, he missed this move, rook c1. Yeah, yes, he, ne he needs to protect the b7 square. Yeah, and the knight protects mm -hmm. the a8 square. Mm -hmm. And if he manages to come back then to d5, then everything is under control again. Queen b5 is a very precise move. Even when he blunders, he the next move is uh, very accurate. Yeah, he takes few seconds mm -hmm. time, but yeah, he finds the the stabilizer, and all you need here is the the stability. Yeah, and Maxim plays rook e1, but in this case now Black gets the the position he wants. Queen, Queen f5 mm -hmm. takes on g6 takes. And now black is also setting some g5, king g6. So be careful. The bishop can be trapped on h6. Of course, Maxim doesn't want to trade on f5. It's also very bad, but he realized that he has to. Hmm. He has to, and now he has to How defend. How to evaluate this endgame? Well, the question is how bad it is. Yes. <laughs> yeah. King g5, after a5 is... Yes, so the king gets to d5. Knight e6 and bishop b3 and 4. He lost the pawn. But yeah. maybe knight e6, a3. Or what to do? But okay, knight e6, bishop e3, f4, you move back the bishop. Mm -hmm. Then still the f4 pawn is also hanging. Can I uh, change your structure by playing f3 and then play, or g takes and knight d4? Yeah, it's, uh, very, mm -hmm. it's very, very promising. And it's played. F4. But still, I would say that now this should be drawable because this a5, b4 pawns are also 
weak, but knight c5 check, very important moment. Yeah, can he take or not? Can he take or not? The black king cannot enter the queen side. Yeah, and this is now looking blue. What an escape by Maxim, finally. Well, it would take me like half an hour to calculate the, <laughs> the end game, and Maxim knows immediately that uh, it's a draw. Yeah, okay, he, the good point was for him that he felt like he has to take, because if his king has to move it, it looks very bad, and you immediately realize that this beastly construction secures you. And draw. Well, incredible defense by Maxim. And very impressive how Magnus took over with black. And we have the action there, yeah? Yes, Daniel Dubov against Alireza Firuja. Meanwhile, Kramnik has also beaten Janja Pomniaci, so Kramnik is really on fire. But now let's see, 4, 3, 2. Yes, Daniel Dubov is completely winning, but... Look at this, the look on C5 the rook, is yes. trapped. Mm -hmm. Look on C5 is trapped. There are so many pawns. Black wants to go e4, e3, g3. And it's winning for winning for Dubov. Incredible, we have missed the action. And we have missed a lot of lot of action. It must have been a great so round. And Hikar also won, yes. Hikar so won. many yes, so mm -hmm. many wins. And Voloda Murcin on board 58 against Viktor Laznichka. The 13-year-old just blundered the checkmate. But Hikaru, Hikaru's win uh, gives him the lead, together with Magnus Carlsen. Probably. Yes. I already lost count. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm just focusing on each game and uh, everything is so interesting. Both and of them have 12 points now. And so exciting that I forgot all the results. And this is Sergei Karyak in action, so he's also climbing back, yeah? He's now bought 16, he had mm -hmm. a disastrous end of yesterday. And he's playing against Alexander Shimanov. And he has to protect this Rook Knight versus Rook stuff that we have seen so many <laughs> times. But don't worry, the players are only getting two seconds increment, so this game will not last forever. It will last for a while, but it will not last forever. But somehow, I think that it's much more difficult to defend it in Blitz. <gasps> Definitely. You played it with one second. One second, and the very scary move, Rook G8. I mean, so far away. And checkmate, you yes. see? What's happening with uh, the two seconds increment? Oh, Tanjungi against Elizabeth Petz. Yeah, wow. I see a very strong pass pawn. But this pass... Ah, she's peace up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Elizabeth wins. Elizabeth wins her game. So then she's also back for the fight for mm -hmm. the medals. What happened on the first board in the ladies' event? It was a draw. Katerina Lachno versus uh, Anna Muzicuk mm -hmm. draw. And we see another draw, Hampi Konelu versus mm -hmm. Abdu Malik. And Alexandra Kustinyuk drew as well, yes, against yeah. uh, Anastasia. So the Podolov. first win was on board four by Elizabeth Pitts. Mm -hmm. So all games are finished on the top boards in the ladies' event. And all games are finished on the top boards in the, uh, in the open tournament. So let's have a look at... Uh, how Daniel Dubov won against Alireza Firuja? Well, I think he got extremely lucky. So what happened? How did he uh, trap the rook? I think he got very, mm -hmm. very lucky because at some point, I mean, okay, we don't have yes, yet the board. Yes, we need the board yes, because we wanted to show how the rook was trapped. Mm -hmm. Yeah, basically, look at this position. It's, it's symmetric, but with the black pawn being on g5 instead of on g6, it's obvious that white is clearly better, the knight is ready to jump to f5, but even what is more important, that white can break this structure with h4. After g h4, knight f5, knight d6, queen h5, takes, takes. Finally, the players reached this endgame. Mm -hmm. 
which looks like it should be a question, method of time when white will finally win this endgame, unless black is able to put up some fortress, but it's very hard to believe. And already here, h6, white can just take this pawn if white wants. It's a clear pawn, healthy pawn, probably easy win. But uh, probably judging that uh, white has everything under control and white to take this pawn at all, white plays rook d1, rook b7, rook d8. That's how we got this rook mm -hmm. b5, rook a8, takes, takes, bishop e7, rook takes a5. One would have simply the feeling that it's almost time to design in this position. Rook b3 takes, 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 rook b6, king h5. Completely winning position and for... rook a6 here. For white, and all of a sudden, yeah, the rook on c5 gets trapped, but it's not the end of the world, because with mm -hmm. g4, g5, you're anyway breaking it. So what on earth has happened here? But the black king comes to, to d6 and mm -hmm. traps the rook. Uh, this is what, what happened. But still, maybe with king g6, king d6, king takes f6, King c5, I believe white is not risking, maybe even winning uh, after some king e6, f6, and even pushing the g pawn might be very dangerous. I mean, I don't know, it's very hard to, to calculate. But it feels like white is definitely not risking anything. Wow, wow, but, but of course it was such a complete win before that, under this incredible shock, panic reaction g4, panic reaction g5, and all of a sudden it turns out that black is in time to take the rook and bring back the rook to the eighth rank. And this is not yet over because it would anyway be very good for uh, Firuza if there would not be any e5 or g5 pawn. But all of a sudden it turns out that he cannot stop the, the break of one of the black three pawns, pawns and therefore he had to design. I mean it's a tragic loss. He was completely dominating this game. And Evgeny has some gems for, from this round for us. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to highlight what seems to be a very nice tactical victory by Badur Jobava against Dmitry Andrekin. So in the previous play, oh, maybe let's, let's go a few moves back. So that was the position and Andrekin decided that he wants to sacrifice a piece, he wants to go for an attack. Knight to c4 played. B takes, D takes, now C3 is, of course, the knight is hanging, C3 is a threat, so knight B4 is the must. Queen B6, A2, A3, and knight to D5. And then, you know, I don't care what the objective evaluation of this is, but in the blitz, you tend to get scared, you tend to panic, and, and you play a move like this, black cup, just goes king E7, rook FB8, and you are under constant pressure. But Chabava is not that kind of a guy, so he says, I'll be the one attacking. Knight c3, you can take whatever you like, knight b4, a b4. I suspect bishop b4 was the better move, but still, uh, white was always in control. Black castle short, uh, planning to hide the king on h8, and the other rook supposed to join the action. Rook g1 check happens, king h8, bishop to c4, queen b4, and now, no fear, knight e4, takes, knight takes d6. So check from a2 happens to be precisely one single check. King is very safe on c1. And it's actually white who is attacking. Bishop h5 was played and e4. e4 opening queen's path to h6. Rook f to b8, d5. So white is the one who, is threaten, who threatens a checkmate in one. Yeah, by the way, bishop f3 is not possible as well because of some knight f7s. e5, here there were quite a few winning moves D takes C6 was played. Queen B3, Queen C3. Interestingly, the moves were repeated. I don't think, in fact, I think it's just, just a mistake. Rook A6 was the actual move I've seen from a camera view, so that the move was played. Now C6 is hanging. In fact, if you play Queen C3, you are losing after Rook C6, but Chobava found a brilliant response. Knight to B5. So now if rook c6, there is knight c3, white gathers all the pieces around the king and threatens queen d8 check and then rook d8 check made himself. After knight b5, Andrekin lost on time, but the position was already lost. So once again, my man Badur Jobava playing some nice attacking chess. Back to the studio. 
Thank you, Evgenia. And I've checked the results. It seems that the battle for the World Rapid, uh, for the World Blitz title, is still open in both tournaments. A lot of decisive games in this round in the open section. There was only one draw on the first board, and then. Uh, all decisive games, Peter. Yeah, in incredible. I mean, uh, Matlakov after losing to Magnus, he lost uh, his next game as well now to, to Hikaru. In the meanwhile, okay, he, he managed to bounce back, but yeah, these are two important losses with the white pieces. Kramnik continues his uh, superior run by winning with black against Jan Japomniachi, and we are seeing the results. So. <laughs> Well, a few draws only, and... And the tragic mm -hmm. loss uh, by Firuza on board four against Daniel Dubov. Arunyan Levon, Levon Arunyan won his game, Bartosz Stoczko was won his game as well. Uh, but Dur Jabava strikes again. So... Yes, Yevgeny showed this incredible crazy mm -hmm. game, finally. Mm -hmm. The tactical skirmish was won by Badu <laughs> Jabal. I'm learning, you see, I'm learning. <laughs> and uh, we see Nihal Sarin, the young uh, Indian, Indian prodigy, uh, who is a blitz specialist, who, is, who has a 26.85 blitz rating. Already his classical mm -hmm. rating is also uh, over 2600, but still 26.85 for a 15-year-old in blitz rating is, is incredible. And let's have a look at the results in the ladies section, the ladies tournament. So three draws on the top boards, and then, uh, as we saw, Elizabeth Patz uh, beat Tanjungi. Harika Dronavali won uh, against Alina Kashlinska, and Alisa Galamova won against Bakhtiak Mungutu. So a lot of decisive games as well. Mm. What are the important wins? Nana Jagnitza won with black, Stefanova Antonietta won with black. Valentina Gunin lost to Leitinji and Mary Rebidze uh, won against Daria Charuchkin. Yeah, and if we see some more draws on the top boards, it means that the players from below can catch up and we might be seeing more and more candidates. So here are the standings in the Open tournament. Magnus Carlsen is leading together with Hikaru Nakamura. They yeah, you were absolutely right. Yeah, Hikaru catch Magnus. And they are having one point lead ahead of Daniel Dubov and Vladimir Kramnik. Kramnik is sharing third place already. Mm -hmm. Wow, so we are maybe coming closer and closer to a Vladimir Kramnik Magnus Carlsen uh, matchup. Yes, and let's uh, get back to Evgeny. Uh, yeah, so. Uh, once we were looking at the cross table, I've noticed there is one special name, like in this big share with, with ten, 10 points, I'm guessing. Yeah, there was Kramnik, there were like all the big guns, and Nihal Sarin, Indian youngster. And what amazes me about those youngsters, well, sometimes they don't know the end game, sometimes they have lack of particular knowledge in the opening, but when it comes to tactics, those guys are brilliant. So now this game, Nihal Sarin with white again, Maxim Wawulin, black was to move and it seems that black, it was a time for black to take care of his king by moving king h8. Uh, black has played c3 and in the blitz with seconds on the clock, Nihal Sarin immediately identifies the checkmate pattern. Queen to b8 check, well, uh, repeated the position once, but then Queen b8, here, bishop check from e8, forcing the king forward because king f8, bishop removes a this diagonal, right? That's a checkmate. Well, in few moves, anyway. King to f6, king e6 is not better because of check, check on the 6th rank and nowhere to go. You have to go knight c6, uh, give away the knight, king f6, queen d6 check, king g5, h4, checkmate, very next move on h6. So, be aware of the tactics when you play the younger guys. Try to keep as solid as possible. I believe we'll have an interview with uh, Carson, not Magnus Carson, but Henrik Carson, and then we'll be back to the studio. Joined by Magnus Carson's father. Uh Magnus had a great day. To, Magnus had a great day today. He won, but he was very annoyed when asked about the doping. Just here, 
what's your opinion on what happened? Well, I mean, uh, of course he has to follow the rules, so he will go to the doping control, but uh, he's had very long days here, and uh, since this was also the days with the most number of games and bits, he was hoping to get back to the hotel and have dinner quite quickly, while typically the doping control can take one or two hours, so that it will delay our return for quite some time, but it's part of the game and uh, we just accept it, of course, but that w that's what, why he was annoyed with when he got this message with a lot of adrenaline also after the last game. Uh, it's been quite a tough day, he's performed well, but he's been tired today. And just one more question, do you think he w this will impact his performance tomorrow? Probably not, since uh, he still has a long night and part of the day tomorrow to recuperate. So I think he will be okay, but right now he was a bit annoyed and uh, I think it's already kind of passed. So. Okay, I well, hope it goes well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Energy is essential to human life. It also drives progress. At Total, energy is our business. We are a leading international oil and gas company and a major player in low carbon energies. We explore for, produce, transform market and distribute energy in a variety of forms to serve the end customer. And we operate in more than 130 countries. How are we providing concrete responses to the challenges of the next 20 years? How can we meet the energy needs of a growing population? How can we tackle climate change? And how can we adapt to new consumer habits and customer expectations by supplying an energy mix combining natural gas, oil and renewables and by improving the energy efficiency of our facilities and products to limit their impact on global warming and also by leveraging our closeness to customers by anticipating their needs and helping them use energy more responsibly. In short, our 98,000 employees are committed to supplying affordable, reliable, clean energy to as many people as possible. Our ambition is to become the responsible energy major.
Uh, welcome back to our studio. We have uh, the pairings for the 13th round in the ladies group, uh, which was finished. That was, will be the 14th round because I'm still <laughs> uh, confused with the difference in the uh, in the ladies event and in the open event. So here are the pairings in the open. Tournament, and I wanted to explain why we call it an open tournament because theoretically a few women could have played the open section uh, like uh, Katerina Lagno, Hampi Conero, uh, Ju Win Jun uh, and Alexandra Garechkina. Yeah, and the game started? We wanted to focus on the game between Vladimir Kramnik and Hikaru Nakamura. Yeah, but look at this. Manu mm -hmm. started the game with 10 seconds uh, delay. I mean, because he... He came too late. Can we have our cameras uh, on Kramnik? Yes, Hikaru. on Kramnik and Hikaru. Yes. Let's have a look if we can. Yeah, let's see big blood in action. Mm -hmm. Final on the camera, live, and against no other than Hikaru Nakamura. Kramnik sticks to his 1c4, knight f6, knight c3, but aha, very, very clever and smart by Hikaru that. After c4, he played knight f6, knight c5, c5. So didn't let Kramnik use his pet system that he was playing so far in the tournament. 254, 246. Yes, Vladimir is faster than Hikaru Nakamura. Incredible, yeah. I think this is his strategy because I know for myself, I very much like to have like one minute at the end of the game, I mean, when all this craziness starts, because otherwise I just lose control, no matter what the position. Yes, he explained to me that yesterday he had a game against Mikhail Kobale and he had an extra night and, and a pawn, but he panicked. So even Vladimir Kramnik panics. Definitely, if the clocks are ticking down, we, we are and we were not used to this. And 91, this is somewhat surprising at first but uh, yeah Vladimir wants to eliminate this bishop and then bring his knight back to f3 he could rightly goes for b7 mm -hmm. b5 black wants to break white structure with b4 after which if the b pawn and the c pawn are exchanged black gets a very nice control of the d4 square this would guarantee him basically total strategical safety Kramnik plays bishop e3 but he can continue with b4 now yeah, he can. He can also play a5 first. Mm -hmm. I mean, black is the one who who has more freedom in the in the position. He goes for b4. The question is what he can want from this game now. It's clear that he's. I mean, he solved all his problems. Will he try to uh, go for some double a stuff or to to make clean equality and uh, showing respect to Vladimir and play very positionally solid? So he carries the world. Blitz number one, and he is fighting for the title. Yeah, knight takes b4. But believe me, for example, for Kramnik it doesn't really matter if uh, Hikaru is first or not first. He just wants to play his own game. And I'm pretty sure that he thinks that if I'm playing my game, then I'm still good enough against anyone. And look at this. Kramnik 20 seconds ahead on the clock. Not something one this could looks have like guessed. the Pelican Sicilian with the reversed colors. Yeah, very much. What is Rook D6? Ah, Rook D6, yeah, okay. Rook C4, and I'm not sure that this was right by Hikaru to go B5, B4 so early. There was simply no need for it. Now, all of a sudden, the knight is a little bit uh, dubious on B4, mm -hmm. and black has compromised his pawn structure. So if Vladimir managed not to, to stabilize his position, then black will be full of weaknesses. Rook c6, probably correct to change one pair of rooks. But like five moves ago, I felt like black is the one who can decide to play for slight advantage or not, and all of a sudden, wow, d4, right? Very interesting decision by Kramnik. Yes, I was thinking about rook c6, knight c6, knight f3, and then rook c1, but that was an obvious choice. Exactly, that so was a very obvious choice, and uh, I think 99% uh, of the players would have chosen that. This dcd4 is very interesting. 
is this so I mean is it because it's so ambitious it seems like it's because it's very ambitious if black takes on c4 then white gets the queen to c4 and the knight on mm -hmm. b4 is trapped then a, a3 would just win a piece so Hikaru takes on d4 and goes for rook e6 a good reaction white wants the uh, black wants to provoke e4 e5 then the knight immediately gets the d5 square and so you don't have d5 because of knight d5 yes yeah, so white should probably attack the knight on d4 maybe with queen d2 just mm -hmm. sidestepping the pin and where is this knight going rook b8 because let's not forget after ac knight c6 d5 mm -hmm. is kind of a fork so yes, but you're AC, forced to play knight a6 yeah mm -hmm. and this is not what you want but then the pawn on a3 will be hanging and also the pawn on e5 but then knight a6 queen a5 you cannot take on e4 and yeah, hikaru honest, is in trouble yeah hikaru is in trouble but to be honest looking at this position from the side it's a bit tricky yeah, yeah? i mean uh, it's easy to miss and look at this hikaru down to 28 seconds down to 28 seconds versus Kramnix 120 but how to continue? Ramnik brings his knight to f3. Is e4 hanging or not? Or then knight e5 is coming? I, I should take on e4. It's a knight e5. Knight e5. Now mm -hmm. f7 is hanging. Knight c6 mm -hmm. fork is. Wow, very unpleasant so, to. Rook f8. To face with so little time. Then also, queen takes a3. Mm -hmm. Hikaru goes after the pawn. And he has queen e3 check. Wow, maybe Kramnik should have not allowed this. Maybe he has missed Queen takes a3. He played too fast. He played too fast. Can he continue with the uh, rook c3? Yeah, maybe he has to, but it's not what he had planned. And, and uh, Queen a4, rook c4. So exactly. Also somewhat of a perpetual. He goes queen c2 anyway, queen is the... Mm -hmm. Ah, it's not checked, It was Sorry. not checked, yes. We are too tired. We need, we need a cup of coffee. <laughs> That's not a check. But look at now, Kramnik is getting extremely nervous. He knows that probably he had something better before. And now time is ticking down. And what should he do? He goes after the knight, rook a4. I mean, this is dramatic with such a, yeah, rook d4 ha has to be played. And now takes, takes knight c6, mm -hmm. winning the exchange. Black has a lot of pawns, but queen b2, oh my god. Queen c4 now taking on a6. Hikaru is shocked. Yes, knight e7. seven, king f8. Knight f5. Yeah, now Kramnik is technically winning the only question if... Yeah, but it's very difficult for black to play. Queen e6, queen takes a7, queen e5, queen f2, a stabilizer, queen c2, g6. Knight is kicked all the way back to h4, but if it comes back to f3, yes. f3 then mm -hmm. it's all okay. Maybe he can play rook e1. Queen c5. And, and now rook e. Yeah, queen e3. Queen b4. Look at the tension on Vladimir. I Five feel seconds. Like his hands are shaking. Hikaru was also down to three seconds. He keeps on bothering. Mm -hmm. But, but changing the rooks was, I'm not sure, the best reaction. Now with the queens on the board, black has all kinds of perpetual check ideas. Okay, knight gets to c4, but this is now not so easy to convert with so little time. And look at Hikaru is like trying to give the signal to Kramnik that you know, I just, no, no, this is too this. this is too much. <laughs> Peter, for me, this I cannot, I cannot control my emotions and. Uh, yeah, previously Kramnik played a move with one seconds on the clock. So knight g2 now, yes. Queen oh. f2. Mm -hmm. What is happening? 
because yes, you cannot take white is pinned. Queen d4, such a nice move. But not check and c3. Then knight of one. Yeah, oh, no, yes, probably yeah. he will agree to a draw mm -hmm. now. Incredible. Incredible what, what to do. Yeah. This is what does time. Yeah, completely winning position by Vladimir, but Hikaru saves it. Magnus has won in the meantime, and we are seeing again Vidit and Shimanov. And now Shimanov is in the receiving end, and okay, this is a completely losing position. He has just won himself a Rook Knight versus Rook against Karyakin, but here there are two pawns, so it's not a theoretical, though it's a complete loss. And Magnus won against Daniel Dubov. Yes. And Shimanov has designed the hopeless position. What happened in the latest event? Yeah, I mean, Kramnik took all our energy and all our attention. It was dramatic to see how, how Kramnik and Hikaru face each other. Katerina Lachno lost to Alisa Garyamova. This is a very, very interesting result for the tournament, mm -hmm. because suddenly then it's, it's completely open. And Hampi made a draw with Anna Muzicuk, and another draw by Alexandra Kostenyuk versus Maria Rabidze. And another draw by Elizabeth Petz against Donavali Harika, and another draw, what, what are happening with our ladies? Uh, Abdul Malik uh, Bodnaru game is also drawn. Yes, I was trying to update the results online, but it seems that uh, it's very difficult even <laughs> to have those online. Uh, Lighting Gia won against Zagnidze, so this is a very important win for her. And here we see Lekwan Gliam in action, but he's just pissed down and with two seconds on the clock mm -hmm. in such position you have no chance. And this is... Alexander Injic, I think the tallest grandmaster on the world. But How tall is he? 2.4, I think 2.4, because the, I was commenting in Vikanze and I underestimated him. I was claiming someone else to be the tallest and yeah. there was a tweet. And Peter Heine Nilsson, how he's, tall is he? Exactly, he's not tall enough. Oh, he's not tall enough. He's okay. not tall enough to win this chase. It still takes time, but finally when the king will get to e7, mm -hmm. the white king then the pawn on f6 will fall. This is just a question of time. Yeah, the king is coming. King c5, king d6. Yeah, now whatever, and the point is that he can make so many moves, always he gets the two seconds, so he already gathered a lot of time on the clock. King d5. Everything is protected. So... White is just winning. We don't know which board it is, yeah? We don't see. Here on GA check. I mean, defending such position is also very unplanned because you know that you have zero chance, yeah? There are positions when you know you have some home, but this is hopeless. But he realized he cannot take the pawn, so he has to play yeah, rook d7. Go, yeah, exactly. Rook d7, rook b5, rook d5, and just force the pawn and game. And I mean, okay, he can put the rook on e6, and it's mm -hmm. over. And look at this, still not resigning. Still not resigning. Night's time, yeah. Peter, let's see what were the blunders or the beautiful combinations of this round. There, there are always blunders, there are always some nice combinations there. Nihal Sarin, the young gentleman I was talking in my previous time, well, during my previous time on air, has won yet another game, this time against Jan Nipomnici. Jan is, of course, known to be very strong in blitz, but this time uh, well, the luck was, was supporting the Indian guy. Knight to f5 was played over here. So white 
tries to create some sort of an attack after bishop c8 well maybe out of sad necessity but white goes for a sacrifice knight h6 otherwise the knight is lost on f5 so knight h6 ga6 queen h6 and here was the moment where jan actually went wrong because it turns out queen h5 was the right move trade the queens white still has some chances it's a blitz you know two bishops but this would have been winning for white after queen f8 Queen h4, however, the situation is very, very tricky because the powerful bishop on b2 and white having an idea of going king h1 and rook g1, so using the open g file, makes it even favorable for white. King g7, king to h1, bishop b7, f3. Nothing to do for black. Jan went for knight d2, trying to mess it up. Bishop f6, queen g6, f5, an important move to drag the queen away from the g-file. So after queen f5, rook g1, there is nothing happening on f3. Like say, knight f3, bishop f3 happens to be a check. If f5 wasn't played over here, if you play rook g1, black does have knight f3, attacking the rook, attacking the queen, and you cannot take it on f3. So f5 was very to the point move, queen back to g6. Now once again, if you try to move the bishop, black captures on f3 with a check, but queen f4, all of a sudden, the knight on d2 is not that comfortable. h6, bishop to c3, removing the bishop from f6, and then the knight is really getting trapped. Rook e2 was the move for Jan Nepomnici overlooking queen b8. The position was hopeless, nevertheless. And there was one more interesting game. Levona Ronian losing to Maxim Matlakov, which seemed to me a very, very promising, perhaps winning position. So I want to go back to this moment where Levon actually played the sequence of very, very strong moves. So his last move was capture on e4, he's threatening a checkmate on h7, black goes knight f6, seemingly very logical. Bishop d6, knight e4, and you would expect white to recapture the queen, you know, black, cap yeah, something like that, bishop c5, knight c5, white, well, sometimes is marginally better in these structures, but no big thing. But no, Levon captures the knight, sacrifices the queen, or rather exchanges the queen for a lot of pieces because the rook on b8 is also trapped. Queen f2, then once again a brilliant move, intermediate rook to d2. Kind of getting the same position but a little bit more comfortable. If you capture the rook immediately, then black comes with a queen e3 check, you have to play knight d2, a passive move. This way, rook d2 chasing the queen. If queen goes to e3, there would be another intermediate move played, rook e1, guarding the bishop with a tempo, and then the rook on b8 is gone. Queen b6, bishop b8, and white is completely winning, and he was winning up to this point, I believe, after e3. Well, rook to d1 was much better than the move Levon ended up playing. After f4, g3, he couldn't find anything better. Yeah, just to play g3, bishop g4, black wins in exchange. Over here, it was already unclear. And in the third, uh, well, in a time scramble, Maxim Matlakov has won it. So not that many logical games, but if some happening, then it's a pleasure to watch once again. Kramnik games, Carson sometimes wins really, really nice games, but more often than not, we have swings like that. So one side playing really beautiful chess, then misplaying it, and the other guy remains victorious. Thanks very much. Back to the studio. I'll keep preparing more examples. And we would like to analyze uh, the game played by Magnus Carlsen. He won again. Yes, Magnus has won again, and uh, thanks to Vladimir Kramnik, uh, we were not able to focus on the very interesting game, Magnus Carlsen versus Daniel Dubov. Let's not forget that Daniel Dubov was Magnus Carlsen's second last year in the World Championship match against uh, Caruana. Mm -hmm. And look at the opening. It's c4, knight f6, knight c5, c5, g3, a special move order, but how does it, where does it end? It ends in the Dubov Tarash, which Magnus has been playing during the Rapid and also in the Blitz section of the tournament himself. So very, very interesting how Magnus will treat the, the weapon of his, uh, I mean, coach would be too much, but his, his friend and his second, which probably he taught him, I don't know. 
So CD knight d4, bishop c5, and in all these games... Knight c6 was played against Magnus. Yeah, Malcolm Jan and Aronian, Aronian mm -hmm. both played knight xc6. And now Magnus goes for knight b3. So those who are interested in theory should have a close look at this game. Bishop b6, two big specialists facing each other. Castles d4, knight a4. Castles bishop g5, rook e1. And I think that something like this happened between Hikaru Nakamura and Daniel Dubov last year in, in one of these uh, FIDE Grand Prix. Or it's still this year, mm -hmm. sorry, pardon me. We are still in 2019. Rook e1. I don't recall this one. Maybe this innocent little move is a novelty. I'm not sure, not an expert in this position, but look at this, what happens after h6. White takes on b6, takes, he takes on c6. Basically a very primitive approach and he ends up being a pawn up. The point being of course that Daniel is a big expert of this position. I believe that he anticipated this and probably relied on the fact that the knight on b3 is very badly placed. If white knight would be on c3, of course, there would not be any compensation. And he wants to combine with c5 his play and have enough compensation. The only question is, how much is this compensation? And will you really be able to prove it against Magnus Carlsen in a blitz game? Finally, slowly, Magnus evocated his look from a1 to d1 to the open file. Now the knight gets back to c1 h5, the typical line in this every time Daniel Dubov and also Magnus Carlsen was using h5, h4 as a resource. It's kind of scary to let the knight, I mean the pawn to h4, but Magnus probably thought that his knight is coming closer and he will be able to control it. Nevertheless, it looks like black has a certain type of martialish mm -hmm. compensation. It's no direct compensation. Nothing Long term is, compensation. Exactly. Yes. Nothing is threatening yet, but Thanks to this powerful bishop and the somewhat vulnerable king from white, it seems like this is really serious compensation. Bishop b7, rook d3, rook e4. Looking, looking really dangerous. I mean, imagine something happens, then this king on g1 will not feel secure, so Magnus plays f3, he needs to play f3. And now something Happens. Somehow I have the feeling that's the same type of structure uh, as against Maxim. You know, he he gave the bishop uh, against the knight and then played f6 in that game, and that's the same. But that was kind uh, structure. of very easy to understand because he was blocking. Yeah, it was kind of the famous good knight versus mm -hmm. bad bishop. And here suddenly he said, we see that it's quite a good knight, but against a perfect bishop and all this uh, open diagonal and uh, Dubov I don't know because we are of course not having engines and we have no time to calculate he relied on this speculative sacrifice maybe thinking that uh, there is no way uh, Magnus can take the look on e4 because he will be mated <coughs> so the question is if black would have moved his rook then most probably white would play e2 e4 or not it's a big question but otherwise already i see some g7 g5 coming so most probably white plays e4 then black would have taken on g3 and most probably we would get the same position like if after a g3 no but here maybe there is rook f4 what do you think yeah rook f4 and queen, queen h4. h4 yes yeah still the rook is protected i don't know how much of a threat is this definitely there is a perpetual mm -hmm. threat and king g2 can be met by, for example, even mm -hmm. queen g4 using the pin and it's a perpetual. Maybe black can even just go for a straightforward okay, attack and it's a mating attack. Who knows? So maybe uh, f takes c4 was forced. Maybe f takes c4 was forced and uh, h takes g3 was a very important moment. So f takes c4 has to be taken, g takes h to check mm -hmm. and everything depends usually after such moves like gh2 you would love to hide your king on h1 but not against the b7 bishop so you have to take on h2 mm -hmm. queen h4 check this was certainly planned by daniel a big question did he miss that the rook on e1 is protected by the queen on c3 i don't know it could easily be after knight h3 because after rook takes e4 you already know that this is not enough so probably it was just a terrible blunder by by Daniel Dubov relying on his intuition that this should work, but in fact it turned out that the rook is protected, and after rook takes e4, rook g3, it's uh, basically over immediately. So a dramatic 
end to the game. Sometimes such moves like AGC win the game and sometimes they lose it. This time it was losing and a very important victory for, for Magnus. Peter, and what happened in the crucial game uh, in the ladies' open? Yeah, very interesting. Let's in the take ladies a look. Event, yes. Because Katerina has lost, yeah? Yes. So and I think that is the first game that uh, she, she lost in this event. She was incredibly lucky yesterday. Yes, in two games. Mm -hmm. I mean, for sure, she has won many games also in style. But yeah, what we have seen, two times she was lucky. And this time against Alisa Galyamova, yeah, I mean, the class remains class, yeah. We see some symmetrical Grimfeld. B3, C5. Wow, but B3 is very funny. Mm -hmm. I think Kramnik has played in this position C3. against Jan Nepomniachi mm -hmm. C3 with the point that B6 is not precise because of C4. And Kramnik beat uh, Nepomniachi in 2015 in Skopje in a very important game. And now look at this white place B3 and black place C5. So we are seeing now Kramnik versus Nepomniachi with reverse colors. <coughs> but that was a classical game and this is a blitz game, so nothing tragic has happened with, for white. It's just that black saw all her opening problems. DC9, mm -hmm. C4, CD9, D4, Rook, C8. A very, very safe position for black. But a symmetrical position, it's sometimes tricky in blitz because you don't know exactly what, how to, how to treat this and how long you should keep the symmetry. And look at this, just after a few moves, she's clearly worse because she goes knight a5. Mm -hmm. Maybe already here it was not so easy. Knight if she misplayed it before. Because white took on a5, bishop takes g2 and knight a6. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden there was this uh, intermediate move. And after bishop c6, knight c6. This is the position you should always watch out for, not to get it with black, when the black pawn is on b6 and the white knights land on c6, this usually means trouble. Queen e8, queen f3, very nice for white that she can stabilize this knight. And look c7, bishop a3, yeah, from this moment on I think it's a smooth game for, for white. King g2, small little move, rook f8 97, takes, takes. And yeah, the players mm -hmm. resulted in this end game, mm -hmm. which was a technical win, and Alisa converted it convincingly. And yes, let's give a word to Evgeny. Uh, once again, an example, this time from the women's tournament, which illustrates how tense is the game in Blitz. Well, so this short example where the evaluation was shifting back and forth, like practically after each move. And I believe I have to be quick because the next round is about to start. So rookie three, black attacks the queen and white thinks he has found a very nice intermediate move. D6 attacking the queen himself, missing queen a5. Queen a5 simply running away with the queen. The c3 knight would have been lost in this case. Black goes queen d7, overlooking knight to d5. Now if you capture on d3, white takes on f6 with a check, then the queen on d7. So knight takes, queen takes. Uh, black quickly plays knight e5, rook d1, king g7, all that I'll leave. Queen d5 back, yes, queen d2 and back to d5, knight d4 here. It turns out rook d4 would have led to a serious advantage for white simply because too many pawns, you know, check and then c5, king is safe. Instead bishop e4 played, still white is in control, black goes for what she thought was the winning move, knight e2, actually a bad move. King h1 was played in the game, it works for black after king h1, king f1 was very, very strong instead. Point being, after knight c3, same idea as uh, black went for in the game, there is a check on e5, f6 and very important, queen f5 move. So, you have to trade the queens and then d7, after knight d1, that's important. d7, the bishop controls d3, pawn controls e8, so there is no way for black to stop this pawn. What's wrong with king h1? Why white cannot do the same? Because of the back rank problem. So f6, queen e7 was played, not queen f5. Same would have happened in case of queen f5. Black trades, captures the rook. You cannot play d7 because rook e1 checkmate. So queen e7, trade over here, knight to d1, e8 knight, last move in the game, and after king f8, white resigned. I believe we are ready for the next round, so back to the studio. Let's have a look at the standings before the 17th round in the open section. 
So Magnus Carlsen is leading with 13 points and uh, Hikaru Nakamura is uh, second with 12 and a half. So three players have 11 and a half points. Maxim Matlakov, Jan Kshistov Duda and Vladimir Kramnik. And let's have a look at the standings in the ladies tournament. So Hampi Koneru uh, is sharing the first place with uh, Katerina Lagno with 10 points. And okay, we can see Elisa Galamova and Anna Muzichuk are sharing the third place with nine and a half. What a fight. Yeah, they have all the chances and also the players with nine points. If they have a great finish, they can easily uh, actually catch the leaders. Mm -hmm. So here are the pairings. Young Shishtov Duda is playing with White against Magnus Carlsen. This is the game that we will uh, watch. This is the most important game for, for this round. And Hikaru Nakamura uh, is playing with White against Anish Giri. Here are the pairings in the ladies event. Alisa Galamova will play Hampi Konero and Katerina Lagno will play Dronavali Harika. Two Indian players on the first board. Yeah, and the games have started already. We see a Sicilian between Duda and Magnus Carlsen, a Sveshnikov most probably. Mm -hmm. Will he play knight d5? No, bishop g5. He opts for the classical Sveshnikov. Yes, this is a very stable line. And I think in Blitz it's very important to have a stable position. It's a good choice by mm -hmm. Duda. So, group B8? Or? Yeah, I had a lot of, lot of games with Magnus in uh, 2008 and uh, so on in um, Linares Modelia mm -hmm. and yeah, H4, G6. So many finesses mm -hmm. here and so many different move orders. Magnus is basically always mixing his setups in order to avoid concrete targeted preparation and to, to disbalance the opponent. Mm -hmm. This has been played already in so many games. One of the main, main uh, strategic ideas is to exchange this uh, light squared bishop, so Magnus refuses. He plays bishop b7. Yeah, basically black wants to go knight e7. Black, wants to, black has to challenge mm -hmm. the knight from d5, then white will play knight c3, stabilizing the grip on the control of the d5 knight. And the question is then uh, how black will fight against it. Usually later some rook c5 ideas are also very important. And I disagree. I don't believe that there are so many games with this. Actually, I'm kind of... I used to be a very big mm -hmm. expert. I haven't been playing this with any color for the last 10 years. But this rook b8 h4 g6 bishop g7 stuff, I actually haven't really seen. Yes, I, I loved Sveshnikov myself so much, so I haven't played it for so many years as well because uh, people started to play bishop b5 against me, so you were preparing for hours and then you come completely exhausted to the game and then they play a third, third move on the third move, bishop b5. And, and also third move, knight c3. Yes. Yeah, all those mm -hmm. anti-Sveshnikovs anti became very, very popular. I remember also my games with uh, Kasparov in, in Linares 2003, 2004, 2005, I mean, we always had those anti Sveshnikov uh, battles. But probably I've played so many Blitz games in this line because this position seems very familiar to me. Because I didn't like this setup h4, g3 and bishop h3. Yeah, but still, here it's a little bit different because the black bishop was forced to b7. Usually mm -hmm. this black bishop is on e6 mm -hmm. and uh, that's a completely different story. Now we see Magnus playing a5. The b5 pawn can be taken, but then bishop takes d5, queen d5, rook takes b2 comes. So it's better you don't even consider that. a is a nice move. Bishop g5 is a nice move. Usually white often goes king f1, king g2 in these positions. The question is, yeah, and white always has to be ready to meet rook c5 by b2, b4. Because you can never allow this exchange on bishop takes d5, e d5. Uh, you always have to be ready to take with the, with the piece on d5, even if you lose the c3 pawn. The control of the light squares is much more important than king f1 played. Now let's see how it will continue. I was trying to keep my eye on what is happening in the ladies even because they will... They only have four rounds left. Only four rounds yes. left, yeah. 
Yeah, everything seems to be mm -hmm. going so fast. Yeah, I mean, I lost completely the track where we are, which round is played, and how many rounds left. Uh, so this is the 17th round. We have such a lovely image <laughs> on our screens, which reminds us about the time control, the number of the rounds. But played. I haven't even noticed it. You know, <laughs> I'm focusing on the position, and that this is round number 17. I have completely ignored. I'm wondering exactly because Magnus has played all the normal natural prophylactic mm -hmm. moves and what to do next. This is always the most unpleasant thing when you would love to have a small little move which improves your position, but everything is already where it belongs. White still has King F1 to G2, mm -hmm. this extra little move which he can play instantly and B4. Magnus goes, goes for it. He wants to get counter play. while the white king still being on f1. So it's a temporary pawn sacrifice because black means that, okay, take my pawn, it's not a big issue. You still need a move with king g2 and I will use this move to, to take back the yes, pawn. Yes, but usually this type of sacrifice leads to a draw very often, to a lot of exchanges and the position is simplified. So. Yeah, and it's uh, getting simplified. I believe the game is going to be a draw. But that's the point. I never really understand why people are not playing this line more often against Magnus, because here black has to be precise. And isn't it uh, an ideal scenario if you play against Magnus Carlsen Sveshnikov, where he has won so many games, then at least, okay, play precise, Magnus, congratulations, you made your draw, but you are safe. Another question, how to protect Rook yeah, G3, rook, rook but then the second the rook comes exactly. to the mm -hmm. I mean, takes and bishop D8, and there is no way to protect. So I'm expecting that the game should... King G2, and it will be a draw. And then a draw. I think there was a draw fair by Duda. Mm -hmm. And Magnus says no. Wow, or at least I'm guessing he said no. Okay, with the bishop on D4, it's obvious that... He is symbolically better now, but of course this is just symbolic, it's a dead draw. White will activate his bishop from h3 also to d5 and... Meanwhile, I think that Hikaru Nakamura drew, yes? He know, yeah, Magnus knows probably that Hikaru yeah, drew. He also a draw was agreed, finally. And Vladimir Kramnik is playing against Maxim Matlakov, but on your screen you have now Daniel Duba versus Yu Yang Yi. Yeah, so what is what is this about? It seems like white is the one pressing with the two bishops. From this camera angle we don't really see. And there Kramnik in action. Can we get Vladimir Kramnik closer? Because... Yes, this is uh, Vladimir Kramnik still 30 against Maxim Adlakov. We see in every game, this is also Kramnik, until he has time, he has everything under, everything under control. But once the time ticks down, believe me, it doesn't matter what the position, any position get, can get completely so out of control. Five. Knight F3. Mm -hmm. Who is playing for a win here? That's also a question. I think black can maybe force a draw mm -hmm. yeah, with chasing the rook. Knight E4. Yeah, because after rook e5 you can go knight c3 and then you are threatening knight mm -hmm. d5. But maybe knight d6 and knight b7, winning the pawn. Maybe winning the pawn. Yeah, h4 was right. If he loses the pawn he has to change as many pawns as possible. Knight c4 is even better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, anyway, we get to this position. Mm -hmm. Another question, should you change or should you not change? Of course, you don't change. Rook g4 check, king h7, rook c4. One would say now Vladimir is in his element. I mean, he is such a great technician. But uh, let's see with this time how he will manage to play this position. Wow, and white offers mm -hmm. the exchange of rook. Exchange of looks? Wow, this is somewhat surprising. But how can you win this? 
I don't know. I mean, you just keep on playing, you keep on improving your position, and you take care of your time, and then hope that something King G6. King of four, nine Knight two. comes. Mm -hmm. First, you get some seconds. You yeah, f5, e5, e4. This is looking actually very dangerous because this pawn on h6 is very nice. I I'm really surprised by the exchange. Ah, but g4. Yes. This was just probably in time to save the game or not. Almost blundered by almost knight e4 happened. Wow. Hmm. You see the tension. I mean, with. 10 seconds on the clock. Kramnik wants to centralize his pieces. Knight g4, but anyway, knight gets to f4 protecting the h5 pawn, and then mm -hmm. the king starts to go the other way around. You should always watch out for the knight sacrifice and f4 when the king mm -hmm. activates the king. Now, king h4. The knight on f5 is lovely, lovely. and king e2, king g5. Mm. Seems like it should be low. Knight d5. Yeah, the big question, should you take on h5 or not? Because you can take and then go knight d6, stopping e4. It feels quite safe, but no, Maxim goes for this, yeah. Wow, three sec two, four. Dramatic. Knight g6. Again played by one second. Mm -hmm. And now look at this. The white king and knight are a little bit stuck away and now h pawn is going. Wow. What is this? This is looking... Uh, it's a win, yeah? Yes. Mm. Incredible. Incredible. This is really incredible. So that's how you can win this? Well, you just keep on playing. Wow. Big win for Vladimir. Very, very big win. And here we have Vladislav Kovalev against uh, Stefan Pogasan. Young Russian player with black. Yeah, unfortunately we don't see fully the position. But they made draw. a draw, yes. Yeah. And Chado. No, 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 not at all. This is... Uh, no? Ah, yes, it's board number board 60. Number yeah. 60 yeah. You see, I, I'm getting tricked. I'm getting tricked. But white player only has five seconds. Who are the players here? Ah, we don't know him. Yeah? No, but I think that this is a theoretical draw, no? Well, it's a dead draw, of yes. course. So the point is that white should watch out not to lose on time, because mm -hmm. she takes it a little bit easy. You don't have a chance to play for a win, and you don't have a time, then what are you playing for? But yes, but I think that this game will end in a draw anyway, and... Yeah, but it seems like White has no intention of agreeing to draw yet. Yes, but I think that Evgeny has analyzed some games for us in depth. Let's give a word yeah, to Yeah, definitely Evgeny. it's more interesting than this more one. More entertaining, <laughs> yes. Oh, well, thanks for calling me more entertaining. In fact, the game was entertaining, I believe, Vashiela Graf against Nihal Sarin. So once again, Indian youngster, is, his play is highlighted. However, this time he has lost. As you can judge yourself, it was, well, really tense game. And this one happens to be a really, really messy position. Uh, White was to move and Maxime Vashiela Graf was the first to make a mistake. King g2 was the move. Well, similar logical move, avoiding queen h4 check. But it turns out the better move was bishop to b2, guarding c1. So stopping this c, c7 rook from entering. 
white camp, then after queen h4 you have simple king g1 and then in a couple of moves it will be you attacking rook g6 for instance is a threat. The king g2, things are getting tricky. Queen h4, now queen h2 is of course a threat. You are forced to go bishop g1 because now king g1 would run into, yeah, back here, king g1, now you actually do run into rook c1. So bishop g1, bishop is pushed back and then had black played rook g7, it would be anyone's game because black is attacking here, white would have to demonstrate how he's planning to guard the king. But a terrible mistake, rook c1 was played instead, uh, perhaps not recognizing that in fact this move, as far as it seems, attacking and everything, it doesn't create a threat. Well, white says pass for instance you take on g1 king g1 not a single threat so rook g1 was an empty move uh, rook c1 was an empty move in fact to rook c1 however white has better moves than a silly tempo loss rook g6 king h7 rook d6 white is completely winning now because he's the one who's attacking the king queen e4 rook to g6 and that's once again that amazes me the most the top players and in this case mvl with seconds on the clock identifying immediately not only that his position is winning, but according to computer, that's precisely the fastest way to checkmate the black king. So here, queen e8, rook g7, king g7, and then, I mean, I would certainly go rook e7, win the queen, and, you know, would play for another 20 moves, but not MVL, bishop d4, checkmate in two, because after queen f6, you don't even take, rook e7 is an immediate checkmate. That's how you play chess. Brilliant game by MVL. And back to the studio, I'll premiere more examples for you guys. Thank you, Evgeny. And I have just checked the results in the latest tournament. It, it seems that it has been such a bloody round. I could barely find a few draws. So we will get back uh, at those games. But let's have a look at the results. So only two draws on top boards and the rest is decisive. Yeah, and very important win for Catalina. Yeah, she is after losing. She needed a win, desperately needed a win, and Anna Muzichuk won as well. Lei Tinji won against Alexandra Kostinuk. Uh, Antonieta Stefanova won against Anastasia Bodnaruk. Elizabeth Patz won uh, against Jean Saya Abdumalik. Well, so many decisive games. So. Okay, here are the results from the 17th round in the Open Tournament. Yeah, and here we see that in the, on the first four boards there have been three draws. Mm -hmm. And this means how important it was for Vladimir Kramnik to win this night and game. He makes a huge step forward and I think we are getting closer and closer to, to the game Kramnik versus Carson. The dream pairing. And Jan Nepomnyshe lost a third game in a row, it was a draw, what do you think? Yeah, yes. we don't know, because what I have seen, it looked like a drawish position, so actually... Yes, so I we need to check this result. Yeah, mm -hmm. and a very important win for Firuza, of course, on board five, against no other than Vladislav Artemiev, also making very huge step forward. And Grishchuk on board eight has won against Fedoseyev with black. A very important win for Alexander, I would like. Alexander also to climb higher and higher because mm -hmm. I really would like to see one of his games on stage. So Magnus Carlsen maintains his lead. Really, yeah? I yes, mean, I, you are better at this. Yes, half a point. <laughs> I'm keeping track of the rounds. Uh, so let's have a look at the opening in this game. Yeah, let's take a look at Grishchuk in action. I really hope that he will be able to, to join the elite of the tournament because he has been a little bit struggling and one would have expected before the tournament that Alexander will be in fight for the medals. It's a kind of anti-Grunfeld by Vladimir Fedoseyev. Bishop e to c5 and d takes c5. Usually in this position d4 d5 has been exclusively played but uh, this year I think it was Shakri Amamedyarov who started to to experiment with d takes c5, which leads to completely different structures. Knight a6, castles, knight takes c5, knight c3, b6, the typical way of developing. It's a double fianchetto. 
b4, knight c4 takes takes bishop b2 d5. I think at this point we can certainly say that black has fully equalized. Mm -hmm. Uh, what is many times the point that if black equalizes, it's sometimes psychologically easier with black because you are still kind of uh, playing in equalizing mode and white is the one who wants to create something. And look at this, what Fedoseyev does to his position. Rook C1, Rook C8, he feels the need that if he wants to fight for something and definitely he also wants to fight for medals or wanted to fight for medals before this loss, he goes for F3, weakening his structure but the idea, of course, is that after knight d6, he wants to go c5, leading to very dynamic position. But if you go for dynamics against Sasha, I mean, uh, Sasha Grischuk is just extremely good in, in complications, no matter how little time he has. Queen b6, a lovely square for the queen, putting pressure on the c5 rook. Bishop a3, was this the plan of Fedosev? I'm a little bit perplexed because I don't see the benefit of this. But I do feel that uh, this e3 pawn will be a very big weakness. And look at this knight b3, knight f5, queen c1, bishop h6, back immediately targets the pawn on e3. White relies on his grip on the c5 square, but how long this c5 square can guarantee you safety? f4, d4. Alexander doesn't ask twice, he just breaks the structure immediately. The bishop f4. White has to sacrifice the exchange, this is in the spirit, but where does this spirit lead to? Rook f8, black gets contraplay against the white king. White actually has very nice positional compensation. If the white bishop would be somewhere maybe on c3, controlling white or squares, it would be a different story. But like this, all of a sudden, black goes for a, wow, g4, queen h4, yeah. and, and checkmate is coming. This was a dream dream game for, for Sasha. He can get confidence and I hope that he will continue his his march forward. Yeah, a very fine win for Alexander Grishuk and it seems that Evgeny has some details for us about uh, the game played by Jan Nepomnyshi. Uh, yeah, so Jan Nepomnyshi loses again, this time against Alexei Sarana. And it feels like Jan was playing this particular position for a win. If you remember the opposite colored bishop's endgame, he has saved against Anton Korobov. So Jan was three pawns down, he managed to save. So this time the material is equal and perhaps he thought he should play for a win. Bishop c4 and then the move I don't really like, king f2, was still okay. Apparently he was trying to enter from this side, right? In fact, after bishop c4, you can do whatever you like. You just put the king on d4, if the bishop f1, you don't actually need the pawn. I mean, if you're satisfied with the draw, and you keep the bishop on a3 and b4, and black can't do anything. So king f2, king to c6, g3. And g3 apparently seems to be already a huge mistake. Because after bishop e6, the king runs to d5 and c4, and then black pushes the b pawn, and he has that's black now who has two passed pawns. King e3, king d5, king to c4, and this time all Jan's trickiness didn't save him. King to c5, g4 all of a sudden, breaking through, but creating yet another passed pawn for black. King to c6, back to c6, and then, you know, two pawns on different angles. f5, bishop d7, perhaps still fine, now that I'm thinking, yeah, you, he could go king f4, f6, bishop e6, king d4, b4, bishop g3, b3. And it turned out that this was the position, well, perhaps he was flagged, now that I'm thinking. I thought he has lost, but maybe he has lost on time. Uh, well, anyway, seems like it was impossible to lose and somehow Yanni Pumshi lost. Uh, back to the studio. Let's see if the guys in the studio have something to add to this. Yes, yeah, certainly I have. Very nice to see Yevgeny also confused because, <laughs> I mean, I was also shocked when seeing this final position that uh, how can actually White lose exactly in this moment because his move King C3 is the most natural move and uh, to me it actually looks like a draw. So I'm not sure if uh, we, we got this result right or not, 
we will later find find it out. But clearly, yeah, Nepo is now in, in a disappointing run. He started the day very well. He was on the top, and he lost two games in a row, and maybe this one because I still cannot believe that he lost this. Yes, as you can hear, there is there is a lot of uh, noise in the background. But please don't forget that the tournament is organized uh, in the Luzhniki Stadium, so it really feels like we are in the stadium with uh, 80,000 fans standing. So a lot of events are going on uh, in the VIP area. So kids are having tournaments organized for them. There are sim simultaneous exhibitions. So sometimes we are struggling, but this is a real chess feast. Yeah, it shows also everybody's excited. I mean, in the playing hall, outside of the playing hall, the tension is just way too high for everyone to handle. And uh, we, are, we are still having four more runs in the men section, so if somebody starts a good finish, he can still catch a medal, I believe. So here are the standings after the 17th round in the Open tournament. Magnus Carlsen is still in the lead with 13 points and a half. Hikaru Nakamura is still second with 13 points. And Vladimir Kramnik is third with 12 and a half. So 12 points for three players. Maxim Vashiragrav, uh, Ali Reza Firuja and Jan Kshishtov Dudo. And finally, Alexander Grishchuk with one and a half, 11 and a half mm -hmm. points, uh, sharing seventh, and he's still in contention for the medal, believe me. And I think that the next round will feature uh, Vladimir Kramnik against Magnus Carlsen. I will have to check the bearings. Mm -hmm. And here are the standings after the... 14th round in the ladies event. Katerina Lagno is in the lead now, 11 points. Hampi Koneri is sharing the second place with Anna Muzichuk with 10 and a half. And a lot of players with 10 points. Pats Elizabeth, Lei Tinji, Anastasia Budnaruk and Alisa Galamova. Yeah, also the woman standing it looks very, very dramatic. I mean, everything to play for. And, uh, nobody is safe. Basically, your only chance is to keep on winning. Yes, and let's remind our viewers uh, that the prizes are very high. So, sixty thousand dollars for the first prize in the open tournament, and forty thousand dollars for the first prize in the ladies' event. And there is an overall one million uh, dollars uh, prize fund. So, yeah, a lot of to play for. Vladimir already sitting and getting ready to his game against Magnus Carlsen. I mean, Carlsen versus Kramnik, this is always a very, very big matchup. They haven't been playing lately, apparently, since uh, Kramnik retired a year ago after Waikanze. But I also don't recall them playing that much in, in the last. A few years before mm -hmm. Vladimir's retirement. And in the ladies' event, Katerina Lagno will play Daria Charichkina, and Muzichuk Anna will face Elizabeth Petz on the first two boards. And there we see Alexander Grischuk facing Duda, and mm -hmm. uh, Grischuk is white. I'm actually very, very interested of this game. Because if Alexander wins this, then he is in perfect, perfect situation before the last three rounds. So two minutes till the start of the 18th round. As usual, Magnus is still not at not at the board. What do you think? How does Vladimir feel? I, I think that he must be really pleased. Yeah, I mean, uh, he came back, he had a hard day yesterday, but it kind of also showed that uh, after getting the rhythm, mm -hmm. he has won so many games and now he's playing on board one. It should be something special, no? Yes, it is something special, but Vladimir is very calm. 
Uh, so he, I think he enjoys playing this tournament. But actually there was one question that I wanted to ask you because you enjoy uh, to analyze his game so much. So I just don't know how you managed to play against him. So you have so much, uh, you admire him as a player. So wasn't it difficult for you to play against him? Yeah, playing against Vladimir, it's always difficult. But the point was that exactly when I was like 15 years old in 95 and was coming close closer and closer to the elite. Vladimir was already sharing number one spot with Kasparov in the world rankings in 95. And uh, I always felt like if I play against Kramnik, I have to not only play 100%, I have to play 200% in order to be able to compete with him. And uh, somehow, probably this uh, motivation and this respect that I had for him always forced the best out of me. And uh, Vladimir never had it easy against me. Actually, strangely enough, exactly after the World Championship match, once he saved it and the, our final ended 7-7, after that he started dominating me uh, in, in games and I lost many, many games after that. But right before the, I mean, till 2004, I haven't lost a single classical game to, to Vladimir. So it probably brings the best out of Magnus. As well. Yeah, yes. definitely. I mean, they had so many great games, great fights, but not in the last few years. The Vikanze game was also spectacular, very, very fun, big fight, and the clock is started. So let's see, what do we see? The London system, yeah, the London system. Also a very interesting mm -hmm. story, because I think in 2015, Kramnik was the one who started to, to play the London system, mm -hmm. and then Magnus uh, started using it himself. And then later it turned out that before the World Rapid Blitz Championship in Berlin, they had a session together. They blitz for a couple of days, and that's where Magnus really started to appreciate the London system and started to use himself. And now, four years later, they are facing each other, and the London system is played now by Magnus against Vladimir. This is exactly the line that you, mm -hmm. you told already, yes. no? that Levon has been mm -hmm. playing it against uh, Magnus. But I think Magnus played A4. In London. I, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know exactly. It's also typical and He's, logical yes. to play the London system in London. Yes. But you see how good the London system is in Rapid and Bridge that Magnus thinks that even in Moscow this is the right place for the London system. And Vladimir is thinking, because this is a very important moment, should you just play a6 or should mm -hmm. you play a5? By a5 you would weaken the b5 square, Yes. like this you give away some other squares, but basically probably he believes that by having the bishop out on f5, this gives him enough security to... Yes, in one of the games Levon played queen a7, uh, but then uh, queen d8 was played later, so queen d8 seems like a more natural square. Exactly. The only uh, difficulty by playing queen b6 to d8 is that the queen came from d8 to b6. So you feel like if you go back, then why did you play queen b6? But in the meanwhile, so many things have changed that this doesn't really mean anything to the position. And this position allows white to maneuver a lot. Yeah, maneuver a lot, where actually Kramnik is also an expert. So let's see, expert contra expert, what will happen here? Bishop g6 is played. It's always the, my big question about this position, that is this position really better for white, or Magnus keeps on winning it just because he's Magnus? Mm -hmm. But compared to the previous games that we were analyzing, uh, Vladimir managed to put his knight on e4 quite early. So this is a big difference. No, of course, compared to all those uh, structures that we have seen mm -hmm. from the Karo Khan, there White has a much better version. Yeah. And a very nice maneuver, knight d6. Now, yes. black probably tries to play knight c4, because in that case he would put pressure on the a5 pawn, and then the knight from b3 would not be able to move. Yeah, so Magnus decides to... So there is a clear pattern in Magnus' games. He goes uh, very often for the positions knight ver versus bishop. Yeah, he goes many times. I mean, if it's, if it's good for yes. him. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm very happy that uh, here he is confronted by Kramnik. And uh, we see now 
master versus master in this type of structure. Yeah, knight is heading to d3. Mm -hmm. And then the question is, yeah, what to do with the a pawn? So a5 is pushed, knight d3, and now white is white has stabilized. And the question is, black's only chance is to play a4, a3 in order to break this uh, structure. Otherwise, white will start torturing this position. And rook d2 protecting the knight, so probably white wants to queen be a4, yes. ready, mm -hmm. exactly, to play queen a4 now. Ah no, Magnus says, I don't, don't care what he a4. says that I want to play king g2, rook h1, and mate you. Exactly, I'm gonna mate you while you are trying to push a4, a3. And look at this, how quickly the players are playing, yeah? I mean, they both have so much time on the clock. But to do bishop f8, no, he still has some time to play bishop f8 and bishop g7. Yeah, it seems like Magnus has taken control. It seems like Magnus has taken control. Because if something happens on the king side, how to, how to protect? How to protect? Now it's time to get nervous. Even, you mm. see, Vladimir is moving on his chair. It's, uh, so far everything has been more or less technical, but now 95, rook h1. How are you going to protect? Is there any protection at all? Bishop g7 has mm -hmm. to be played. Knight e5, black can never take on e5 because then on h8 uh, there will not be any defense. But then only kind of queen b7 or queen e8. Both defensive moves are not something you really want to play, but queen e8 is the natural one. After all, if black manages to protect and he gets e3 and he gets his counterplay. And if someone would have played the London system against Vladimir, let's say, like 15 years ago, he would say, like, what is this? Exactly. <laughs> and how far the theory has advanced now. There are DVDs uh, dedicated to this opening, books are written, so uh, this is a, a very interesting trend in yeah. the modern theory. But to be, honest, to be honest, it still kind of surprises me and shocks me that there is so much uh, books and everything written about the London system, because to my eye it really feels like more of a rapid blitz weapon, mm. because I don't really feel the danger of it. But uh, in this blitz and rapid, we see that it's so much easier to play with white yeah, if you have a concrete uh, setup in mind. And basically, Vladimir was not able to protect his f f6 pawn, so he breaks first with a3. Now he pushes f5. He had to weaken his structure. Mm. Queen g5, such a fine move. Very, very fine and looking very bad for, for Vladimir. Now he is into pins, so rook h1 is coming. Rook h7 is a step followed by knight e5. It seems like Magnus is going to crash through here. How to defend? And the clock is ticking down. Okay, rook h7 will be played. And I don't think there is any force which can stop Magnus Carlsen. Even queen f6 check is hanging in the air. Yeah. <laughs> oh la la. No, this is just but designable. I think knight e5 is a deadly threat. Even knight h6 now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then queen g6. It's time to design. And yeah. And Vladimir Kramnik resigns. Yeah, very, very impressive by Magnus, yeah? I mean, the critical moment was when he eliminated the knight with his bishop and mm -hmm. then managed to transfer his knight to this. Then he got the stability and these uh, double pawns turned out to so be decisive as a poker player i would worry because that's a clear pattern <laughs> in his game so he <laughs> yeah don't let your pawns to be double there on the g file and and Grischuk with white seems to be in total control wow knight d7 again duda playing with once you see that's exactly what i was telling about last year duda is driving his opponents crazy Peter, now, you, you're scaring me. <laughs> but you can play ED, exactly. And yes. now he's, Grischuk is winning. Grischuk is winning mm -hmm. a piece and winning the game. So, Alexandre Grischuk won a very important game. And if I will get to the pairings one day. I told you that if, if Alexander gets, uh, gets the, the steam and he starts to, to march forward, who will stop him? 
and hang on here Maxim is lost against Hikar right I mean it, it's a piece done yes because we couldn't check the pairing so Maxim Vashelegraf is playing against Hikaru Nakamura another incredible mm -hmm. pairing I mean okay every round is just incredible there are no hopes here but what opening was this and Hikaru has 33 ah it was the same like in the rapid game mm -hmm. I mean, okay, he probably has 30, more than 30 seconds. He played H3 in the night of? Again, yeah, just mm -hmm. like in the Rapid, and also he played it against Fiduzia. Yeah, the bishop comfortably blocks the F4 pawn. But he still needs to be careful a little bit. No, I think the only problem is that it's so completely winning mm -hmm. that you you are kind of automatically relaxed in this position that whatever I do I will win and unless you have only one two seconds on the clock you should and the very important win for Hikar it would be it would be very important win yeah mm -hmm. but still what he has done is not that impressive yeah I mean uh, Okay, he saved himself this piece down position against Kramnik, but uh, there he had at least two pawns, but was also lost. Yeah, Maxim almost put it on e6, then mm. Bishop h3 would have been a fin would have ended the game immediately. King g4, and then... G check, kicking mm. the king back. And King D4. Yeah, finally Hikaru is back on track. King gets to E5. And Rook F4. No, he can take the yeah, pawn with can check, take yes, the pawn, of course. Yeah. yeah, but okay. And Maxim resigns. It didn't matter anymore. Yeah, very important win for Hikaru, and Hikaru is very impressive. Yeah, mm -hmm. very very impressive. So Magnus is leading with 14 and a half and Hikaru... And Koste, Alexander in action. Mm -hmm. Hang on, be careful, time is ticking down. Tanzonji almost mm -hmm. lost on time because something was falling. White still has this A pawn which is very, very important. Thanks to this, she hopes to save the game. But she cannot push it because then Bishop sees the check would win the... Eh, Not this okay. Is problem. This is the problem. Yeah, now she has to go a5. Mm -hmm. King h2. a6, g3. But yeah, thanks to the bishops, black should be winning the race. King g1. Look at it. The bishops yeah. control all the this squares. Bishop c6 is yeah. very important mm -hmm. tempo now. Bishop b5 check is a threat. King e2, bishop b5 check. King f3 takes. Ah, look, is on f8. Ah, mm. then now it's over, yeah. Now there are no more chances than king f1 and. Ah, what? King g1? Okay, black can play that move anytime. And by now the players have more than 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. yeah, this is the problem in this position that you cannot really play for time. But Rook H6 now? Or... Yeah, she prefers Bishop H2, King mm -hmm. H1. But even then there is still King F2. Yes. Strangely enough, it's, it's not ending yet. King F2 now. She has to go back. Yeah, she has to go back with the king, king to g1. King g3, maybe now? Yeah, I mean, anyway, mm -hmm. she will go back to g1 with of the course. king. And then move the bishop from f1 away again. Actually, it's uh, shocking that it's not that trivial. Yeah, that's the, that's the shock. And five seconds.
Incredible. Actually, the bishop cannot move from f1. Mm -hmm. The bishop cannot move from f1. What has black done? Maybe it's a draw? I mean, if this is a draw... No, 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 you cannot, you time. cannot, you have to, yes, you have to replace your ah, so pieces. Yes. Move, so, mm -hmm. but this is... But this is a draw still. Mm -hmm. so it's the, a draw, yeah? Yeah. Alexandra stopped her clock because she she would have called an arbiter and, uh, and this would be because... Happened? Well, I think uh, either it's a warning but this or the two minutes would be uh, added to her clock because it is considered to be. But actually, an maybe this move. would have been not so bad for Tanzonji because if suddenly Alexandra has more time, she can also think mm -hmm. more about the position. And Evgeny is ready for us with more tactical shots. Yeah, sound check, guys. Pardon, I was muted. Uh, yeah, still trying to imagine my feelings. What would have happened if I don't win a game like that? Yeah, Bishop F1 apparently in the game that we've just watched was was terrible. Uh, right, I want to highlight a win by Aliriza Feruja, or rather a loss by Anish Giri, because Anish was the one to create the the mess in this position. So that was the position, I believe. Uh, well, roughly balanced, believe it or not, and bishop b5 sacrifice actually is an interesting try. So white is getting two pawns, you know, some, some threats there, knight to c7. Interestingly, that's played correctly till some point, rook a7, f3, bishop d7, rook to c1, here, king f8, b5. So, well, a weird looking setup here, rook is not moving, you know, and then the next move, had to be 98, after which the game is still really, really unclear. 9g8 should have lost for black. So we are getting there, knight d5, knight f7, and Anish has missed rook c7. Not such a terribly tough move to play. Rook to c7, trade, of course, you take with the pawn, and after, yeah, I mean, black can't really stop the a pawn, a7, very next move. Yeah. If, I was, it was quite an easy move if you consider this, you immediately see this is winning. Instead, he has taken on b5 and it turns out like all of his pawns falling all of a sudden. Rook c8, rook to c5, bishop a6, d7, rook b7 resigns. So that's somewhat unexpected. Anish, after playing, well, a part of the game, playing very, very nicely, then losing this one. And there was one really, really funny game played by... Yu Yang Gi against Maxim Matlakov. And while well, it's interesting from the start, I want you guys to look at uh, to look at this position. No, this position. Because when I've seen it first, I thought, okay, we are back to romantic era. It must have been King's Gambit. But no, it wasn't. It was four knights, bishop b5, knight d4, and this well forgotten line, knight e5, queen e7, f4. Uh, which, if you don't know exactly how to play with black, you might end up in trouble. And this seems to be the case with Maxim Matlakov. So we've got there, well, I believe might be a theoretical position. Here, queen e7, if I remember correctly, is the actual move. King d8, shouldn't be too bad. And some around this point, it felt that white is getting closer and closer to the king. King on d8, the other rook is coming precisely as we used to see in the king's gambit. So black lacks development and therefore is not, uh, well, is not able to keep up with white threats. Rook e8, rook to e1, black has to surrender the queen for two rooks. Now white misses a chance to win immediately. Knight to d5, threatening queen f6 check threatening queen c3, double attacking on the rook and c7 pawn, just too many threats. In case of bishop e6, for instance, white goes a check on, check on f6. If you remain on eighth rank, you're losing the rook, so king d7, check, here, check, you know, take on b7, take the rook, win the game. Somewhere around this point, or a couple of, couple of moves later, it felt like the position became unclear all of a sudden because black 
establish some sort of coordination. The king is no longer that bad. But yeah, but, and it is very common in Blitz. Everything was decided over here. Bishop g2, check on b2. First blunder, so bishop g2 apparently is the blunder. Black still could have continued. Perhaps white is better, but it's not that dramatic. Bishop g2 blundering a one double attack. And then after king a7, white says, no, I don't want your bishop. Queen d4, second double attack, winning the whole rook. So, dramatic game for Maxim Matlakov. He almost escaped the danger, but still lost. But the opening line is what makes it very, very interesting. I believe we have an interview right now, and then we'll be back to the studio. We're joined today by Dr. Marape Marape, Chairman of the FIDE Medical Commission. Thank you very much for finding the time to join us. Um, since you, you're in charge of doping checks here at this tournament, since when has FIDE introduced this, and why is this so important? Um, FIDE has had uh, an anti-doping program for a few years now. Um, and uh, it's a very important process because uh, it's a requirement of the World Anti-Doping Agency that all major sports should actually uh, do uh, doping controls. Uh, we are doing this mainly to make sure that um, we keep chess clean and free of any drugs and any doping and any cheating that may happen as a result of unfair advantage. And FIDE as a, an organization is fully committed uh, to keeping um, uh, chess clean and to um, drug-free sports. Yesterday we saw Magnus Carlsen being uh, slightly annoyed when uh, you approached him after the day had finished and asked him about uh, doping control. Uh, how, what do you make of his reaction? You know what, it's, uh, it's actually a normal reaction. We are used to this. Uh, no player actually wants to um, to you know, be distracted and to sort of go through a process of doping control. So for us, it's actually uh, completely normal. It's to be expected of any player. After, after playing many games in a day, players normally want to go home and rest um, and prepare for the following day. But unfortunately, it's a process that every uh, player has to, go, has to expect to go through at some point. Do the players know in advance when this is going to happen or do you just surprise them? No, it actually has to be a surprise. We don't warn them in advance because um, it is actually the policy of uh, anti-doping that you do not give them prior warning. So it's just a surprise after a game, you just tell them, excuse me, uh, I'm sorry, introduce yourself and say that, let's go. But you know, uh, the good thing about Carlson and other players is that uh, once uh, they get to us, they understand that it's a requirement, and even Magnus Carlsen, I was very happy with his cooperation. Of course, he was a little bit annoyed when, when we first approached him because, you know, he, he, you know, like every other player, he was hoping not to get chosen. But, uh, you know, we chose him because he won the rapid tournament. We also, we also uh, chose the, the, the women's rapid champion. Anybody who would have won would actually have gone through Toby. We also did random... Uh, random uh, um, you know, testing as well. So, but um, the reaction was completely normal. Could you take us a bit through the process itself? I mean, Magnus Carlsen and you were upstairs at, at the special room for over an hour, maybe even close to two hours. As, as much as you can tell us, what, what does the process consist of? Actually, Carlsen's doping uh, control yesterday took uh, maybe, it actually took less than an hour. The doping process, then the, the doping control process itself for Magnus actually took maybe 15 minutes. The rest of the time was taken by the fact that when he arrived there, uh, as other players, you have to be ready to produce a urine sample. But he wasn't ready. He felt like he needed a bit of time. So we gave him time to, to settle down and, um, and, and when he was, and he felt like he was ready to give a sample, he did. And um, it took a short time. So the, the really how the process works is that when you, once you arrive at the doping control station, we introduce ourselves, myself, and also the purpose of why we called you. And then there's a form that we have to fill where we, we complete your, your details, um, your identification, and the sports you are playing, and um, you know, including your telephone numbers and emails. And then after that, we give you a, a, you have to give a urine sample. 
you are accompanied by a dumping control officer to give a urine sample. It has to be at least 90 milliliters of urine. Um, you know, for some players, sometimes they don't, they are not able to give that sample. Uh, so that's what can actually delay. But for Magnus Carlsen and many of the players here, it actually, um, when he gave the sample, it was actually adequate. And after you give a sample, <coughs> there is a process of transferring the sample into the into the doping control bottles, and then we sell them. We explain everything to the player. And then it's actually quite a fast process at the end of the day. For Carlson, it took less than 15 minutes actually to, to go through the whole. And he was very happy because in the past he has had to give, he said, up to six samples, and it has, he has taken up to um, an hour, I mean, three hours to do it. That's what him and his father were saying. But they were happy that yesterday uh, they were able to just give one sample. Because, you know, after we take the urine sample, we have to test what is called its specific gravity. And if it is actually below a certain threshold, then we have to give another sample. Because if the urine is too dilute, then we are not going to be able to detect any drugs, the drugs to a, to a, to a definite degree, if they actually exist. And could you just explain, like, how could drugs help a chess player play, play better? How does okay. uh, that many people... Yeah, just to about? start off to say that chess is generally considered a low-risk spot for doping. But however, there are drugs um, that are really what are called stimulant drugs. Those are the ones that we are most interested in, you know, stimulant drugs including amphetamines and, and others that actually can give a player some performance advantage in terms of the ability to, to stay alert and to be able to concentrate for longer period of times because you know in chess you have to sit down and study chess and also play for long periods of time you need to be able to concentrate for long periods of time if you take drugs like that which are stimulants uh, then you actually may be able to focus stay focused and more uh, stimulated and alert for longer periods of time so that's how we are mainly looking for so FIDE has introduced this process five years ago so far how many times have you caught Speaking about higher, yeah. uh, I, I assume this is done only on high-profile events, or do you do it? Yeah, yeah, no. right. um, yes, we mainly target the high-profile events where high-level performance is actually important and where there is a lot of money to be won as well. Uh, like uh, events such as world championships, uh, such as this this one, and um, so those are the ones that we normally target, where it's very critical for athletes to perform to a very high level. But since we introduced the anti-doping, the doping control five years ago, we haven't really had any adverse um, samples. Uh, we haven't caught any player. But it, that doesn't, you know, doping control is important because it also serves as a deterrent. If a player knows that there is going to be doping control, then they are discouraged from taking drugs, you see. So it acts as a way to detect, but also it acts as a way to prevent. So it actually is a way uh, for us to keep chess clean. And that's what the president of FIDE uh, is committed to, and that's what we all at FIDE are committed to. Thank yes. you very much for your time. Yes. to the official uh, broadcast of the King Salman World Chess Blitz Championship. Uh, Peter, we uh, just saw a game between Alexander Kustinyuk and uh, Tang jong -hi. It was a dramatic end to this game. I think that you were surprised and actually I told you that you were lucky that you were not married to a chess player because this would be your daily life, yes? Yeah, well, actually, I would even not call it dramatic, more tragic. I mean, really, like Yevgen, you also said, how would I feel or how would he feel in the shoes if uh, he would have not uh, won this game? And uh, what was really incredible, however, that we saw the live footage that just after the game finished, the Lighting GA came to Tan Zonji and they managed to smile about this. For me, this was really shocking because I just cannot imagine in the men's event that this could happen, that after such a tragic game, not winning this, then your uh, fellow countryman comes to you and you can cheer yourself up so quickly. Yes, and I know that Alexandra's husband, uh, Pavel, Kus Pavel Trigubov, <laughs> 
so yeah, I'm mixing everything now. He supports her and he plays in the tournament himself. Meanwhile, in the unofficial couples competition, Alexander Grishuk and uh, Ekaterina Lagno are leading, so they're doing well. So here are the standings in the open tournament. Magnus Carlsen is still leading with 14 and a half points. Hikaru Nakamura is still second with 14. And we can see that Aliri Zafiruja has made his way to the top and he's third with 13 points. Yeah, actually we should also highlight that yeah, Magnus keeps on winning game after game, but I think he, must, he really must be frustrated that Hikaru keeps uh, mm -hmm. space with him. And here are the standings in the ladies' event. Katerina Lagno is leading with 12 points. Anna Muzichuk is second now with 11 and a half points because it seems that uh, Anastasia Budnaruk won her game against Hampi Conero. So she's... Uh, I don't know, I have to check <laughs> the standings online. She's... Yeah, it's also a very, yes. very close mm -hmm. race, yeah? And here we already see Firuza facing Magnus Carlsen. Firuza this time with the white pieces. I remember last year he had the black pieces against Magnus and he had a very bad opening and had no chance to fight. Mm -hmm. There are three rounds left in the open tournament and only two rounds left in the ladies event. So we will uh, watch the ladies event closely during the next round and we will try to update the results as soon as possible. Yeah, the handshake and the game is on. We see E4, E5. So no more Sicilians. No more Sicilians. Respect for the young guys, yeah? By Magnus. And Magnus goes for the Steinitz. So with uh, probably with Bishop D7, G6. The line also Hikado used in the rapid section and he won a very important game against Sergei Zhigalko. H3. Mm -hmm. Yes, you remember we were discussing uh, this line uh, starting with Bishop G5, F6 and Bishop B3. Exactly, yeah. So Council is looking one. Very, very solid position for both sides. Rook e8. I mean, if the white knight could somehow jump to g3, everything would be perfectly fine and very nice for mm -hmm. white. But this is, this is still far away. Usually, black somehow always makes sure that white knight will not reach to g3. But queen e7, is this a move that stops this knight f1 knight g3 and not really? Yeah, Magnus goes for queen f8. This is a maneuver which my father-in-law, Arshak Petrosyan, uh, used to play a lot against me in, in Blitz. And I was kind of laughing, what is this, uh, Arshak, what is this? But uh, he said that, yeah, it's a very tricky system. It's an old classical idea to place the queen on f8 and mm -hmm. try to play bishop h6. And then you free the d8 square for, for the rook. And you kind of provoking white to go d4, d5, and you see a completely different type of structure. Yes. G5. Those are the King's Indian structure, but I think very often uh, those are played uh, with the bishop on a4, when you can exchange the bishop on d7 and then... Uh, exactly. And now knight g5 is a lovely, lovely little move, and Magnus is very unhappy. He's very unhappy mm -hmm. because his bishop a6 plan simply backfired. White wants to go on f2, f4 maybe. It's very, very risky, and also Magnus doesn't really have much of an experience in this type of position. I don't, I don't know, I can't really recall any game by him. And Magnus in trouble. How did you play in your Blitz games against Tarshak? Well, Petrosan? it was it was not exactly from this uh, move order, but uh, I mean, basically, it was more like uh, when I play with D3, and then later okay. I anyway push D4, mm -hmm. so we got the same position more or less. But this is a more dangerous setup then. Yeah, definitely. And Magnus is very, very unhappy. Knight d8. He has to. He has to bring his knight to e6 to exchange this knight from g5. Bishop b3. Exactly. Putting pressure on the diagonal. Magnus very, very unhappy. So question: Can he go knight e6? 
can he go 96? Because so many things are hanging in the air. Meanwhile, on the second board, Grischuk Nakamura again finished in a draw. That's why Magnus looked up. Mm -hmm. He wanted to know what happened there. And H4. So, he, well, for the moment, he still has half a point margin if he draws. Yeah, but he's in danger. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's very far away from doing this game. With H3, H4, white has cemented the knight on G5. Black has to retreat to G7 because you can't tolerate this knight on G5 for long. Magnus has to be ready to drive it away sooner or later, but his position is looking very, very dangerous. And Filosa goes for H5. Yes. He goes for H5. Yes, and please don't forget that Firuja, Lirisa Firuja won uh, the silver medal in the rapid event already. Yeah. Yeah, it's a stunning performance. Now, Bishop H6 back. Magnus is very, very smart. Immediately targeting the knight on G5. So, but if you go Queen D2, yeah, you cannot go knight G4. Or, yeah, Queen C1, knight G4. Mm -hmm. And now all this knight takes e6, bishop takes e6, bang, bang, bang. Where does it lead? I mean, very, very tough for the players to understand. 110. So finally, Magnus has speeded up and managed to get some kind of a comfortable time advantage. This is very, very important psychologically. And I feel like Magnus has a little bit calmed down. He was very unhappy three, four moves ago. And we see this yeah. line, knight takes e6. And f6 had to be played because bishop a6, queen f2 check. Wow, what a trick by Magnus. That was it all about. That was it all about. Because otherwise mm -hmm. f6 is a terrible strategical move, but here concretely it works. And he controls the f4 square, which is even more important now. Exactly. Look at f1. And now all of a sudden, Firuza became very nervous because he feels like his momentum has passed. Yeah, I thought that Magnus wanted to play uh, bishop f4. Yeah, but he also wants here now queen g5, queen mm -hmm. h4. I mean, the dark squares are... Yeah, queen d2 now. Clearly, feels a regrets putting the queen on c1 instead of on d2. It could have been so different than the pawn on f2 would have not been hanging. Yeah, now he's down to 33 seconds. He basically has already no time to think at any of the critical moments. He has to keep on So what fast. do we have? Queen g5, uh, Magnus takes on d4 first. He takes first on mm -hmm. d4. Okay, something also like king g7 would be very mm -hmm. natural and rook f8. Yes, there are three candidate moves, I think. Queen g5, rook f8 and king g7. Exactly. King g7 played. Rook f3 most probably will be played as well. Exactly, I mean, you need to bring the other rook and you have to cement, rook f8, rook af1. This is now easy and obvious. Magnus wants to go bishop b5 or bishop c6? No, he finally takes on f3. Rook f8. Rook f8, yeah. So Magnus wants to make sure that he's totally safe and wants to press in the end game with the two bishops. Queen c3, a clever move if it works. Does this work? It's a provocation which uh, will cost Magnus quite some time because mm -hmm. you feel like maybe you can take on f3 and then queen g5 or something, but white is in time to protect with king f3. Maybe you have time to play bishop c8, c6. Yeah, finally just a small little of c6. You had to protect the pawn. But so little time for both players. Yes, knight f1. Protecting the easily pawn. Have to have a look at the latest results. So Anna Muzichuk won against Anastasia Bodnaruk. Well, so Anna is on fire, yeah, mm -hmm. putting the pressure on Katya. But what is happening here? Magnus is down to 12 seconds, but a stable position. Mm -hmm. 12 seconds, but a stable position. Queen c4, stable, but watch out. Checkmate is threatening on g8. Yeah, Queen f6. A nice stabilizer. D, D is forced. Queen B4 check. Well, pawn on B7 is falling. Pawn on B7 is falling. C5 by Magnus. Hmm. Wow. Because he has bishop B5. Queen C8. Will we see a... 
Yeah, and C5 pawn is taken, Magnus. Magnus is getting very nervous. Yeah, and he was very angry by this. Also, the pawn on G6 is wrong, so he has to go for this opposite. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of Nyapomniachi Filuzia's endgame. So, white is two pawns up, but there is no. I mean, there is only one past pawn. So, this will help Magnus to save the game. But now, okay, king f3, king g4. Yeah, now the white king gets to f5. Magnus is very unhappy because he wanted to meet king f3 with king e7. Almost lost on time. He has to now just sit and wait. And now, yeah, but yeah, exactly. Now b pawn is going. d5, bishop d8. Magnus might be Zugzwang. But even this king... Oh, this was... Oh, crazy. The pawn on e4 still not jadoubed. Mm -hmm. e4 and bishop f4. Bishop f4, Magnus or bishop c3. King b6, what is this? e6, king c6. Yes, he needs to bring his wow. king to d8. Wow. Magnus holds. Is it holding? It's another question, yeah, because it's wow, almost lost on time, Filuza. Don't forget about your time. He loses oh, on time. Oh, he lost on time. He lost on time. This is really tragic. But this is a draw or not? I if don't there know. is a possibility, let's see what yes. the arbiter says. If there is a practical possibility for black to mate, then Magnus won. If there is a theoretical possibility, so is there is a position where it can be made? Yeah, but poor Filosa, I think. Aha, even Grishchuk is saying something. Yes, it it should be a draw if there is no way for black to mate white. I think both players would be very happy to make a draw mm -hmm. here already. Magnus doesn't want to win this game for sure. Nobody knows what's going on. Only Magnus is relieved. He's definitely yes. not losing the no, game the, anymore. But I cannot imagine a position where you can mate me. Yeah, I even cannot think about it, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, normally, so... yes, it, it has to be a draw. And look at Magnus is also waiting. Nobody knows what is happening. Mm -hmm. Just nobody knows what is happening. But what is he, what really shocking for me and very nice actually that Filosa can smile in this moment. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I will be interested to hear Yevgeny what will he say about this mm -hmm. if it would happen to him. And we don't know what was, yes, we don't know what was the arbiter's decision. Well, I really hope that it will be a draw. And Alisa Galamova is playing against Valentina Gunina. Yeah, and rook h7 will, we will see a rook bishop versus Katerina wow, h5. Yes. What an inc ah, but rook h8 check. Yes, incredible. Katerina Love not drew. Uh, she drew mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, but right now I cannot even think of anything else. So then this, what is the result of of this Filosa, the official result of Filosa versus Magnus Carlsen? Okay, show me a position, like where you can win. How can you mate me here? I don't know, yes. but I don't know what are the rules. I mean, if the it rule, would be... Yes, the uh -huh, rules, the yes. chief arbiter came, what did he rule? That is Nikopoulodos, mm -hmm. and he is like shocked. And shocked by what? What will be the final result? It seems that uh, Magnus won the game. Yeah, nothing has changed. Yes. At least we, we haven't seen. Hmm. We haven't seen. Incredible, of course, if Filosa loses this game like that. But that's a, exactly the scary thing when he's so low on time and he has been playing on one second, uh, not once, not twice, at least five times. And what I also noticed many times, the pieces fell down 
by his hand, so he always connected Alisa with it. Alisa gave uh, a possibility to uh, Valentina Gunina to play, uh, yes, rook B4, rook, rook D, four, yes, yeah. and Valentina missed it. Yeah, incredible. Yeah, most probably we have not seen more dramas here. Yes, there is a drama check. Incredible. Incredible. This is what can happen with unbelievable. Peace up and losing the game. This is really tragic. Mm -hmm. yeah. So once again you are lucky Peter and let's give a word to Evgeny. Uh, yeah, sometimes it's sad to see games like that. Uh, well, not the one that uh, Alisa Galeamova lost. She has blundered the rook, but uh, the way Alirza Feruja lost against Magnus is, of course, disappointing. Uh, I'll actually highlight the final position a little bit, especially for Almira, who cannot construct the way black is checkmating white king. But before that, let's take a look at an example of a really well-played game. A uh, well-played game by Anna Muzichuk, her victory against Anastasia Bodnaruk on second board in the women's section, penultimate rounds, uh, must be very, very important. Well, that's a fashionable line of the Sicilian bishop b5 check uh, and uh, returning the bishop to d3. Right, and black goes for an early b5, which is answered with a4, bishop b7, and we reach this position where the knight on b1 is attacked, and then black might as well want to take on f3, but white bravely goes for d4. I suspect this one being a home preparation, because after bishop b1, dc5, well, the pocket engine I have, like the, not, not the real thing, but just like an engine to check the positions quickly, says that the position is equal, which I suspect means that white has enough compensation. Bishop to e4, rook e1. Over here, I believe bishop c6 is the decisive mistake. White goes for knight d4. And now you cannot really slow down and move the bishop. That's too much. White goes for c6. And after this trade, it happens to be two threats at the same time. Knight c7, double attack. And if you cover c7, which is an obvious threat, then knight d6. The e-pawn is pinned. Have to go there. And knight f7 win whites the rook and the game. So black has found the only move which doesn't lose material immediately, king d8, but man, is that move ugly. Takes here bishop f4, so king is about to meet all the white's army while rook is not participating, the bishop is not participating. Queen b7, and perhaps there was a better move than queen b7, because queen b7 allows queen a4, so from this angle, queen a5 is a threat, knight to d5, Bishop to d6, now you can't really do much. Knight b6, queen a5, now to addition of the previous threats, bishop c7 with rook e8 is a threat as well. Black captured on d6, knight d6, and ah yeah, few more moves. Queen d5, trade on d5, knight f7, takes the rook, wins the game. So power, fly, uh, power play really by Anna Muzicic, only 23 moves, perhaps a very strong opening preparation. And then, coming back to Firuja and Carson, White has lost on time, or rather flagged here. Yeah, and to figure out if it's a winning position or not, I'll have to make a few stupid moves. That, that's the thing I do the best. So White gets here, White gets here, gets here. Okay, just a second. I'm waiting, Bishop H7. Bishop e5. If this is possible, that means if white lost on time, if white flagged, that he deserves a loss. I know it's brutal, I know Firuja was the one who was playing for a win, and this would never ever happen in a practical game, but such are the rules. With, if with most unqualified play you can create a situation where the white king is checkmated, that means black has won if white flags. So, well, it seems Kaisa is in favor of Magnus Carlsen if he wins the game like that. Back to the studio. And you are absolutely right, Evgeny. We just figured uh, this position ourselves. So, uh, if a cooperative mate is possible, then uh, 
Magnus uh, is rightfully awarded the win in this game. And what is even more shocking and very painful for poor Arireza that if he would not have had a bishop on d5, if he would simply not have a bishop at all, then it's it's a draw because there is no way there is a mate in the position. So a tragic loss for him and a very, very lucky win for Magnus, which puts him in very good position because then I believe he is one point ahead of uh, Hikaru who just drew and uh, there are only two more rounds to go. And it will be the final round in the ladies event, so we will be following uh, this game uh, for the next round. Yeah, there are some dramatic scenarios that are possible, no? Yes, so. because there is only a half point margin. I will have to check the results because it's, it, it is a very um, difficult situation, I think, for both players, Katerina Lagno and Anna Muzichuk. I think that Katerina Lagno is leading with 12 and a half and Anna Muzichuk has 12 points. So uh, we will have to watch these boards very closely. Yeah, they drew fact, each other. They drew each other. Yes. Yeah, in fact, I made a mistake. I was saying also, in fact, in the women's section, there is the incredible fight for the first place. Mm -hmm. In the men's section, I would say that, yeah, Magnus is now in a very comfortable position. The question is really a dramatic fight I'm expecting for the medals. And what are the interesting games of this round? Well, I think one of the highlights are a part of this uh, result of Filosia versus Magnus that Vladimir Kramnik won again, this time against Yu Yanji. Mm -hmm. So, after losing to Magnus, he bounce back immediately if we have a chance or time yes, then we, we, ha we still have some time to analyze this game so let's, yeah, let's I, get the board then i would like to show this because somehow it seems to me like whenever kramnik wins he makes a masterpiece so let's see if this is the case this time as well so knight fc knight f6 g3 g6 b4 another typical kramnik strategy just let's play chess and it seems like he believes that if I can play chess, then I have nothing to be afraid of the young guys at all. D6, D4. Whenever I see this structure, I remember the years, I mean the 90s and years 2000s when Kramnik had so many times the space advantage and I already kind of felt to myself that there is no way Kramnik is not going to win his game. The young guys don't know this. I don't know. Maybe they just don't know this. I mean, you cannot give space advantage to Kramnik, maybe in a bullet game, but uh, not, in, not even in blitz. I mean, look at this. Black is basically already busted out of the opening strategically. Of course, in blitz, many, many things can happen, but I mean, we have seen, unless Vladimir is done to his last seconds, he's controlling the game perfectly. Now the, we see the black bishop is shut down on b7, white has the space advantage, white has a clear plan of slowly advancing on the queen side and where is the typical counterplay from black on the king side? I don't see it, at least not yet. Let's see what will happen, so h4 is met by, I almost automatically say g4, but no, it's e4, if white would play g4 it's then black F5, would yeah. suddenly get immediately counterplay. So, in fact, maybe the position is not that clear because after h4, e4, black also had time to play a5. So, black blocks it, but after b takes a5, b takes a5, now we see how nicely this knight on b3 mm -hmm. is placed, protecting the c5 square where black would love to put his knight. So, now knight b5 is played, putting pressure on the c7 pawn, and more importantly, yes, with a7, a5, black slowed down by its action on the queen side. But with queen d2, he is attacking the pawn on a5, and it's over. Again, less than 20 moves played, Kramnik in total control. Bishop a6, knight c6, queen e8, queen g5, winning on the queen side. Now Kramnik takes the action also to the king side. I mean, it seems to me people are underestimating Kramnik. I just don't understand. How is that possible? I mean, never underestimate Kramnik. Knight f7, a5, bishop h6, f4, and okay, basically I don't know if we have to watch this game further because basically black has to design and there was, after ef4, gf4, rook a, b8 was a clear sign that mm -hmm. black is ready to give every, everything just to continue the game. So a great win by Vladimir and a very easy win. I mean, if you are winning so easily the games on board three, it means that 
you are somehow extremely strong. So I'm desperately trying to get the pairings for the last round in the ladies' event, and it seems that they're out. So Katerina Lagno will play against Antonieta Stefanova, a very interesting game. And Tan Zhonggi will play against Anna Muzichuk. So the title will be decided in those two games. Because on the third board, Valentina Gunina is uh, facing Anastasia Budnaruk, but they simply don't have enough points. They don't have enough, yeah? yes? Yes, so Katerina Lagno is leading with 12 and a half. Muzichuk Anna is... Ah, she also has 12 and a half. So I thought she has 12 points, but both of them have 12 and a half. Who? Uh, Anna Muzichuk and Katerina Lagno. Ah, so they are yes, equal. They are equal, so they are sharing the first place and the title is, is going to be decided now in so the last we, round so we have to focus on both games simultaneously in fact yes we will try to have a camera view i don't know if it would be possible but uh, this will be a very exciting last round yeah definitely because if we have already one decisive game it already feels like it's a lot but in fact we have two simultaneously and everything depends on uh, on that result even a draw can be enough, sometimes you lose the game and you still manage to win because your opponent, I mean your concurrent also loses. Of course. So. Every scenario is possible. Just remember the dramatic uh, situation, the London candidates when both Kramnik and Magnus lost yeah. in the last round, but they never knew exactly which result they need. They both were taking more and more risk than necessary and uh, both lost and finally uh, Carlsen was the challenger of Vishyanand. Yes, yeah, so this seems like a dream scenario for the ladies' event. We couldn't have hoped for more. And so we will have a look at these games in, like, I think in a few minutes. We have five minutes till the next round. So I'm trying to retrieve the pairings uh, for the open section. Yeah, I think today there was a day that Wang Hao started winning a lot of games, so he was climbing closer and closer, and all of a sudden he was already uh, on board five. And uh, he drew against Maxim Vashielagnaf. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's see the standings. Yes, here are the standings. So Magnus has a clear lead. He is leading with 15 and a half points. Hikaru Nakamura is second with 14 and a half and Vladimir Kramnik is third with 13 and a half. And three players are following them with 13 points. Alexei Sarana, Alexander Grishuk and Ali Reza Firuja. Yeah, exactly. I wanted to highlight, uh, pay attention to Alexei Sarana. He must have been also on fire today because we haven't seen him uh, that far ahead and uh, in the field and he is also there in striking distance for mm -hmm. medals. Anything is possible. And what are the standings in the ladies event? So before the last round, as you can see, two players are in the lead. Anna Muzichuk and Katerina Lagno. Katerina Lagno, who is the reigning world women's bleach champion. Uh, and so many players with 11 points. Valentina Gunina, Antonieta Stefanova, Tan Zhonggi and Anastasia Bodnaruk. Exactly, and uh, pay attention that uh, both opponents for the, of the leaders are Tan Zhonggi and Stefanova fighting for the third place for the bronze. So it's not only about the first place, they very much want to win that game as well in order to secure medals. The very important, very prestigious mm -hmm. results. So mm, it's, uh, it's very, very tough for everyone. Okay, we still don't know how many minutes do we have uh, before the round starts. Yeah, Katarina is already there. We can see Valentina Gunina and Anastasia Budnaruk, Jansaya Abdumalik. Yeah, Alisa Galamova. I will make sure mm -hmm. to be also ready with the games. Yeah, a lot of, lot of tension before the last round. 
We want to concentrate on Katerina Lagno and Antoinette Stefanova and if it is possible to, to watch closely Tan Jong and Anna Muzichuk because our operators have to be in the right place at the right moment. Yeah, I will be monitoring here yeah. the, the game, just in case. Well, dramatic, dramatic situation, but you remember the rapid section was mm -hmm. as well so dramatic and how nice we suddenly saw Katarina smile under she this. She smiled, but I feel that there is so much tension, you, you really, you have to... Exactly, basically that, that smile almost like uh, wanted to prove, yes, I know how critical is the situation, yes. you, know, you know exactly how nervous I am, she just wanted to kind of... Uh, but I am ready for my last battle. Yeah, definitely, and okay, she has won the title last year, so mm -hmm. she knows the feeling, how is it is, how it is to, to win the title, and we have seen her uh, playing incredibly well under terrible time pressure, which is one of the most important qualities in Blitz, because what does it mean if you control the game for the first part, when you lose control at the end? And in the Open Tournament, Magnus is seeking his fifth World Blitz title. It will be such an achievement. Yeah, certainly. Okay, what Magnus keeps on achieving and breaking his own records are mm -hmm. Just incredible. And just to remind you that Anna Muzichuk has won uh, the World Blitz title twice in the women's tournament. So. And Katerina how many times? Uh, once. Last year was the mm -hmm. first time. Yes. So she's a very close but still very, very far from... There haven't been so many tournaments. Uh, they were organized on the, during the modern era. So we have uh, Gunina Valentina uh, who won the first World Blitz Chess Championship and Anna Muzichuk twice, Nana Jagnitze in 2017 and Katerina Lagno last year in St. Petersburg. Yeah, the games, we don't see the countdown clock, <laughs> we don't know exactly how much time there is till the start of the last and very dramatic last round. <laughs> Okay, let's, let's have a look at the game uh, which uh, Podnaruk and Anastasia lost, because we still have a few moments. Ah, against Anna, mm -hmm. yeah, right? Ah, yes, but this is one, the segment that already Yevgeny, I think, explained yes. to, the, to the leaders. It was some kind of an opening trap. Yes. And, uh, yeah, this is a typical blitz weapon. I believe that Anastasia knew exactly that this is okay mm -hmm. for Black. But one thing to know that it is okay, and another one under the ticking clock to to realize that what exact what did my coach exactly tell me? How am I supposed to play? Mm -hmm. And as Yevgeny said, Bishop C6 was the decisive mistake, and after knight D4, actually it's game over. The White's attack is just yes. I've I wanted just to be sure because he told us that he was analyzing yes. Uh, uh, yeah, and I. With a pocket computer, so... I yeah, but I think it's, it's correct and uh, I remember that something similar I have seen in a game <laughs> Maxim versus Peter Swidler in one of the Bundesligas and they were blitzing out yes. everything till mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. like this and then all of a sudden White was somehow looked down and started to think and uh, it was a complete mess and finally Peter mm -hmm. Swidler with Black managed to to win it and I was thinking that yeah Luke McShane made a mistake because if one guy you don't want to enter such complications against is Peter Swidler because he's fa he will find his way out of the jungle. And it seems that Evgeny has more details about uh, the game played by Magnus Carlsen and Ali Reza Firuja. Yeah, some news. Uh, first of all, I was just told that uh, Ali Reza Firuja uh, appealed to appeals committee for, for clock being, I don't know, broken or something. 
because he, he claims that from three seconds it immediately went to zero seconds. I'm not in the mood to discuss that. What I want to discuss is the position. I mean, first of all, it's the first time live on air when we caught Peter Leko being wrong. He said the bishop for white, if there is no bishop, white would not lose, which is wrong. I'm very happy to state though, because White can promote the light square bishop and then still get himself checkmated in the corner. Okay, that's silly. Uh, the interesting part is that over here, White was winning by force, by going g6, by going g6, and then, yeah, king f6 loses to move one pawn, move the other pawn, well, whatever you like it, g7, e7, or in a different order. So the only move seems to be bishop e5, after which white goes to h6, well, threatens g7, he goes to f8, white goes to h7 first, then sacrifices one pawn for the other one, wins the bishop, and he still has the third pawn. That's important. Yeah, this e4 dude seemingly does nothing, but it is important. That's the pawn which will win white the game. However, after the move, Ali Zafiruja played king to g4 and bishop d2. Turns out the position itself is a draw because to king h5, black has to reply with bishop c3. That's interesting. It's bishop c3 and then you keep the, keep the pawn attacked. So white cannot go king h7, you keep the pawn attacked. Whenever the king goes to h5, you go to the long diagonal. Point being, g6 should be answered with bishop to g7. So interestingly enough, final position where Firuja flag was already a draw. That was it. Back to the studio. Yes, to promote <laughs> the g-pawn exactly. and the position would be still uh, hypothetically winning uh, for black if in a cooperative manner. So. Of course, I don't like this rule at all. I mean, okay, why on earth would you meet yourself? But yeah, those are the rules, those are the rules, what to do. I mean, uh, the good thing for the appeal is that uh, the arbiters can take a look at the video footage. However, this might take some time. Ah, this means that the round cannot start before the decision is taken by the appeals committee. Most probably, that's mm -hmm. the point. Mm -hmm. That's the point. But this will only increase the tension and the uncertainty. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember that I was already screaming a couple of times, just don't lose on time, don't lose on time. So yeah, Ali Reza was many, many times done to his one second, and that's why he jumped back on, on three seconds. And here, it felt to me like, I don't know, his jacket or his something with his hand when he moved, and his pieces were falling, and he was always adjusting them, adjusting them, which cost him a very precious seconds. But that also means that he is a very uh, fair player, so I reminded you that you always have to adjust your pieces or to replace them on your own time. So exactly. It, it is a, a very elegant gesture, so it probably cost him the game, but sometimes you simply forget about the notion of time. It seems like three seconds is an eternity, but not at all. Yeah, not at all. Yeah, somehow this is very, very tricky. These two seconds, you you rely on these two seconds, and and this uh, such things can happen. Yes, especially when you feel that nothing can go wrong in this position. Of course, of course. But also his his problem is that uh, he has uh, king on h5. I think he moved something. Yeah, he moved his king. And this is far away from the clock. I mean, imagine if he would have made any move on the queen side, pressing the clock would have been much faster, much easier. So he got extremely unlucky with, with this. I'm really feeling very sorry. And actually, it's not good for the tournament itself. Because imagine if the tournament situation would have been such that Magnus loses, we would have everything completely different. Now Magnus is in a very comfortable lead with one point. Otherwise, he would be sharing the lead with Hikaru, mm -hmm. and so many players would be trailing. Uh, but now Magnus is in a very nice position. So let me check. Yet there are no results, no pairings. Yeah, so, so the everything... appeals committee has to take a decision. Yeah, well. I don't know if they really need to take a decision because they have to see the footage. Yeah, if already the, the only question is 
was the clock really ticking down? And you can see it on the camera. If you make it a slow motion, then 400% mm -hmm. for sure. And let's switch to uh, to a game between uh, Anish Giri and Shahriar Mamidyar because, because it seems that something strange happened. They had a glance, so let's have a look. Yeah, well, I don't know if something strange happened. It seems to me like whenever we turn to Shakri Mamidyarov's games, he plays the Karokan and loses. And I'm already feeling a bit guilty because it seems like I'm really picking on uh, Shakri. I know it's just a complete coincidence that uh, whenever we go there, it's it's again a Karokan. But what a peculiar opening, knight f3 and d3. Yeah, but it's uh, getting more and more popular. In fact, Anish was the one who, who first invented it, I believe. The idea being that this endgame with d4, mm -hmm. d4, queen d1, king d1, turned out not to be so innocent and no other than Levon Aronian has played it in a classical game against David Navala in Batumi European Team Championship and uh, Levon was pressing uh, seriously against uh, Navara despite not being able to convert and if I'm not mistaken then we have seen a seven move draw in, uh, in the Grand Prix between Karyakin and Veyi mm -hmm. right now in Jerusalem and the point was, I think that Karyakin wanted to surprise uh, Veyi with this setup. However, it turned out that Veyi was prepared, and if I'm not mistaken, then something like knight f6, knight fd2, and g5 happened. Came out of nowhere. Exactly. f3, and somehow this rook g8, knight c4, g4, and draw was agreed. Kind of. It's, you know, the point was it was a knockout event, mm -hmm. so if you make a draw, it's not the end of the world. And suddenly, Sergei was completely shocked that, wow, what is this? I wanted to surprise my opponent, and he blitzes everything out, he gets contra play, he knows this position. I'm not feeling comfortable, let's call it a day. Uh, so this is now becoming more and more fashionable. Mm -hmm. However, here Shakriar uh, decided to keep the tension, but I'm not sure that G6 is a good move, because after E5, it feels to me like White immediately achieves something, c5, c3, d4, very typical because if white gets, for example, knight c6, mm -hmm. white plays, will, okay, it's a question, will white play d4? You remember we were discussing this stuff, that after e4, c5, knight f3, g6, I was insisting that I like to play yes. c3, mm -hmm. d5, e5, mm -hmm. and even here I'm happy with white, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, we see almost the same position. Black lost time for c6, c5, white lost time for d2, d3. Black makes sure that white will not play d4, takes, takes. Bishop f4, knight c6, knight b2, bishop h6. It's a very original position. Nobody knows exactly what is going on. Now the knight can get to h6 and target the bishop on g3, so it was not a loss of a tempo. Bishop h6, bishop g7, rather winning a tempo. Mm -hmm. So we see this typical maneuvering. Now finally white is in total control because playing h3, g4 and forcing the knight to h6 is an achievement. Black has to counter strike it with f5, takes, takes bishop g2, knight f7, g5. Very nicely played using the momentum. Takes, takes, queen f5 and okay, if white takes the bishop and plays knight d6, then it looks like it should be winning. But don't forget this is blitz. Yeah, and queen if six and queen f4, no? Exactly. Mm. If black gets contra play, and as it seems black got contra play, then who knows who is better and why? Bishop g3, wow. Bishop, okay, but it's, it already shows that black is fighting for his life because queen g3, mm. queen g3, fg, knight e5, check, king e2, knight takes d7. I assume rook c1 would also be a very nice advantage for white. But Anish is already so confident in his position that he, he doesn't queen want. Six. Yeah, he doesn't want an end game, which he usually likes so much. It shows that he believed that his position should be winning here. But what happened later? Because if this knight activates, then. Just... But no, I mean there was there was no drama. It seems to me. I mean, white converted rather smoothly, unless we are missing later something. No. So a very nice victory 
by Anish and uh, Shaklia keeps on struggling with the Karokan. My only question is, what kind of result Shaklia would have had in the tournament if he would have not chosen the Karokan for this tournament? Because it means that he's far ahead in the standings, that he's winning so many games, just losing with the Karokan. Yes, but probably he played so many uh, Italian games. You know, against Maxim, uh, they've played uh, uh, in the Armageddon match and, and later and in the tie breaks and uh, during all the Grand Prix tournaments he played E4, E5, so maybe he wanted to try a new opening as well. Definitely, and he's playing the Karo Khan. I mean, mm -hmm. it's not like uh, this is something new and uh, Karo Khan had been serving Shakriya quite well. Uh, in the past and maybe this is also the reason why he thought that it will be a good choice he just got very very unlucky he doesn't get the main lines he is tri tricked with knight cc knight f3 he was now facing uh, anish's knight f3 d5 d3 setup and there is one very important moment to to note in 99 in sarajevo i played Karokan against nigel short and it was e4 c6 and I believe Nigel used the move of the knight c3 mm -hmm. d5. And here g3. And he played here d3. And he played d3. And this was the moment when Kasper was still waiting for his uh, opponent, I believe. And he came to our board. And he was exactly standing in front of me, so behind Nigel. And when he saw d3, he made such a grimace. He got it really made such a grimace that I felt immediately ashamed that we are sitting on the stage. It, the, basically, his face expression meant go out to the park and continue this game there. And it distracted me so much that I ended up being strategically lost after move 6. I think I played g6. G3, I would have never Maybe played... Maybe you felt obliged to get an advantage immediately. Not advantage, but kind of to, 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 to get an interesting game. Mm -hmm. The point is that Probably if Gary would have not interfered with his grimace, I would have most probably taken on e4 and let's play in the Karakhan spirit. But I somehow felt also provoked. I played g6, white played g3, bishop g7, bishop g2, and something completely crazy happened with my brain that I felt like let's keep provoking. And after knight f6, e5, knight g4, f4, f6, I relied on this. Suddenly the little move queen e2, F takes E5, and H3, H3 mm -hmm. Knight H6, F E5, I was faced with this position. My next couple of moves had been something like trying to hang on with Rook G8 and Knight H8 protecting the G6 pawn. That's how the game started and I felt like Gary was absolutely right that we should have played this game in the park. <laughs> no, this is really exaggerated, but uh, it's a very nice story. <laughs> Well, that's how I felt, you know, and Gary had this su su suggestive look always, you know, that, uh, and I heard from many people also that uh, many times you played, for example, some Nidov. Gary was the greatest Nidov expert in theory, in practice, everywhere. And when you never knew in Tantra what is happening, one side is about to meet the other, Gary approaches and whoever uh, sits with his back to Gary, probably will win the game because Gary will come and will look and he will automatically look like I mean you guys don't don't read the position the way you should and the guy who looks at Gary loses the concentration then loses so the he game. He's getting impressed. Yeah, getting <laughs> impressed. I mean Gary had uh, back then incredible uh, expressions and okay he was also dominating the chessboard so much that uh, everybody was afraid. And everybody believed that what Gary thinks about certain position is, is right. Or you have uh, not that so of strong course, back but, then. And they were right. <laughs> and they were right. Exactly. And I've checked uh, the pairings and the standings online. Still, there is no verdict. So we will have to wait. Yes. Yeah, because it's also true. The tournament simply cannot continue without this. I only feel uh, really sorry for the for the ladies because the tension is growing with every minute. But is there any chance for our operator to retrieve the images because we were following this game live and I think that we saw the moment exactly but I I wouldn't be able to to tell you Exactly. My impression was also that the clock ticked down because I remember that my heart, I already felt like now it's going to happen, you know? So I think that our operators 
Yes. Would be very nice, of course, if we, could, yes. if we could get yes. Uh, we have 15 minutes or 13 minutes till the next round. We will have a small break and please uh, stay tuned in because there is the final round in the ladies' event and two more rounds in the open tournament. Energy is essential to human life. It also drives progress. At Total, energy is our business. We are a leading international oil and gas company. And a major player in low carbon energies. We explore for, produce, transform market and distribute energy in a variety of forms to serve the end customer. And we operate in more than 130 countries. How are we providing concrete responses to the challenges of the next 20 years? How can we meet the energy needs of a growing population? How can we tackle climate change? And how can we adapt to new consumer habits and customer expectations? By supplying an energy mix combining natural gas, oil and renewables. And by improving the energy efficiency of our facilities and products to limit their impact on global warming. And also by leveraging our closeness to customers, by anticipating their needs and helping them use energy more responsibly. In short, our 98,000 employees are committed to supplying affordable, reliable, clean energy to as many people as possible. Our ambition is to become the responsible energy major.
we will start in two minutes. Please take your seats. We start in one minute. So 12 seconds before the beginning of the last round. Yeah, Katerina versus Antoinette Stefanova. I mean Katerina Lachno. Mm -hmm. And we also have the other very important game, Tanzonji versus Anna Muzichuk. So the title will be decided now. But if they, sh if they share the points, then we will see tiebreak yes. yeah, again. Mm -hmm. So tiebreak is not to be ruled out. This is a classical Spanish 6D3, very strategical opening and somewhat surprising from Antoinette because she's a famous Arhangelsky player. Mm -hmm. I mean, usually she always puts the bishop on C5. It shows like she has quite a Quite, res quite a big respect for Katerina's preparation, most probably. And uh, the verdict has been taken that Magnus Carlsen won his game. We just wanted to inform our viewers. Yeah, it was very dramatic, but yeah, rules are rules. That uh, Liri Zafiruja lost his, his appeal. And we see this typical maneuver, knight b2, knight f1, mm -hmm. rook e8, bishop f8 by black. A lot of finesses, but in blitz game, finally, you don't have time to deal with all these finesses. You have to just play. For the moment, it's all okay. Everything was logical, but... Uh, what, d4 now, or h3 first? Yeah, h3. Yeah, h3, mm -hmm. g6, black mm -hmm. puts the bishop on g7, white plays d3, d4. Everything is under control. White is somewhat better. We see very similar structure of the previous Firuza versus uh, Magnus Carlsen mm -hmm. game, but there the A5 was uh, closed. So yeah. black exactly plays B5, B4. She needs to change this pawn. Queen D2, I think, yes. Because this case then she also opens up the B file. She has to take care of the A7 pawn. King h7 has been played. So this game is a rather slow affair. I mean, this is a positional struggle mm -hmm. and I'm keeping an eye on this Tanzonji Anna Muzichok. That's razor sharp. So a lot of, lot of tension uh, due to this fact. That and Anna played a very unusual opening for her. What was this? It was a Trompovsky. It ah, was it a, was a Trompovsky. Yeah, okay. I mean, mm -hmm. but one had the feeling that this was something else. That it else. was French, yes. Exactly. I mean, uh, so I believe uh, nobody will know 
the result of any of these games until, I mean, because this game, Anna Muzicuk, any result is possible. And in the Katarina Lachno's Antonia Stefanova game also, this will be a long possession of battle. But somehow I feel that it is easier to play for Katerina because uh, it is a very slow positional battle, so she gets the time she needs to calm down. There is so much pressure on her. Yes, that's, uh, that's true, but uh, she doesn't know. I don't think she has the time and the luxury to look at Anna's position mm -hmm. and most probably she shouldn't. Uh, the only time when she should look when there is a certain guaranteed result already on the other board, just to be sure which result she needs. <clears throat> I'm not sure that it, this is, I mean, that it's solid, that it's so easy for her also, because there is a lot of pressure. She has to win. She doesn't mm -hmm. know. Maybe Anna will win. So in order to uh, keep the title, because she is the defender. I just wanted to remind you that Antoinette won the Women's World Championship. So she's a very strong player. Uh, she won the Women's European Championship as well, so... And very experienced. Yes, she what, is such a fighter. Yeah, what matters here maybe, and we should mention that Katerina is well ahead on the clock. And this is very, very important. We have seen it so many times that the clock playing a very, very important role. And uh, the point is that if you have uh, in a strategic position some advantage, it's much easier for you to play and uh, Antoinette is burning much more time in order to try to create some counterplay, while uh, Katerina is basically always uh, keeping the pressure, stabilizing the position and, and putting slowly the pressure. Black needs to activate the knight from c8. And the g4 g4 pawn, pawn is blundered. I wanted to say that the g4 pawn is hanging. Just wanted yes, to ask you, would you play f3? But probably you, you had to. Yes, you had to play f3. You had and to. Katerina blundered the pawn. And you see the pressure is taking its toll. And not only a pawn, but black has this h5, h4 uh, play, which can be very unpleasant. So she needs to make sure that with queen c7 she will be able to disbalance. But what to do after h5? It was a terrible blunder, not just a pawn, but a very important pawn. H5. Bishop d7. Mm -hmm. Antoinette is down to one minute. One minute, one second. And we all saw how fast Katerina can be. Yeah. So nothing is clear and then also... What is happening? Wow, I'm I afraid it's... even to look at, uh, at the second board. I mean, complete mess. Complete mess. I have nothing to add a part of that. Drama all over the place. Drama all over the place. Yeah, finally h5 is played, but now bishop d1, black has to play queen h4. This is what I wanted to avoid. I did not want to... Mm -hmm. Please keep in mind that no one can catch both players so so the first two places yes. are guaranteed mm -hmm. so this they is are, at least yes, they're guaranteed and it means that if Anna Muzichuk loses or Katerina Lagno loses they will play a tie break yeah actually maybe it would have been an incredible trick to wait for h5 h4 because then bishop d1 would have trapped the queen can you imagine oh. a, a very nice Cipolito in blitz <laughs> very nice Cipolito I love this chip a little chip trick, yes? Yeah, exactly, chip trick. Which is so easy to fall for, yeah? You play h5, h4 thinking mm -hmm. you are winning the game and all of a sudden you are losing it. And Katerina is down to 35 seconds. Yeah, the tension. But also now with this uh, rook on h8, black pieces are slightly miscoordinated. Mm -hmm. Queen d8, queen c6 played, now h4 will be played. And this is bad news for white, yeah, whenever this h5, h4 comes. h3 now. Yeah, h3 or even bishop f6, king g7, bishop g5 would be also possible regrouping. But there are some ideas. White can try to play c5, yeah, 97 played in order to, to close the seventh, seventh rank. Because some c5, d6, queen takes c6 was looming in the air, knight g8. 
knight h2, knight is heading to g4, the other knight is heading to g5. Wow, it gets dramatic. Down to 30 seconds. And wait, wait can play c5, then... So many things, yeah, bishop h6 is a good strategical move, but knight g5 check is coming, she has to take. Mm -hmm. She is pinned, king g7. Meanwhile, Anna Muzicu game is still in progress and still impossible to, to judge exactly what is happening. There is some crazy madness there going on. So the players cannot feel seconds. safe at all. Wow, yeah. Knight g4 then takes and e6 is pinned. Once white takes, bishop e6 at the end. Instead, so takes, takes, and bishop e2. But now black is totally secured, yeah? King g7 back, queen b6, queen d8. Yeah, now black goes queen f6, queen f4. This is very, very... She needs to take on d8. Yeah, this is very... But it seems to me... Mm -hmm. I ah, know, we don't know yet. Maybe she can hold this. Maybe she can mm -hmm. hold it, it looks bad, but uh, Anna is in trouble. Anna is in trouble, so maybe even if she loses this game, it will still not be the end of the world. Of course, she doesn't know this. She's fighting for her life. And okay, now it looks like she will make a draw. After this, he takes f4, king f4. She is very solid. Of course, still, black can oh. try to... This was a very unusual rook c7. <laughs> yeah, she noticed this c5 idea yes. and... But okay, there is no way white gonna lose this. Unless with the time, rook mm -hmm. b6. And this draw, it seems, will... Yeah, it will guarantee because Tanzonji has won her game against Anna Muzicu. So it means that if Katerina draws... Draw is a title. So Katerina Lagno wins the title. Congratulations. Congratulations. Yeah, congratulations. What a dramatic last round. She's so exhausted she can hardly still understand what has happened. Wow. So let's switch to the open tournament because uh, Anna Muzichuk lost her game against against Tanjungi. Yeah, the tension, the tension, yeah. And Anna Muzichuk is second. Anna Muzichuk mm -hmm. is second. Mm -hmm. So I see that Magnus Kars and Grishu game finished mm -hmm. in a draw. Alexander Zubov already on the second board, but losing to Hikaru Nakamura. Mm -hmm. So in fact, Hikaru is in striking distance before the last round, and Firuza lost to, to Kramnik. Yeah, I mean, how can you play after the previous game? It's very, very tough. And Kramnik continues his incredible run. And then there are many, many draws. But Vashi Lagraf won against Alexei Salana. So we will also have some dramatic final round in the open section. And some more uh, results. Wang Kao drew with Duda and Yu Yanji drew with Aronyan. So quite a lot of draws, but also some very important winners like Hikaru and Vladimir Kramnik. Mm -hmm. Hikaru Nakamura and Vladimir Kramnik. Magnus has 16 points before the last round. Hikaru Nakamura is second with uh, 15 and a half. Yeah, just mm -hmm. half a point behind. And Vladimir Kramnik has 14 and a half. And we see this frightening Rook Knight versus Rook position again, but just with two seconds bonus. This is the nightmare of all commentators. In a rapid game, it can end, I mean, it can last forever. So, incredible. I mean, what an achievement by Katerina, yeah? Mm -hmm. Defending her title. This is uh, mm -hmm. fantastic. This is fantastic. <laughs> Peter, let's get back to Evgeny.
Yeah, I don't think this instructive end game on board 79, Druk and Knight versus Druk will finish in anything but the draw. Uh, well, Anna Muzichuk takes silver, but she could easily be first. The game was, as commentators described it, a real mess, and at some point Black clearly missed the chance to win. Never mind later on there was like a few opportunities to draw the game. So somewhere around here well i'm not sure what's happening white went for this to sacrifice the knight to take the bishop back on c3 b5 i don't know what was really i mean why white had to play that aggressively knight to f5 just throwing more pieces in takes e6 well the queen's attacked f4 bishop to e4 and that's mysterious because you know what? White should have taken went bishop e4. Would have been another story. If the bishop e4, well, all black had to do is to take on e6, and after rook takes, to take on g3. Yes, the position is still complex, but black would have been up material and in control. And Anna decided to take on g3 first, where white captures on d7, and then captures on a8. So this time, Black is down an exchange. The position, however, yeah, they've traded the, the queens somewhere around this point. The position, however, was still really, really unbalanced. It was still hard to say who is better here. I believe somewhere around this point, black shouldn't be worse with two pawns for an exchange and potential of b4 breakthrough. a5, rook h5, b4, takes takes here, rook g5 check. Well, perhaps king f8, because king f6 ran into some, you know, into some uh, checks. Rook a8, check here, check here. Well, I'm just curious how did Anna Muzichuk ended up losing. Rook f7, rook b7, and apparently this king ran into a mating net. Yes, king to d8, and yes, you save yourself from a checkmate, but you lose another rook. So really, really dramatic uh, well, dramatic game because it seems, yeah, I dare to say one move away from the goal. It's not correct, perhaps, but yeah, F takes E6 was much better and would given Anna all the chances for uh, the gold medal. And if I might, just quickly, Vladimir Kramnik outplaying Alirza Firuja was really, really impressive and at the same time surprising. When I've seen this position, I thought, okay, b7 is just as weak as c4, and what can happen? We, we are talking four versus four on one wing, you know, nothing happening seemingly. And, you know, a few moves later, we got to this position. Still seems to be nothing special. A few moves later, got to this position. How do you win that? I'm really, really curious. And rook takes e6, an exchange sacrifice. And rook d1, and Kramnik apparently has won this position. Uh, I suspect it involved a blunder somewhere. Not really. Has taken a pawn, later on went g4, so slowly outplayed. Well, could it be that Ali Riza underestimated this position? It shouldn't be better for white, but at the same time, white is kind of playing risk-free. The knight on e4 is too strong, so... In an essence, I do support the idea of sacrificing on e6 because it also, also uh, makes white play a bit easier, but really impressive. So, won the pawn, then h5 will share dominance on the light squares here, and here, rook a8. Oh, well, the poor king went to, to b7, and then the other pawn is gone, and then the h pawn eventually decided the game. Yeah, knight c6, knight e4, so losing more material, slowly, steadily outplaying uh, Firuja. So Kramnik is in business going to the last round. We are ready for an interview, I was told, and then we'll be back to the studio. We are ready for an interview with the world champion in the women's section, Katerina Lagno. A day of great drama at Luzhniki Stadium, but what a day for Katerina Lagno. Congratulations on your victory in the Blitz. What are your thoughts? Well, of course, I'm very happy. It was a tough day, and uh, it was a bit of luck. 
because I was uh, in the last game. I was uh, I had a pleasant position, but then I just blundered the pawn in one move, and then. What went through your head when you blundered that pawn? That that. Well, that I shouldn't do it, <laughs> but uh, you cannot. You know, you cannot think about it too long because otherwise you will just. You cannot play, so you just okay. It happens, and then I st I tried to to find some some chances. Well, it was still it was. Of course, I was better, but now I'm slightly worse because I had some compensation. So I tried to to make it to hold it. And uh, well, would you say this was your toughest game in the blitz, the last one? No, the last one was not the toughest. Uh, I lost uh, uh, t not tough game, but very, you know, uh, against Galliano I played a game and she won convincingly. Just uh, and this was the toughest moment because I met two draws in a row and then I lost uh, a game. So you know it can go very quickly. I mean it can go down very quickly when. So I tried to to do something to play better and. Uh, well, it's, it's a great victory, and this is your second victory. You repeated what you did in St. Petersburg. How do the two compare? Do you think this tournament was better than the St. Petersburg one for you in terms of your performance? Uh, this time it was tougher because uh, last year, before the last round, I had uh, half a point more than the others. But here we had the same number of points. So, well, just in the last round, everybody started, so, well, I thought I have to, I, am with, I play with white pieces that I have to play for win, okay, at least to try, and then I lost a pawn, and <laughs> now I said to myself, okay, let's play for a draw, <laughs> and uh, yes, and uh, after the game I found, uh, that, found out that uh, Anna, she lost, well, and finally, like every day, are you uh, so far? Are you going to wait for your husband to f for him to finish and then celebrate, or what's going? Yes, of course. But now, why not? You're going to be here, still in the venue. Yes, I want to to be with him right now. Thank you very much for your time and congratulations once again. We are back <laughs> live. Uh, welcome back to our studios. So congratulations to Katerina Lagno. She won her second World Blitz title. So t and in a row. In a row, yes. What what an achievement. Usually this is happening for Magnus Carlsen, yeah? I mean, he's the one who is able to repeat his successes. Fantastic achievement by Katerina. And uh, talking about Magnus Carlsen, he is able to repeat his result if he wins his next game yeah. but for the moment let's have a look at the results of the last round of the 17th round in the ladies tournament a lot of decisive games as well um, we still don't know who won the medals I have to check exactly mm -hmm. yeah. who got third this is not a big question because it was clear that the first two places are mm -hmm. taken and this is yes, for the moment there is no official uh, standings. And here are the results of the of the twentieth round in the open tournament. So, well, a few draws here. It seems that uh, yeah, the tension is the growing. tension is growing, and they want to secure uh, a nice prize. Yeah, but also we don't know how hard fought were those doors. Maybe they were like crazy mm -hmm. fights and finally draw is a draw. So Maxim Vachelagrav won with black against Saran Alexei. Yeah, that's a very important mm -hmm. uh, victory for Maxim because in this case he is still fighting for some top mm -hmm. spots. So in Dmitry and Rinkin won against Nikhal Sarins. So those are the most important wins. 
and nice to see Peter Swidler because he had a very very mm -hmm. tough day yesterday he was struggling big time but if he is already at the board number nine it means that he should have had today a fantastic day with many many wins so let's find the game to analyze Peter and we are not seeing the standings you know for the moment there are no standings mm -hmm. we need to wait good I mean I have I have a game because usually between two great players mate is very rare I mean even in a blitz game mm -hmm. checkmate is very rare and in in this game Vladimir Fedoseyev versus Vidit Santos Guirati some very interesting things have happened we are seeing some open Spanish open Spanish has lately a very very solid reputation all the critical force lines which were kind of posing problems are working quite nicely for black at the moment thanks to the computer's help so it's gaining in popularity many many great players like Shakriya Mamedyarov, Vishy Anand uh, and also Vidit use it often as their main repertoire this is the old classical line but this bishop c2 f5 e takes f6 is a relatively rare line we have seen many many games with knight b3 queen d7 and uh, all this uh, knight d4s then knight d8 mm -hmm. and so on i'm already so tired and so exhausted that i don't dare to say anything because i might be somehow confusing something so ef6 definitely a very interesting move knight takes f6 a4 avoiding the mainstream theory and as this game will also show there is a lot of poison to it mm -hmm. b4 very logical black has to deal with the with the constant threat of a b a b rook a8 queen a8 when the queen will be a little bit too far away from the action on the e file <clears throat> so it's very logical for black to solve this by playing b5 b4 but pay attention that after b5 b4 suddenly new diagonals are opening up i don't know if in this game this made any difference but usually it does so rook e1 queen d7 knight f1 a very typical way white wants to get his knight to g3 as almost in all spanish Rui lopez uh, it is very very useful and black immediately hits white with a pin with bishop g4 I think it's also typical in this line and here we see knight e3 coming hitting the bishop and b takes c3 had been played however after b takes c3 white took black's bishop this somewhat surprises me i mean why could black not keep his bishop with bishop h5 i mean this pin looks so disturbing i'm not uh, getting an immediate answer for it there are some bishop beasts but it doesn't look so frightening and okay a4 a5 is is not something i would be worried of so this is slightly mysterious why bishop h5 was not played ah pardon me maybe bishop f5 is an idea okay black has to go queen d6 but yeah then we are certainly irritated by by bishop f5 it was so easy to miss this move because the bishop was previously controlling this diagonal so after knight e3 black to b takes e3 first however i don't know what would this change however now white used the chance of taking this bishop knight g4 knight g4 h3 not even taking back bc because maybe after bc then black gets very strong initiative against f2 pawn this is also typical but no here yeah it's possible because white doesn't have any uh, tricks so h3 is a very important moment white sacrifices the pawn kicks away the knight knight f6 and all of a sudden now we see the two bishops and the knight uh, targeting black's king g6 black closes the b1 a7 diagonal but other diagonals are getting opened and look at this lovely move knight e4 using the fact of the pin the knight the defender will be eliminated and if white gets now to the long diagonal then it's game over and how to stop it queen d4 is a threat and after bishop c5 queen e5 mm -hmm. happened bishop f2 check king h1 takes and white even takes back since he says there is simply no defense against queen h8 black is completely hopeless 
seemingly so queen d6 was played out of desperation and we suddenly see a checkmate which we very rarely see peter and finally the pairings are out so let's have a look at the pairings uh, of the final round Yu Yang Yi plays uh, against Magnus Carlsen and Hikaru Nakamura will face with black Rauf Mamedov and a very interesting game between Maxim Vasilegrav and Vladimir Kramnik. That's a real prestige duel. Yes, and let's have a look at the standings before the last round. Magnus Carlsen leads with 16 points, Hikaru Nakamura is second with 15 and a half, and Vladimir Kramnik is third with 14 and a half. So he just needs a draw to be on the podium. Yeah, but now we also see how important this pairing is, because if Maxim Vashilagrav beats Vladimir Kramnik, then he catches up. And then also Alexander Grishuk has chance to, to fight for medal. Very, very interesting last run. And Yu Yanji, a blitz specialist and a very very strong player is also not an easy opponent for Magnus when Magnus basically is only half a point ahead of Hikaru Nakamura so he doesn't really know which result he needs oh my god and I, I just checked the tie breaks and Vladimir Kramnik and Maxim Vashilagrav have the same tie breaks really yes yeah? first and second this Oof. this is a very rare uh, situation and look at the crowd, look at the crowd, the players are playing in front of this crowd, the decisive last run, the, one can feel the tension, sense the tension, incredible, fully packed house here in Luznica. So this Arena. is a dream scenario for us and for all the fans all over the world, the title will be decided now. Magnus leaning back, trying to compose himself. He's very concentrated. We hardly see him sitting so often, so early before the game. And now we also see what kind of rituals he might have when he's there and how he tries to calm himself down or get ready for the game. And the game starts. We even don't know what to follow, of course, the title is on the line, so clearly Magnus Carlsen's game is very important. But we have to keep an eye on Hikaru mm -hmm. Nakamura and also on Maxim Vashilagraf versus Kramnik. Because Kramnik is about to clinch a bronze medal after coming back from retirement for this tournament. So he seems to follow your advice, Yu Yang Yi. Of mm -hmm. course, why not? Why not? And we see the same line, will he also go H4 or not, as Duda? Because this castle rook b8 is a slightly rare move order. Usually black puts the bishop on g5. And exactly for this reason, h4 is here such a principal move, stopping the black bishop of going to g5. And Yu Yanji taking his time. He's somewhat surprised. And on the background, I, I, I just saw Dmitry and Reikin, uh he stood up, so he, yeah, made, yes, he made the draw. Yeah. So basically, Alexander Grishchuk decided to secure a very good place. Yeah, AC, Knight, CB4, this is a typical idea. Typical idea. And maybe this was my game against Topalo in 2005 in Dortmund, because exactly at that point I did not want to reveal mm -hmm. my main preparation for, for the World Championship in St. Louis and I played this line with black just as an experiment in that very one game and it seems to me that yes the point behind this move that you cannot play knight e7 because white can simply take on e7 and then you will lose an exchange exactly then you fork with knight c6 and if black takes on before then you take a takes before and all of a sudden it's a completely different structure bishop b7 has to be played yes magnus chose bishop b7 and now we are going more or less to a typical type of position, but with the black bishop on c6. Okay, previously in Magnus' game against Duda, the bishop was on b7, it's not much of a difference. However, usually in all the position that I was playing, the black bishop was always going to e6. Well, most, most often it was going to e6. So Magnus goes for the typical g6 plan. I mean, black prepares f5, black also prepares king g7. It's very nice uh, since black controls the dark squares yeah bishop d7 magnus is heading with his bishop to e6 
Okay, D1, Bishop E6, yeah. That's where the bishop usually belongs. And now is the huge question, yeah, Bishop F6 is a typical way of trying to keep the control and get ready for Black's counterplay with F7, F5, then the bishop is perfectly placed. Now, another plan would have been Queen E2, Rook D3, Rook F D1. That's uh, another possible idea to, to double on the on the D file. Finally, the queen on D3 is not doing that much, and the rook on E1 is not needed. Another question that, okay, if you doubled on the D with the rooks, what you do next? And 152, I promised you to update you on... Aha, so Hikaru went for this Steinitz uh, D6, G6 uh, Spanish, mm -hmm. so he's clearly ready to risk against uh, Rauf Mamedov in order to catch Magnus if catch if uh, Magnus fails to, to win this game. And Magnus himself doesn't know what he should be playing for. And Maxim seems to be doing good against Kramnik. But that's they're only the blows. Gary has absolutely nothing to lose. He has to win his game. Exactly. I mean, okay, he had to lose something if Kramnik wins mm -hmm. and he loses, then Kramnik catches him, but I mean, I think he was very happy when he saw that the Kramnik faces mm -hmm. Maxim so they Bashir repeat Lagraf. moves. They are about to repeat moves and the draw is taken. So all eyes on the game of Mamedov Hikaru Nakamura. The title will be decided in that game because if Hikaru wins that game, then he catches Magnus and there will be a playoff for the gold medal. And yeah, Hikaru is checking the result. He understood that yeah, he needs to win at all costs. So basically, it's in his own hands. It's in all hands. And yeah, here we see the game Maxim Vasilagraf versus Vladimir Kramnik. And Vladimir is in trouble. Back to Hikaru's game. And I see the clock ticking down by Rauf. It's 49 seconds. I mean, less than a minute. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely less than a minute against, against Hikaru. 1.30 on the clock. Every second counts. We have basically now, it's very nice. We have both. We had for a second both uh, angles. Also the Kramnik game. And bishop b5 hitting the queen and provoking. This is exactly what you don't like to to be faced with with little time and where to yeah. I mean c4 is a move which is born out of necessity. I mean you don't want to weaken your structure giving the d4 square, but on the other hand, white has this very powerful knight on d5, which most probably compensates for the weakness of the d4 square. Hikaru taking his time, but still clearly ahead on the clock. Do you see exactly how? I he, don't see uh, I think 35 seconds for Rauf and yes, 55 seconds now for Hikaru. Yeah, Hikaru's clock is clear for me. The other one somehow exactly the light reflects. Yes, yes, exactly 35 seconds left. Yeah, excellent. So this basically guarantees clear drama because the position is full of fight, full of life and the clock is ticking down. Of course Hikaru very much in his element but believe me Rauf is a blitz specialist and if someone who can handle the time scramble very well. Knight b7, Hikaru wants to go knight c5. So b4, ah but the black queen is on f8. In this case black has mm -hmm. a very nice grip and the clock is ticking down. 18 seconds. 18 seconds. Knight mm -hmm. basically played. Black gets a very nice Maybe blockade. Knight c5 and, and a5. a5 yes. mm -hmm. Maybe a5 first. Yeah, a5 is played. Hikaru knows that he has a nice position. He, he tries to open it with e4. Fe4, knight d6. Wow, very important. And he wants to take with the knight on e4, hitting the f2 bishop because the dark squares are more, more, the most important ones in this position. Forget about pawns. Pawn is not important. If Hikaru takes you on bishop, he will meet you on the dark squares. Graf taking all the pawns, but now Rook takes b2 will come. Punishment is about to happen. Rook takes b2, hitting the bishop, 
bishop, what's that? I mean, black takes the pawn, uh, black takes the bishop. Mm -hmm. So black is basically winning, but the pawns are dangerous. Black is pawn up, uh, piece up, but those two pawns, how are you gonna stop those two pawns? Rook c4. Yeah, d6 had mm -hmm. to be played, and rook c4, yeah. And Magnus Carlsen is watching this game closely. Of course, knight yes, d6. Have, and Hikaru Nakamura wins, so we will have a tie break. Yeah, what a win by Hikaru on demand. Winning on demand. Fantastic achievement, and we will have a tie break for the title. And what happened in the, in the third game? Draw. Draw. So Vladimir Pramnik takes the bronze medal. Yeah, mm -hmm. incredible. Congratulations, Vladimir. Fantastic result. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. here we see Wang Kao versus Firuza in action. Black is pawn up, but quite dr the position is quite rich. Rook d5. Very important move, rook d5. And now black is... Ah, but rook a5, rook c8 check. There was rook c8 check and rook d8 coming from behind. But maybe also the king is close enough. But it seems that Alireza Firuza was simply destroyed by the outcome of his game against Magnus Carlsen. Who wouldn't? Yeah. I mean, this was such a tragic loss because, okay, I mean, how can you... I mean, you are three pawns up. The only question was, will he win or not? And actually, my feeling is if he would have not lost on time, he would have won that game. Because... Uh, it was very difficult to, to find the defensive resource mm -hmm. with black. Yeah, we see Adli Ahmed losing the last round to an unknown opponent because we don't we don't see it. Yeah, and blue oh, agreed. Mm -hmm. Peter, let's give a word to Evgeny. He has analyzed some positions from this round. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to congratulate Vladimir Kramnik with his bronze medal in Blitz. Such a nice comeback from retirement. But I have to say he was very, very close to the defeat in this game against Maxim Vyshyelagraf. And what amazes me, how on earth Maxim is getting those winning positions from this seemingly harmless line? Okay, maybe perhaps that's how people uh, fall a victim of that by thinking this line is harmless. So once again, uh, the line itself, the Gioco Piano Italian, of course, uh, well seen many, many times. Bishop E6 this time, because I believe that was Kramnik himself to invent this. After rook e8, you go b4, bishop here, and what was it, capture, and queen c2. I believe it all started with the game of Kramnik with white against Vishyananda. More or less any uh, concept in a modern chess in the opening you have, it's invented by Kramnik. So once again, what a great player he is. And yeah, it was pretty normal, so exchange on e6 means black gets the pressure on the semi-open file, white gets somewhat better structure. And yeah, and then we got here, but the position is still more or less balanced, at least white will have to prove his advantage, but here Kramnik gets aggressive, goes d6, d5, tries to open the center up, but underestimates how vulnerable his pawn on e5 is in this case. So knight e to g4, knight g6, and knight f3, all of a sudden there is no comfortable way for black to guard the pawn on e5. So black went c5, here there were, yeah, b takes, queen to c7 to keep the e5 pawn alive. Here there were quite a few ways for an advantage for white, the simplest one, as I found out, was just to trade on d5 before taking the pawn and then go d4, shut down the bishop. Well, a pawn up for nothing, more or less. d4 was still fine, d takes, swap on e5 happened, knight, uh, bishop c5. I suspect somewhere around this point, a move like queen b3 or, you know, or queen g4 is very close to a victory. So this and then queen g4 was played, bishop e5, queen e6. 
King H8, and then according to computer engine, D takes E5 was a stronger move. D E5, then move the queen and push the E pawn. I don't know what for, because after queen E5 and queen takes C3, queen F3 is there. Somehow Black is getting some sort of counterplay. Later on. Black invaded with his queen on f3. White is still a pawn up, but some, you know, some, some problems already. Queen e4 was a choice of Maxime Michel Graf. Also, you are getting low on the clock, so you want to swap the queens. And this rook endgame happened to be not possible to win for White. It all ended up here, where White has zero chance. So, a draw for himself, like holding back one of Pursuitus with Yellow Graf, and then Grishuk making a draw makes it so that Vladimir Kramnik takes the bronze, while we will have a tiebreak for the gold between Nakamura and Carson. Back to the studio, maybe we'll see more games. So, yeah, Giri is still playing this. Ah, in fact, now he's winning because. Mm -hmm. uh, he was grinding, grinding, and finally he's rewarded. And look at Salana resigns. He cannot mm -hmm. believe himself that finally he yeah. has lost it, but he was under mm -hmm. severe pressure. So, Peter, I checked the results, uh, and it seems that Tan Zhongi won uh, the bronze medal in the ladies' event, and Anna Muzichuk got uh, the prize for the overall results. Do you remember? I've told you that there is a special prize. So Anna Muzichuk won uh, uh, this prize awarded by the group Total. So she showed the best performance in both events combined. Yeah, well, congratulations! Yeah, because uh, simply she was. Now, I mean, we haven't really seen her in the rapid section. Now she was in contention for first, but she made such a comeback in mm -hmm. the rapid, yeah, and it proved uh, very vital. Yes, let's have a look at the results from our last round. It was the 21st round. Yeah, so basically, as usual, if you win in the last round, that's a huge step forward. Mm -hmm. Hikaru catches Magnus, so we are in for a treat with a dramatic Playoff, tie break, and Kramnik securing a draw against Maxim Vashelagraf gives him the bronze. And we see a lot of, lot of draws. Basically, the players uh, paying respect for for the good prizes. They just wanted to make sure that they are not missing out. A very big fight between Filoza and Wang Hao. It also ended in a draw. Swidler finishes on high note, beating. Adli Ahmed, mm -hmm. I think it was very, very important, and also Anish Giri winning a 130 move game or even more against uh, Alexei Savana. Very good finish, and many, many other decisive results. Vidit Santos lost his last two games, so unfortunately for him, he had a great performance, but uh, he's falling behind. And the person like, for example, Ernesto Inakia, whom we haven't really been seeing, is suddenly going up. Thank Another important, Boris Gelfand beat Badu Jobava, clash of styles. I mean, uh, the completely unpredictable Badu Jobava against the Mr. Classic uh, Boris Gelfand. Fantastic result also by Boris. I mean, winning the last round, uh, it means probably that he will finish very well. Peter, the round is over, but it seems that Evgeny continues to analyze. So uh, there are some uh, curious positions that he wants to show us. Great. Yeah, that was really, well, to illustrate all the drama, to sum up, I mean, how many, well, mistakes, brilliant decisions taken in this tournament, and still we are to see the tiebreak. So to highlight how stressful and how, uh, well, how painful sometimes blitz can be. A game between Matlakov and Mamed Yarov. Maxim Matlakov seemingly has a dominant position here. This bishop is miserable on F8, right? On B7 is not much better. However, you play one relaxed move, queen c5, you think you're winning. After rook c8, your queen is trapped all of a sudden. Can you believe that? And Matlakov decided to 
sacrificed the queen, go d6, maybe was hoping that he is winning, I don't know. But it seems that black was in control after that. Maybe white is not lost, he is still fighting, but, you know, black is up a queen. And it went on and on, and seemingly black made progress here. Are they to, there to claim that black has to be better? Knight e5 check, and then careless capture on h6. Well, one moment of relaxation costs you the game. Bishop f8 check, king goes there, rook captures on e4, g4, and king g1 to g2 was the last move in this game, because rook h1 cannot be prevented. Sometimes being a queen up doesn't really help. Uh, I believe that was it, and let's, let's, move to, let's move to the studio again. Thank you, Evgeny, and I hope that uh, the standings for the ladies uh, event would be ready very soon. Uh, so, Peter, how, how much time do we have before the tie breaks? Will start? Yeah, that would be good to know. Oh, they will start any moment. Yeah, if Magnus is already sitting, and look at this, he stands. He stands because Hikaru did the seemingly impossible catch Magnus. He catch Magnus, and now Magnus is waiting for Hikaru. It's not something he is used to, no? But it means that he wants to win this title so much? No, of course. I mean, that would mean that he holds all three titles at the same time. This is something incredible, which he has actually yes. done in 2014, but not ever since. And Hikaru Nakamura is looking for his first World Blitz title. He finished second last year. Ah, no. Third. Third last year. Yeah, yes. but he got a medal, yeah. Yes. Definitely. Third last year, and he finished second. Um, was it in the... Uh, I have to check because I yeah, forgot I mean, already this, which event was this. This year haven't been really going uh, Hikaru's way in, in classical terms. But uh, I think this also helps him to, to focus all the more on uh, his big specialty on Rapid and Blitz. And he has proven uh, himself in this tournament like what an amazing Blitz and Rapid player he is. So the arbiter is explaining the rules that there would be in Armageddon in case of a tie. Yeah, probably. And here we go, E4 is played. We see, will we see the repetition of the same? No. We see the professional approach by Magnus Carlsen. He goes for the Berlin defense. No more Steinitz, Spanish, no more experiment. This is the Bishop C5, main repertoire as if it would be a World Championship final. C3 cancels. And he goes for the d6 line. This is the old classical line. Lately, d5 became very popular. Also, the move rook e8 is very famous. And knight e7 is main line, but a6 is the old, the very old classical main line. I'm just wondering if there is a position, Peter, you don't know about. Well, there is, but most probably not in 1e4. <laughs> Well, I have analyzed this myself for many, many years with different results. I remember, I think, last time I took a very, very close look at this, it was 2012, I believe. Because since then, Black came up with so many other different setups that this position did not become so important anymore. So White fixes the b5 pawn. Basically, it, uh, it's not the usual way of playing. It's not the usual way, and now Hikaru anyway starts to go with the knight to d2 and probably heading to f1 and g3, and Magnus plays the typical knight e7, knight g6. Wow, and a5. That's a move to completely equalize the position. Did it quote Hikaru of guard or yeah, ba5? Yeah, Hikaru somehow not 
entirely happy about this. Magnus taking now his time. Because how to take back? Both captures are possible. Look a5, bishop a5. There are arguments for both. Finally he chose the more solid. Rook takes a5. Bishop e3. So will we see a massive exchange on a4? Yeah, first the bishops are exchanged. Now the white knight captured on e3 and uh, the knight on e3 is actually very nicely placed so Magnus also improves his knight, knight g6 there are some ideas like knight f4 but most importantly as they say in Spanish let's park your knight first on g3 or on g6 and you see next what to do wow, rook b5 Magnus keeps some tension he did not change the rooks Basically, probably he also anticipates that in this case it's easier for, uh, I mean, more difficult for Hikaru to, to, to activate his queen on the queen side. Bound 46. Rather, rather solid position, but uh, I mean, it can heat up. It can heat up because if you try to create something, the danger is then the, your clock is ticking down. So how much time you can invest in order to try to find all the subtleties of the position. And we have a very unusual guest in our studio, Peter. Wow! <laughs> yeah, Vladimir Kramnik. Vladimir than... Kramnik just joined us for this tie break and I hope that he will be able yes, to comment a little bit yeah that would be great just incredible what Vladimir has achieved in this tournament I mean this third place it's just incredible and here we see that the position where Vladimir himself would be a very big specialist Magnus goes for the exchange of Queens takes takes white white would love to play d3, d4, but e4 pawn is always hanging. So, he can maneuver his knight. It's important that with g3, king g2, he is also stabilizing here. I wonder, is some player really playing for a win here? But Hikaru is slightly slower than usual, yeah? Is he feeling the tension or is he having too much respect for Magnus? I'm not sure. But okay, four. Also something like G6, King, G7 by Magnus, I think, will be played pretty soon. F3 played. F3 played with a clear intention of playing D3, D4, yeah? Because the problem is that Black has the two open files and White feels like, okay, with look on C2, look on D1, I want to make good use of this. Knight D7 and, and D4, there we go. Yeah, yeah, we, we yes, we're really hoping that Vladimir will be able to do the commentary for the next game with you, Peter. So, he kept his promise. Wow. Yes, he came to the studio and... That's an emotional moment also. Yes. I mean, <laughs> to comment with Vladimir, this is something special after our history. It will be one. Look at this, yeah, seemingly it's, it's nothing is happening, but there is still a lot of tension. Magnus made sure with f6 that there are no direct exchanges and he is activating his pieces. And Hikaru's clock is ticking down. Hikaru's clock is ticking down. And believe me, this 40 seconds difference makes a huge impact. Makes a huge impact. Hikaru needs to speed up. Yeah, so this was a very difficult decision for him, psychologically, to give the c5 square, but now at least he can fight for the... But now he sees the pawn. How will he take care of his... How will he care of his pawn? Basically, this pawn is lost, but he wants activity and he has a nice grip. But how nice grip it is? I mean, what's happening after rook a2, rook a2, rook c3? 
most probably some Rook A7 Rook or Rook A8 yes. check first and then Rook A7. Magnus also sensing that this is something more than I hoped for, yeah? Maybe I have a chance. But by feeling this, his clock ticks down and he plays King F7. What? Wow. Both looks were hanging in the air, but there was no way to make use of it. And he goes for F5. Wow. What a move. What a move. F4 is a threat. And if Hikaru loses control of... Yeah, F4 had to be played. Just in time. Just in time. EFGF. Knight F6. Magnus in full control. Magnus in full control. Hikaru is in trouble, maybe. Maybe Knight G4, Knight E4. All kinds of possibilities. Even Rook A2 check is possible, but... Because the white king can even get into mating net. Imagine, rook a2 check, king f3, then knight takes d5, Magnus takes the pawn. This was also possible. Knight takes d6, cd knight d5. But was it necessary? I'm not sure that this was necessary. Unless Magnus knows what he's doing. Yeah, king e6, knight b4. Knight d4. Wow, lot of, lot of tension. Incredible tension. Now the CC pawn is lost, but Hikaru gets the d4 square for his king and goes after the h5 pawn. Magnus down to 14 seconds. Magnus down to 14 seconds. Knight e2. Knight d5. Knight f4. Takes rook a4 check. Takes rook h5. King g6. Where does this lead? Okay, most probably to draw, yeah? But these positions are sometimes so tricky. Sometimes these positions are extremely tricky. Look at this. Okay, h7 has to be played. King g6. And it's yes, draw. And it's a draw. Wow, it, it got very tensed. It got extremely tensed. Great save by Hikaru. I think uh, Magnus missed, uh, maybe he missed even a clear win. It, it looked very, very dangerous for Hikaru. And it seems that miracles do happen, Peter. And you will be able to do the commentary <laughs> for the next round with Vladimir Kramnik. Wow. So let's have a small break. Energy is essential to human life. It also drives progress. At 
Hotel, energy is our business. We are a leading international oil and gas company and a major player in low carbon energies. We explore for, produce, transform, market and distribute energy in a variety of forms to serve the end customer. And we operate in more than 130 countries. How are we providing concrete responses to the challenges of the next 20 years? How can we meet the energy needs of a growing population? How can we tackle climate change? And how can we adapt to new consumer habits and customer expectations? By supplying an energy mix combining natural gas, oil and renewables. And by improving the energy efficiency of our facilities and products to limit their impact on global warming. And also by leveraging our closeness to customers, by anticipating their needs and helping them use energy more responsibly. In short, our 98,000 employees are committed to supplying affordable, reliable, clean energy to as many people as possible. Our ambition is to become the responsible energy major. Yeah, what a great surprise. We are back and we are joined by no other than Vladimir Kramnik who has just uh, came back from retirement and took bronze medal in the World Blitz Championship. Congratulations, Vladimir. And the ah. game has already started. So, we see on the screen Magnus played d4, knight f6, knight f3. Yes, painful memories for me. I lost to Magnus here with this system. In the London I mean, system. there is no advantage for White, but uh, Magnus is having very good results here, and he is, uh, somehow it fits him very well. Yeah, he plays it very quickly and very confidently, yeah, mm -hmm. on this type of position. I was telling that in 2015 you had some training, secret training match with him or practice, where he, then he picked up from you this yes, London system, uh, yeah? No, but I mean, uh, quite, uh, quite many players who play quickly and confidently, but he's also playing well, yeah? That's, uh, <laughs> that's a major difference. Yeah, so the clock, of course, is very, very important. And I like this plan with bishop d6, because so far, when Wang Hao played this bishop d6, e6, bishop d6 idea against Magnus, Magnus was not that impressive as in these uh, structures when c takes d4, e d4. Oh, it's clear that black equalized comfortably here, castles and so on, and yeah, I wouldn't take, but it's also fine. Uh, but okay, Magnus is good uh, in this position, well, actually in any position, and uh, I guess that they're also trying to be quite uh, cautious, you know, because there's quite a lot at stake for ambitious players like they are. Yes, I mean basically, yeah, Black got a dream scenario. I mean, I'm as a former Queen's Indian player would feel myself here very, very happy. Hikaru is also a Queen's Gambit player lately, so he's also very familiar with this structure. I mean, if it would be a classical game, then it, we can be sure that it's going to end in a draw, but here you never know, yeah, in, in Blitz. Uh, Exactly. Anything can happen, yeah. And this is already the, the tie break, the playoff we have also seen in the previous game that it looked like a seemingly symmetrical position and what a mess it became. Yeah, the potential is a c6 square. If white knight will get there and pawn on b5, black uh, might have a small problem, but uh, it's very, very hypothetical for the moment. I mean, it's very far from it. Well, rook c8, I suppose. And then knight dc4, trying to go for ah, knight yeah, knight d6. Ah, yeah, knight dc4, you're right, yeah. 
I mean, that's why Hikaru is uh, taking his time because yeah, the position yeah. is innocent. But I mean, if you are yeah, not precise, and probably then maybe some before. That's a bit strange. Yeah. I mean, probably he has calculated it. But now taking on d7 and knight c4, white maybe can get a certain plus. Yeah, he has more active pieces. Exactly, and you better make sure you don't give any chances for Magnus because he he might take them. Hikaru is now very focused. Queen f3. Really, Queen f3. Yes, uh, keeping a small plus. Yeah, in the, in the end game with because of this c6 square as I mentioned before, but still nothing nothing dramatic. Okay, Hikaru he is a bit afraid yeah, of Magnus to go into technical positions, but now takes knight e4 looks a bit uncomfortable, I think, for black, no? Unless there is knight e5. Yeah, yeah I mean, somehow this knight cd7. Yeah, yeah, it's a bit passive, yeah. Look, the artificial, and Magnus is almost half a minute ahead on the clock. He has the, he has the possibility to take some time and try to figure out how he can really pose problems here because it seems like he has a chance and knight c6 played. yeah that's a very principal move but the question is if what if i take on a2 yeah I yeah i saw that some knight c4 knight e7 knight d6 knight takes f7 and yeah, yeah, look on a8 like hanging that, yeah. yeah right yeah but still it's a pawn yeah it's a pawn uh, and it's a critical game it's it's basically the last game if it's decided well so. i think hikaru should take yeah i mean it's too passive, yeah, King H8, to my taste. I mean, now even like A3 or something, or Knight C4. Yeah, somehow it's... Uh, it's yeah, I mean, if White too gets... Too cautious. White will get these two Knights, D6, C6, and... Uh, yes, I think that Karo is in certain trouble. He's in trouble, Already yeah. Here, yeah. I mean, something like five, six moves ago, it looked like the game will end very peacefully oh, and yeah it's time to take and at least because he realized that uh, his position is very unpleasant but now at least to try to to make some I mean, g4 yes yeah. it's, it's a move yeah yeah he wants to mate magnus wants to mate yeah because his knights are extremely powerful now yeah yeah and if the knight from f6 is kicked away and there is no way to stop that h6 will be met by h4 uh -huh. so some counter attack yeah coming trying to get the knight on e4 yeah, probably a good move, yeah, knight c5. Mm. Yeah, so maybe I would go knight, knight d6. d6, yeah? Exactly, you have to go already now all in, yeah? If Magnus started this direction, this journey, but I mean... Uh, knight d6 and then g5 is a threat, yeah? Looks Maybe queen a4, some kind of strange move. And then rook d4, yeah? Yeah, some... Quite difficult to play this position for black. And especially with 30 maybe seconds Maybe knight d5 is a move. Ooh, ooh. Knight b3. Uh, it's where kind is of desperado, yeah? It's a kind of quite desperate. Exactly. Attempt. Where is I this knight? I don't see where going? the knight is going. Queen a4, yeah? But now rook c4 probably. Yes. Now rook c4 is very strong. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's already going. Knight e7 maybe on g5. Yeah, Hikaru is in big, big trouble. Actually, he can still go knight somewhere, like d5, yeah? Probably. If I'm not mistaken, knight d5. I think g5 was not the, the best move. Mm. Yeah, Do but he's got no time. Knight d5, no, but because uh, ac4 is thinking, yeah? No, yeah, that's knight that d7 is played. Knight d7. Hikaru is shaking his head in disbelief. Rook h4 looks also very unpleasant. Yeah. Threatening rook h7, yeah? Exactly. Rook h4 basically seems yeah. to finish the game. Yeah, that's already. Down to 10 seconds. Yeah. Yeah, now rook h7. Now rook h7, checkmate yeah, and winning the... That would be played. Oh, no! Oh. Wow! I mean, of course, it's also winning, but I mean, rook h7 was not... Wow! Uh, nurse, yeah, probably. Queen e2, yeah, okay, it doesn't help, but... Yeah, because there are least. no checks. Yeah, rook takes d7 is possible. Yeah. Oh, counter-attack. Ah, but now Pirpel? Ah, no, no, because, no, no, because of mate, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, Hikaru was a bit too too uh, defensive yeah, at some point without any need. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, what a relief by Magnus! Look at this. 
Ladies and gentlemen, take yeah, a look at Magnus. Yeah, I wish I've, I had uh, such uh, motivation as Magnus. <laughs> uh, of course, he's incredible. I mean, uh, with his level and also with uh, with his motivation, because well, basically he won already everything what you can win, and he's still. I can see how concentrated and motivated he is. Of course, it's quite remarkable. Yeah, I mean, he made sure with this that uh, he has he was now all three titles at the same time which he has done in 2014. Look at how exhausted, how happy Magnus Carlsen is. Just incredibly happy. And probably even more happy that he won in a tie break than if he would have won alone. Yeah, probably. But of course, yeah, what, what to say, he is the best. Yeah, he has proven it once again. Incredible achievement by Magnus. He repeats by winning this rapid, uh, I mean the, the Blitz, uh, world title as he did last year and now he also won the rapid double title plus the classical well i already stopped stopped counting some time ago uh, how many events he won i mean it's uh, it's now more of a surprise if he doesn't win if he wins it's like business as usual yeah so uh, yeah congratulations to to magnus and yes, congratulations to you, Vladimir. Thank I would you. like to use this possibility. It was phenomenal result. And I had the feeling that this 8 out of 12, after the four, first day, it's quite a good result because you are in striking distance. To, how did you feel? Yeah, no, I didn't care. So I, first of all, I just came here to enjoy, to see my old friends and uh, old former colleagues. And uh, somehow, yeah, I, I, at some point today, I started to feel that my head is working better. And uh, I was a bit lucky in a couple of games. Uh, but yeah, I mean, quite surprising result for me because I really came here just to enjoy the atmosphere and to play a bit of Blitz. And uh, yeah, surprising. Well, yeah, and uh, uh, it's quite nice, actually, quite nice. So maybe I will still keep on playing a bit of blitz. I don't promise anything else, but blitz probably I can still do play decent chess. Yeah, that's great news for the chess world. I mean, uh, whenever we saw your game, we had the chance to look at your game. It really looked like a masterclass, even in blitz. Uh, it was a real pleasure. I was telling that this is how I know Vladimir. This is exactly the way. Uh, how you, how you used to play so if you can play in this level then please yes you know the only problem is that when it gets to seconds then i am totally uh, helpless yeah uh, i mean then i cannot do much with young uh, opponents so today i was quite lucky and i was really trying to play extremely fast and not to get into this 20 seconds mode uh, and actually i managed in quite many games and that's more really was a, a, a reason of my success because of course uh, yeah, with seconds on the clock, I'm already too old and too rusty to, to compete with the young players. Yeah, and I think Yevgeny has something to say, so Yevgeny, it's your turn. Well, congratulations to Magnus Carson, first of all, and honestly, I've been doing commentary for the last few World Rapid and Blitzes, and somehow I lost the count and when Almira said at the start of this tournament that he's four times and now he's five times world blitz champion that was well it sounds amazing yeah few moments to highlight in game one indeed first it was Magnus to miss a huge advantage it seems after rook b8 the moment when he has taken on d5 seemingly winning a pawn allowed white to capture on d6 and yeah you, you've seen what happened instead well uh, the machine well not so powerful machine once again but the one i have claims that black is strangely enough simply much better in this position after a move like king g6 turns out those knights are kind of not very nicely placed and, and black always has the threats but it was a little accident closer to the end of the game because Somewhere around this point, when knight c3 was played and the check on h7 was given, it turns out that Naka has missed a huge chance. Knight to c2 attacking the rook, the knight is hanging on c3, and after rook b3, knight d4, white is winning. So I don't know what would have happened after knight c2. Perhaps you have to go rook a4, you know, try to make a draw, but I don't think black has enough so it was a huge miss by nakamura and then in the game two of course already our commentators mentioned this uh, yes knight f7 was winning for magnus but it seems that our world champion was stressed to such a degree that he has missed a checkmate in three moves 
Uh, well, that was, that was my five cents and I believe we are getting ready for an interview with the five times World Blitz champion Magnus Carlsen wins both events in Moscow. Welcome back to our studio. And Peter, this was such a lovely gift from Vladimir Kramnik. Yeah, incredible. I mean, one could feel how exhausted uh, Vladimir was after playing uh, these 21 uh, Blitz games. Uh, thank you very much, Vladimir, for joining us in the live broadcast. It was uh, a very special moment. It's not every day that you have a chance to, to, to comment with Vladimir Kramnik. And also, we couldn't really say hello to each other. It was the first time I met him now in Moscow uh, during this championship. So it was a great moment. Vladimir Kramnik improved his blitz rating a lot uh, during this tournament and congratulations of course to Magnus Carlsen and there is no doubt about the uh, best performance prize uh, in the open group so for the overall result Magnus Carlsen he won it all so yeah he won both championships and he wins the prize for the best result uh, combined yeah, incredible achievement, just fantastic and I think why it was very important for Magnus to win this tiebreak and even to win the title in tiebreak exactly because of this accident with Firuza, yeah? And we were speaking about this that if would he have lost that game then suddenly everything would have been wide open and he has proven that yes, Hikaru has catched him and they had to play the tiebreak but uh, he showed who is the best and he, he has won it in a very, very impressive manner. So let's have a look at the standings. So, we just saw Magnus <laughs> winning his tiebreak, so he finishes first, but uh, Hikaru Nakamura has the same number of points. They finished with 16 and a half. Vladimir Kramnik is third with 15, and two players finished with 14 points. Maxim Vashilagraf and Alexander Grishuk and a lot of prominent players with 13 and a half points. Like, are there any young players? Well, forever young Boris Gelfand yes. <laughs> with 13 and a half points. Congratulations, Boris. Fantastic. Also, Peter Swidler had a great comeback. As we can see in chess, age doesn't matter. Uh, Zubov Alexander finished with 13 and a half points. It's, uh, it's a very good result. Yeah, congratulations for all these players, of course. I mean, uh, 13 and a half points is just fantastic. Yeah, we forgot that Eliriza Firuja is only uh, 16, yes? So. <laughs> exactly. And here are the standings in the ladies' uh, tournament. Katerina Lagno won her second World Blitz title with 13 points. Anna Muzichuk is second. And Tan Jungi and Valentina Gunina share the third place. But according to a better tiebreak, Tan Jungi wins uh, the bronze. So, Peter, what is your impression about the whole event? Well, I mean, it was very, very tense, and uh, I think uh, it was very, very interesting to see the playoffs, the tiebreaks deciding the title. It shows exactly how fierce is the competition, how difficult it is to win this, uh, win this championship. And uh, both in the ladies section and in the men section, in the open section, we had uh, spectacular tiebreaks. And I think that now you know how difficult it, it is to win the ladies event. Well, certainly, I mean, uh, there, there was so much fight, uh, there was so much drama, I think finally, nevertheless, it was good for Katerina and also for Anna that they knew that the other players cannot catch them anymore, because uh, I think that's the worst when you know that, yeah, you are fighting for the title, but if you lose, then you might even lose out on the medals. And, uh, okay, there was enough dramas, I mean, Katerina Lachno seemed like to be in trouble and she didn't know what is happening in the Anna Mozicu game as Yevgeny has showed there was a moment when Anna had a winning continuation so anything could have been possible but finally Katerina Lachno defended her title. Congratulations once again. It's a very impressive result. And Peter, we analyzed so many games. What was like the most remarkable game or the most remarkable result from this tournament? Well, actually, I don't remember already now any single game. I just remember this whole picture that we had dramas in every single round. 
and even in every single round we didn't know where to focus and it feels like as a commentator so quite unpleasant like yes we are focusing on one game and we know that so much action is going on in the other games as well so we can never be fair uh, but uh, I mean every round was just uh, spectacular of course, Magnus won uh, both titles. This is truly remarkable. But Vladimir Kramnik won his uh, bronze medal, and I think this makes you very happy. Yeah, definitely. I mean, first of all, when I heard that Vladimir is playing, I immediately felt like, okay, if Vladimir plays, then why should he not get a medal? On the other hand, I mean, the tournament is so strong that at the same time, if you are a favorite eventually of taking or a candidate to taking a medal, it can also mean that you might not end up in the first 40 or top 50. And even taking 50th place is not a disaster in this field, even though when you look as a spectator, if somebody is number 30 or 40, you might think that ah, he didn't play well. No, actually he did as well. And we are ready for an interview with Magnus Carlsen. Magnus Carlsen, congratulations on yet another victory, a dramatic end to the day. How do you feel? <laughs> I feel very good about the end, obviously. Um, it was uh, a day that became very, very tough, um, obviously. Uh, and the tiebreak as well was, uh, was a very, very nervous affair. But, you know, I prevailed in the end, so I'm, I'm very happy. Uh, you managed to prevail in the end, but how did you feel after that first game when it was a draw? And um, no, I, I think a uh, draw in the first game makes it, both pe people a bit nervous. Like you don't know what's going to happen. It's it's all very much in the in the balance. Um, so in the second game, I kind of wanted to play it safe and then I just made a very simple mistake in the in the opening uh, and the position was was quite equal um, and then I think he um, took some chances that he need, didn't need to take by uh, not exchanging queens and then after I, I gave up a pawn I think um, it's a very strange practical situation because we know it's going to be decided right there and then. It's not going to end in the in the draw, and for both players, it's it's unpleasant. But yeah. So, uh, how does this benchmark to St. Petersburg? You've repeated what you've done in St. Petersburg. You've repeated what you've done the year before. How do you feel? A double hat trick? Oh, well, in St. Petersburg, I only got one title. So, um, no, I, I I would say um, very very pleased, obviously, with uh, with. Uh, the performance, you know, uh, everybody makes mistakes. A lot of the games were uh, uh, were uh, were rough, but uh, at the end of the day, the result is what counts. And I, um, yeah, I cannot be uh, be unhappy okay. with that. I'm just wondering, do you keep track of all the wins that you've had, of all the events which you've won? And not all of the events which I, I won, but obviously world championships, I keep track of. That's quite a big number. Thank you. Welcome back to our studio one one last time, Peter. I wanted to tell our viewers uh, that if you would want to watch the closing ceremony, it will be live, but a little bit later on another viewer. And I also wanted to thank you all the partners of this event. And first of all, my partner, Peter Leko, for these wonderful commentaries. Thanks I wanted so to thank Evgeny Miroshnichenko for his wonderful insights, uh, FIDE, the Russian Chess Federation, and once again, all the sponsors without uh, whom this tournament wouldn't be possible. It was such a lovely event and thank you so much for watching us and uh, see you next year. Yeah, definitely. Thank you very much.
Energy is essential to human life. It also drives progress. At Total, energy is our business. We are a leading international oil and gas company and a major player in low carbon energies. We explore for, produce, transform, market and distribute energy in a variety of forms to serve the end customer. And we operate in more than 130 countries. How are we providing concrete responses to the challenges of the next 20 years? How can we meet the energy needs of a growing population? How can we tackle climate change? And how can we adapt to new consumer habits and customer expectations? By supplying an energy mix combining natural gas, oil and renewables. And by improving the energy efficiency of our facilities and products to limit their impact on global warming. And also by leveraging our closeness to customers, by anticipating their needs and helping them use energy more responsibly. In short, our 98,000 employees are committed to supplying affordable, reliable, clean energy to as many people as possible. Our ambition is to become the responsible energy major.